Section 1, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 1. 357th night to 360th night the ebony horse there was once in times of yore and ages long gone before a great and puissant king of the kings of the persians sabur by name who was the richest of all the kings in store of wealth and dominion and surpassed each and every in wit and wisdom he was generous, open-handed, and beneficent, and he gave to those who sought him, and repelled not those who resorted to him, and he comforted the broken-hearted, and honorably entreated those who fled to him for refuge. Moreover, he loved the poor, and was hospitable to strangers, and did the oppressed justice upon the oppressor. He had three daughters, like full moons of shining light, or flower gardens blooming bright and a son as he were the moon and it was his wont to keep two festivals in the twelve month those of the nauros or new year and mirgan the autumnal equinox on which occasions he threw open his palaces and gave largess and made proclamation of safety and security and promoted his chamberlains and viceroys and the people of his realm came in to him and saluted him and gave him joy of the holy day bringing him gifts and servants and eunuchs now he loved science and geometry and one festival day as he sat on his kingly throne there came in to him three wise men cunning artificers and past masters in all manner of craft and inventions skilled in making things curious and rare such as confounded the wit and versed in the knowledge of occult truths and perfect in mysteries and subtleties and they were of three different tongues and countries the first a hindi or indian the second a rumi or greek and the third a farsi or persian the indian came forwards and prostrating himself before the king wished him joy of the festival and laid before him a present befitting his dignity that is to say a man of gold set with precious gems and jewels of price and holding in hand a golden trumpet when sabr saw this he asked o oh, sage what is the virtue of this figure and the indian answered o oh, my lord if this figure be set at the gate of thy city it will be a guardian over it for if an enemy enter the place it will blow this clarion against him and he will be seized with the palsy and drop down dead much the king marvelled at this and cried by allah o sage and this thy word be true i will grant thee thy wish and thy desire then came forward the greek and prostrating himself before the king presented him with a basin of silver in whose midst was a peacock of gold surrounded by four and twenty chicks of the same metal sabur looked at them and turning to the greek said to him o sage what is the virtue of this peacock o oh, my lord answered he as often as an hour of the day or night passeth it pecketh one of its young and crieth out and flappeth its wings till the four and twenty hours are accomplished and when the month cometh to an end it will open its mouth and thou shalt see the crescent therein and the king said and thou speak sooth i will bring thee to thy wish and thy desire then came forward the persian sage and prostrating himself before the king presented him with a horse of the blackest ebony wood inlaid with gold and jewels and ready harnessed with saddle bridle and stirrups such as befit kings which when sabur saw he marvelled with exceeding marvel and was confounded at the beauty of its form and the ingenuity of its fashion 
So he asked, What is the use of this horse of wood, and what is its virtue, and what the secret of its movement? And the Persian answered, O oh, my lord, the virtue of this horse is that, if one mount it, it will carry him whither he will, and fare with its rider through the air, and cover the space of a year in a single day. The king marvelled, and was amazed at these three wonders, following thus hard upon one another on the same day, and turning to the sage said to him, By Allah the Omnipotent, and our Lord the Beneficent, who created all creatures, and feedeth them with meat and drink, and thy speech be veritable, and the virtue of thy contrivance appear, I will assuredly give thee whatsoever thou lustest for, and will bring thee to thy desire and thy wish. Then he entertained the sages three days, that he might make trial of their gifts, after which they brought the figures before him, and each took the creature he had brought in, and showed him the mystery of its movement. The trumpeter blew the trump, the peacock pecked its cheeks, and the Persian sage mounted the ebony horse, whereupon it soared with him high in air, and descended again. When King Sabur saw all this, he was amazed and perplexed, and felt like to fly for joy, and said to the three sages, Now I am certified of the truth of your words, and it behoveth me to quit me of my promise. Ask ye therefore what ye will, and I will give you that same. Now the report of the king's daughters had reached the sages, so they answered, If the king be content with us and accept of our gifts, and allow us to prefer a request to him, we crave of him that he give us his three daughters in marriage, that we may be his sons-in-law, for that the stability of kings may not be gainsaid quoth the king i grant you that which you wish and you desire and bade summon the kazi forthright that he might marry each of the sages to one of his daughters now it fortuned that the princesses were behind a curtain looking on and when they heard this the youngest considered her husband to be and behold he was an old man an hundred years of age with hair frosted, forehead drooping, eyebrows mangy, ears slitten, beard and moustaches stained and dyed, eyes red and goggle, cheeks bleached and hollow, flabby nose like a brindle or egg plant, face like a cobbler's apron, teeth overlapping and lips like camel's kidneys, loose and pendulous. In brief, a terror, a horror, a monster, for he was of the folk of his time the unsightliest, and of his age the frightfulest. Sundry of his grinders had been knocked out, and his eye-teeth were like the tusks of the jinni, who frighteneth poultry in hen-houses. Now the girl was the fairest and most graceful of her time, more elegant than the gazelle, however tender, then the gentlest safer blander, and brighter than the moon at her full for amorous fray right suitable, confounding in graceful sway the waving bow, and outdoing in swimming gait the pacing row. In fine she was fairer and sweeter by far than all her sisters. So when she saw her suitor, she went to her chamber and strewed dust on her head, and tore her clothes, and fell to buffeting her face and weeping and wailing. Now the prince, her brother, Kamar al Akmar, or the moon of moon's height, was then newly returned from a journey, and hearing her weeping and crying, came in to her, for he loved her with fond affection, more than his other sisters, and asked her, What ailest thee? What hath befallen thee? Tell me, and conceal not from me. So she smote her breast and answered, O oh, my brother and my dear one, I have nothing to hide. If the palace be straitened upon thy father, I will go out, and if he be resolved upon a foul thing, I will separate myself from him, though he consent not to make provision for me, 
and my lord will provide. Quoth he, Tell me what meaneth this talk, and what hath straightened thy breast and troubled thy temper? O oh, my brother and my dear one, answered the princess, know that my father hath promised me in marriage to a wicked magician, who brought him as a gift a horse of black wood, and hath bewitched him with his craft and his necromancy. But as for me, I will none of him, and would because of him I had never come into this world. Her brother soothed her and solaced her, then fared to his sire and said, what be this wizard to whom thou hast given my youngest sister in marriage? And what is this present which he hath brought thee, so that thou hast killed my sister with chagrin? It is not right that this should be. Now the Persian was standing by, and when he heard the prince's words, he was mortified and filled with fury, and the king said, O oh, my son! and thou sawest this horse, thy wit would be confounded, and thou wouldst be amated with amazement. Then he bade the slaves bring the horse before him, and they did so. When the prince saw it, it pleased him. So, being an accomplished cavalier, he mounted it forthright, and struck its sides with the shovel-shaped stirrup irons, but it stirred not, and the king said to the sage, go show him its movement that he also may help thee to win thy wish now the persian bore the prince a grudge because he willed not he should have his sister so he showed him the pin of ascent on the right side of the horse and saying to him trill this left him thereupon the prince trilled the pin and lo the horse forthwith soared with him high in ether as it were a bird and gave not over flying till it disappeared from men's spying, whereat the king was troubled and perplexed about his case, and said to the Persian, O sage, look how thou mayst make him descend. But he replied, O my lord, I can do nothing, and thou wilt never see him again till resurrection day, for he of his ignorance and pride asked me not of the pin of descent, and I forgot to acquaint him therewith. When the king heard this, he was enraged, with sore rage, and bade Bastinado the sorcerer and clap him in jail, whilst he himself cast the crown from his head and beat his face and smote his breast. Moreover, he shut the doors of his palaces and gave himself up to weeping and keening. He and his wife and daughters and all the folk of the city, and thus their joy was turned to annoy and their gladness changed into sore affliction and sadness. Thus far concerning them. But as regards the prince, the horse came not over soaring with him till he drew near the sun, whereat he gave himself up for lost and saw death in the skies, and was confounded at his case, repenting him of having mounted the horse and saying to himself, Verily, this was a device of the sage to destroy me on account of my youngest sister. But there is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. I am lost without recourse. But I wonder, did not he who made the ascent pin make also a descent pin? Now he was a man of wit and knowledge and intelligence, so he fell to feeling all the parts of the horse, but saw nothing save a screw like a cock's head on its right shoulder, and the like on the left, when quoth he to himself, I see no sign save these things like buttons. Presently he turned the right-hand pin, whereupon the horse flew heavenwards with increased speed. So he left it, and looking at the sinister shoulder, and finding another pin, he wound it up, and immediately the steed's upwards motion slowed and ceased, and it began to descend little by little towards the face of the earth, while the rider became yet more cautious and careful of his life. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and fifty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the prince wound up the sinister screw, 
the steed's upward motion slowed and ceased and it began to descend little by little towards the earth while the rider became yet more cautious and careful of his life and when he saw this and knew the uses of the horse his heart was filled with joy and gladness and he thanked almighty allah for that he had deigned deliver him from destruction then he began to turn the horse's head whithersoever he would making it rise and fall at pleasure till he had gotten complete mastery over its every movement he ceased not to descend the whole of that day for that the steed's ascending flight had borne him afar from earth and as he descended he diverted himself with viewing the various cities and countries over which he passed and which he knew not never having seen them in his life amongst the rest he described a city ordered after the fairest fashion in the midst of a verdant and riant land rich in trees and streams with gazelles pacing daintily over the plains whereat he fell amusing and said to himself would i knew the name of yon town and in what land it is and he took to circling about it and observing it right and left by this time the day began to decline and the sun drew near to its downing and he said in his mind verily i find no goodlier place to night in than this city so i will lodge here and early on the morrow i will return to my kith and kin and my kingdom and tell my father and family what hath passed and acquaint him with what mine eyes have seen then he addressed himself to seeking a place wherein he might safely bestow himself and his horse and where none should descry him and presently behold he espied the middlemost of the city a palace rising high in upper air surrounded by a great wall with lofty crenels and battlements guarded by forty black slaves clad in complete mail and armed with spears and swords bows and arrows quoth he this is a goodly place and turned the descent pin whereupon the horse sank down with him like a weary bird and alighted gently on the terrace roof of the palace so the prince dismounted and ejaculating alhamdulillah praise be to allah he began to go round about the horse and examine it saying by allah he who fashioned thee with these perfections was a cunning craftsman and if the almighty extend the term of my life and restore me to my country and kinsfolk in safety and reunite me with my father i will assuredly bestow upon him all manner bounties and benefit him with the utmost beneficence by this time night had overtaken him and he sat on the roof till he was assured that all in the palace slept and indeed hunger and thirst were sore upon him for that he had not tasted food nor drunk water since he parted from his sire so he said within himself surely the like of this palace will not lack of victual and leaving the horse above he went down in search of somewhat to eat presently he came to a staircase and descending it to the bottom found himself in a court paved with white marble and alabaster which shone in the light of the moon he marvelled at the place and the goodliness of its fashion but sensed no sound of speaker and saw no living soul and stood in perplexed surprise looking right and left and knowing not whither he should wend then said he to himself i may not do better than return to where i left my horse and pass the night by it and as soon as day shall dawn i will mount and ride away and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and fifty ninth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that quoth the king's son to himself i may not do better than pass the night by my horse and as soon as day shall dawn i will mount and ride away however as he tarried talking to himself he espied a light within the palace and making towards it found that it came from a candle that stood before a door of the harem at the head of a sleeping eunuch 
as he were one of the ifrits of solomon or a tribesman of the jinn longer than lumber and broader than a bench he lay before the door with the pommel of his sword gleaming in the flame of the candle and at his head was a bag of leather hanging from a column of granite when the prince saw this he was affrighted and said i crave help from allah the supreme o mine holy one even as thou hast already delivered me from destruction so vouchsafe me strength to quit myself of the adventure of this palace so saying he put out his hand to the budget and taking it carried it aside and opened it and found in it food of the best he ate his fill and refreshed himself and drank water after which he hung up the provision bag in its place and drawing the eunuch's sword from its sheath took it whilst the slave slept on knowing not whence destiny should come to him then the prince fared forwards into the palace and ceased not till he came to a second door with a curtain drawn before it so he raised the curtain and behold on entering he saw a couch of the whitest ivory inlaid with pearls and yakins and jewels and four slave girls sleeping about it he went up to the couch to see what was thereon and found a young lady lying asleep chemised with her hair as she were the full moon rising over the eastern horizon with flower-white brow and shining hair paring and cheeks like blood-red anemones and dainty moles thereon he was amazed at her as she lay in her beauty and loveliness her symmetry and grace and he recked no more of death so he went up to her trembling in every nerve and shuddering with pleasure kissed her on the right cheek whereupon she awoke forthright and opened her eyes and seeing the prince standing at her head said to him who art thou and whence comest thou quoth he i am thy slave and thy lover asked she and who brought thee hither and he answered my lord and my fortune then said shams al nahar for such was her name haply thou art he who demanded me yesterday of my father in marriage and he rejected thee pretending that thou wast foul of favour by allah my sire lied in his throat when he spoke this thing for thou art not other than beautiful now the son of the king of hind had sought her in marriage but her father had rejected him for that he was ugly and uncouth and she thought the prince was he so when she saw his beauty and grace for indeed he was like the radiant moon the synthism of love got hold of her heart as it were a flaming fire and they fell to talk and converse suddenly her waiting women awoke and seeing the prince with their mistress said to her o oh, my lady who is this with thee quoth she i know not i found him sitting by me when i woke up haply it is he who seeketh me in marriage of my sire quoth they o oh, my lady by allah the all-father this is not he who seeketh thee in marriage for he is hideous and this man is handsome and of high degree indeed the other is not fit to be his servant then the handmaidens went out to the eunuch and finding him slumbering awoke him and he started up in alarm said they how happeth it that thou art on guard at the palace and yet men come in to us whilst we are asleep when the black heard this he sprang in haste to his sword but found it not and fear took him and trembling then he went in confounded to his mistress and seeing the prince sitting at talk with her said to him o my lord art thou man of jinni replied the prince woe to thee o unluckiest of slaves how darest thou even the sons of the royal chosroes with one of the unbelieving satans and he was as a raging lion then he took the sword in his hand and said to the slave i am the king's son-in-law and he hath married me to his daughter and bidden me go in to her 
and when the eunuch heard these words he replied o my lord if thou be indeed of kind a man as thou avouchest she is fit for none but for thee and thou art worthier of her than any other thereupon the eunuch ran to the king shrieking loud and rending his raiment and heaving dust upon his head and when the king heard his outcry he said to him what hath befallen thee speak quickly and be brief for thou hast fluttered my heart answered the eunuch o king come to thy daughter's succour for a devil of the jinn in the likeness of a king's son hath got possession of her so up and at him when the king heard this he thought to kill him and said how camest thou to be careless of my daughter and let this demon come at her then he betook himself to the princess's palace where he found her slave women standing to await him and asked them what is come to my daughter o king answered they slumber overcame us and when we awoke we found a young man sitting upon our couch in talk with her as he were the full moon never saw we aught fairer of favour than he so we questioned him of his case and he declared that thou hadst given him thy daughter in marriage more than this we know not nor do we know if he be a man or a jinni but he is modest and well-bred and doth nothing unseemly or which leadeth to disgrace now when the king heard these words his wrath cooled and he raised the curtain little by little and looking in saw sitting at talk with his daughter a prince of the goodliest with a face like the full moon for sheen at this sight he could not contain himself of his jealousy for his daughter's honour and putting aside the curtain rushed in upon them drawn sword in hand like a furious gaul now when the prince saw him he asked the princess is this thy sire and she answered yes and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixtieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the prince saw the king rushing in upon them drawn sword in hand like a furious gaul he asked the princess is this thy sire and she answered yes whereupon he sprang to his feet and seizing his sword cried out at the king with so terrible a cry that he was confounded then the youth would have fallen on him with the sword but the king seeing that the prince was doughtier than he sheathed his scimitar and stood till the young man came up to him when he accosted him courteously and said to him o youth art thou a man or a jinni quoth the prince did i not respect thy right as mine host and thy daughter's honour i would spill thy blood how darest thou fellow me with devils me that am a prince of the sons of the royal chosros who had they wished to take thy kingdom could shake thee like an earthquake from thy glory and thy dominions and spoil thee of all thy possessions now when the king heard his words he was confounded with awe and bodily fear of him and rejoined if thou indeed be of the sons of the kings as thou pretendest how cometh it that thou enterest my palace without my permission and smirchest mine honour making thy way to my daughter and feigning that thou art her husband and claiming that i have given her to thee to wife i that have slain kings and king's sons who sought her of me in marriage and now who shall save thee from my might and majesty when if i cried out to my slaves and servants and bade them put thee to the vilest of deaths they would slay thee forthright who shall deliver thee out of my hand when the prince heard this speech of the king he answered verily i wonder at thee and at the shortness and denseness of thy wit say me canst covet for thy daughter a mate comelier than myself and hast ever seen a stouter-hearted man or one better fitted for a sultan or a more glorious in rank and dominion than i rejoined the king nay by allah 
but i would have had thee o youth act after the custom of kings and demand her from me to wife before witnesses that i might have married her to thee publicly and now even were i to marry her to thee privily yet hast thou dishonoured me in her person rejoined the prince thou sayest sooth o king but if thou summon thy slaves and thy soldiers and they fall upon me and slay me as thou pretendest thou wouldst but publish thine own disgrace and the folk would be divided between belief in thee and disbelief in thee wherefore o king thou wilt do well meseemeth to turn from this thought to that which i shall counsel thee quoth the king let me hear what thou hast to advise and quoth the prince what i have to propose to thee is this either do thou meet me in combat singular i and thou and he who slayeth his adversary shall be held the worthier and having a better title to the kingdom or else let me be this night and when as dawns the morn draw out against me thy horsemen and footmen and servants but first tell me their number said the king they are forty thousand horse beside my own slaves and their followers who are the like of them in number thereupon said the prince when the day shall break do thou array them against me and say to them and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section one read by lars rolander section two volume five of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by lars rolander the book of a thousand nights and a night volume five section two three hundred and sixty first night to three hundred and sixty fourth night when it was the three hundred and sixty first night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that quoth the prince when day shall break do thou array them against me and say to them this man is a suitor to me for my daughter's hand on condition that he shall do battle single-handed against you all for he pretendeth that he will overcome you and put you to the rout and indeed that ye cannot prevail against him after which leave me to do battle with them if they slay me then is thy secret sure guarded and thine honour the better warded and if i overcome them and see their backs then is it the like of me a king should covet to his son-in-law so the king approved of his opinion and accepted his proposition despite his awe at the boldness of his speech and amaze at the pretensions of the prince to meet in fight his whole host such as he had described to him being at heart assured that he would perish in the fray and so he should be quit of him and freed from the fear of dishonour thereupon he called the eunuch and bade him go to his wazir without stay and delay and command him to assemble the whole of the army and cause them don their arms and armour and mount their steeds so the eunuch carried the king's order to the minister who straightway summoned the captains of the host and the lords of the realm and bade them don their harness of daring do and mount horse and sally forth in battle array such was their case but as regards the king he sat a long while conversing with the young prince being pleased with his wise speech and good sense and fine breeding and when it was daybreak he returned to his palace and seating himself on his throne commanded his merry men to mount and bade them saddle one of the best of the royal steeds with handsome cell and housings and trappings and bring it to the prince but the youth said o king i will not mount horse till i come in view of the troops and review them be it as thou wilt replied the king 
Then the two repaired to the parade ground, where the troops were drawn up, and the young prince looked upon them and noted their great number, after which the king cried out to them, saying, Ho, all ye men, there is come to me a youth who seeketh my daughter in marriage, and in very sooth never have I seen a goodlier than he, no, nor a stouter of heart, nor a doughtier of arm, for he pretendeth that he can overcome you single-handed, and force you to flight, and that were ye an hundred thousand in number, yet for him would ye be but few. Now when he chargeth down on you, do ye receive him upon point of pike, and sharp of sabre, for indeed he hath undertaken a mighty matter. Then quoth the king to the prince, Up, O my son, and do thy devoir on them. Answered he, O king, thou dealst not justly and fairly by me. How shall I go forth against them, seeing that I am afoot, and the men be mounted? The king retorted, I bade thee mount, and thou refusedst, but choose thou which of my horses thou wilt. Then he said, Not one of thy horses pleaseth me, and I will read none but that on which I came. Asked the king, And where is thy horse? Atop of thy palace. In what part of my palace? On the roof. Now when the king heard these words, he cried, Out on thee! This is the first sign thou hast given of madness. How can the horse be on the roof? But we shall at once see if thou speakest the truth or lies. Then he turned to one of his chief officers, and said to him, Go to my palace, and bring me what thou findest on the roof. So all the people marvelled at the young prince's words, saying one to other, How can a horse come down the steps from the roof? Verily this is a thing whose like we never heard. In the meantime the king's messenger repaired to the palace, and mounting to the roof, found the horse standing there, and never had he looked on a handsomer. But when he drew near and examined it, he saw that it was made of ebony and ivory. Now the officer was accompanied by other high officers, who also looked on, and they laughed to one another, saying, was it of the like of this horse that the youth spake we cannot deem him other than mad however we shall soon see the truth of his case and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixty-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the high officials looked upon the horse, they laughed one to other, and said, Was it of the like of this horse that the youth spake? We cannot deem him other than mad. However, we shall soon see the truth of his case. Peradventure herein is some mighty matter, and he is a man of high degree. Then they lifted up the horse bodily, and, carrying it to the king, set it down before him, and all the leads flocked round to look at it, marvelling at the beauty of its proportions and the richness of its saddle and bridle. The king also admired it, and wondered at it with extreme wonder, and he asked the prince, O oh, youth, is this thy horse? He answered, Yes, O king, this is my horse, and thou shalt soon see the marvel it showeth. Rejoined the king, Then take and mount it and the prince retorted i will not mount till the troops withdraw far from it so the king bade them retire a bowshot from the horse whereupon quoth its owner o king see thou i am about to mount my horse and charge upon thy host and scatter them right and left and split their hearts asunder said the king do as thou wilt and spare not their lives for they will not spare thine then the prince mounted, whilst the troops ranged themselves in ranks before him, and one said to another, When the youth cometh between the ranks, we will take him on the points of our pikes and the sharps of our sabres. Quoth another, By Allah, this is a mere misfortune. How shall we slay youth so comely of face and shapely of form? And a third continued, ye will have hard work to get the better of him for the youth had not done this 
but for what he knew of his own prowess and pre-eminence of valor meanwhile having settled himself in his saddle the prince turned the pin of ascent whilst all eyes were strained to see what he would do whereupon the horse began to heave and rock and sway to and fro and make the strangest of movements steed ever made till its belly was filled with air and it took flight with its rider and soared high into the sky when the king saw this he cried out to his men saying woe to you catch him catch him ere he scape you but his vassars and viceroys said to him o king can a man overtake the flying bird this is surely none but some mighty magicians or marid of the jinn or devil and allah save thee from him so praise thou the almighty for deliverance of thee and of all thy host from his hand then the king returned to his palace after seeing the feet of the prince and going in to his daughter acquainted her with what had befallen them both on the parade ground he found her grievously afflicted for the prince and bewailing her separation from him wherefore she fell sick with violent sickness and took to her pillow now when her father saw her on this wise he pressed her to his breast and kissing her between the eyes said to her o oh, my daughter praise allah almighty and thank him for that he hath delivered us from this crafty enchanter this villain this low fellow this thief for thought only of seducing thee and he repeated to her the story of the prince and how he had disappeared in the firmament and he abused him and cursed him knowing not how dearly his daughter loved him but she paid no heed to his words and did but redouble in her tears and wails saying to herself by allah i will neither eat meat nor drain drink till allah reunite me with him her father was greatly concerned for her case and mourned much over her plight but for all he could do to soothe her love longing only increased on her and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixty-third night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the king mourned much over his daughter's plight but for all he could do to soothe her love longing only increased on her thus far concerning the king and princess shams al nahar but as regards prince kamar al akmar when he had risen high in the air he turned his horse's head towards his native land and being alone mused upon the beauty of the princess and her loveliness now he had inquired of the king's people the name of the city and of its king and his daughter and men had told him that it was the city of sanna'a so he journeyed with all speed till he drew near his father's capital and making an airy circuit about the city alighted on the roof of the king's palace where he left his horse whilst he descended into the palace and seeing its threshold strewn with ashes thought that one of his family was dead then he entered as of wont and found his father and mother and sister clad in mourning raiment of black all pale of faces and lean of frames when his sire descried him and was assured that it was indeed his son he cried out with a great cry and fell down in a fit but after a time coming to himself threw himself upon him and embraced him clipping him to his bosom and rejoicing in him with exceeding joy and extreme gladness his mother and sisters heard this so they came in and seeing the prince fell upon him kissing him and weeping and joying with exceeding joyance then they questioned him of his case so he told them all that had passed from first to last and his father said to him praised be allah for thy safety o coolth of my eyes and core of my heart then the king bade hold high festival and the glad tidings flew through the city so they beat drums and cymbals and doffing the weed of mourning they donned the gay garb of gladness and decorated the streets and markets whilst the folk vied with one another who should be the first to give the king joy 
and the king proclaimed a general pardon and opening the prisons released those who were there imprisoned moreover he made banquets for the people with great abundance of eating and drinking for seven days and nights and all creatures were gladsomest and he took horse with his son and rode out with him that the folk might see him and rejoice after a while the prince asked about the maker of the horse saying o oh, my father what hath fortune done with him and the king answered allah never bless him nor the hour wherein i set eyes on him for he was the cause of thy separation from us o oh, my son and he hath lain in jail since the day of thy disappearance then the king bade release him from prison and sending for him invested him in a dress of satisfaction and entreated him with the utmost favour and munificence save that he would not give him his daughter to wife whereat the sage raged with sore rage and repented of that which he had done knowing that the prince had secured the secret of the steed and the manner of its motion moreover the king said to his son i reck thou wilt do will not to go near the horse henceforth and more especially not to mount it after this day for thou knowest not its properties and belike thou art in error about it now the prince had told his father of his adventure with the king of sana and his daughter and he said had the king intended to kill thee he had done so but thine hour was not yet come when the rejoicings were at an end the people returned to their places and the king and his son to the palace where they sat down and fell to eating and drinking and making merry now the king had a handsome handmaiden who was skilled in playing the lute so she took it and began to sweep the strings and sing thereto before the king and his son of separation of lovers and she chanted the following verses deem not that absence breeds in me aught of forgetfulness what should remember i did you fro my remembrance vain time dies but never dies the fondest love for you we bear and in your love i'll die and in your love i'll arise again when the prince heard these verses the fires of longing flamed up in his heart and pine and passion redoubled upon him grief and regret were sore upon him and his bowels yearned in him for love of the king's daughter of sanaa so he rose forthright and escaping his father's notice went forth the palace to the horse and mounting it turned the pin of accent whereupon bird-like it flew with him high in air and soared towards the upper regions of the sky in early morning his father missed him and going up to the pinnacle of the palace in great concern saw his son rising into the firmament whereat he was sore afflicted and repented in all penitence that he had not taken the horse and hidden it and he said to himself by allah if but my son return to me i will destroy the horse that my heart may be at rest concerning my son and he fell again to weeping and bewailing himself and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixty-fourth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the king again fell to weeping and bewailing himself for his son such was his case but as regards the prince he ceased not flying on through air till he came to the city of sana and alighted on the roof as before then he crept down stealthily and finding the eunuch asleep as of wont raised the curtain and went on little by little till he came to the door of the princess's alcove chamber and stopped to listen when lo he heard her shedding plenteous tears and reciting verses whilst her women slept round her presently overhearing her weeping and wailing quoth they o oh, our mistress why wilt thou mourn for one who mourneth not for thee quoth she o oh, ye little of wit is he for whom i mourn of those who forget or who are forgotten and she fell again to wailing and weeping till sleep overcame her 
Hereat the prince's heart melted for her, and his gallbladder was like to burst. So he entered, and seeing her lying asleep without covering, touched her with his hand, whereupon she opened her eyes and espied him standing by her. Said he, Why all this crying and mourning? And when she knew him, she threw herself upon him, and took him around the neck, and kissed him, and answered, for thy sake and because of my separation from thee said he o oh, my lady i have been made desolate by thee all this long time but she replied tis thou who hast desolated me and hadst thou tarried longer i had surely died rejoined he o oh, my lady what thinkest thou of my case with thy father and how he dealt with me were it not for my love of thee o oh, temptation and seduction of the three worlds i had certainly slain him and made him a warning to all beholders but even as i love thee so i love him for thy sake quoth she how couldst thou leave me can my life be sweet to me after thee quoth he let what hath happened suffice i am now hungry and thirsty so she bade her maidens make ready meat and drink and they sat eating and drinking and conversing till night was well nigh ended and when day broke he rose to take leave of her and depart ere the eunuch should awake shams al nahar asked him whither goest thou and he answered to my father's house and i plight thee my troth that i will come to thee once in every week but she wept and said i conjure thee by allah the almighty take me with thee whereso thou wendest and make me not taste anew the bitter gourd of separation from thee quoth he wilt thou indeed go with me and quoth she yes then said he arise that we depart so she rose forthright and going to a chest arrayed herself in what was richest and dearest to her of her trinkets of gold and jewels of price and she fared forth her handmaids recking not so he carried her up to the roof of the palace and mounting the ebony horse took her up behind him and made her fast to himself binding her with strong bonds after which he turned the shoulder pin of ascent and the horse rose with him high in air when her slave women saw this they shrieked aloud and told her father and mother who in hot haste ran to the palace roof and looking up saw the magical horse flying away with the prince and princess at this the king was troubled with ever-increasing trouble and cried out saying o king's son i conjure thee by allah have ruth on me and my wife and bereave us not of our daughter the prince made him no reply but thinking in himself that the maiden repented of leaving father and mother asked her o oh, ravishment of the age say me wilt thou that i restore thee to thy mother and father whereupon she answered by allah o oh my lord that is not my desire my only wish is to be with thee wherever thou art for i am distracted by the love of thee from all else even from my father and mother hearing these words the prince joyed with great joy and made the horse fly and fare softly with them so as not to disquiet her nor did they stay their flight till they came in sight of a green meadow wherein was a spring of running water here they alighted and ate and drank after which the prince took horse again and set her behind him binding her in his fear for her safety after which they fared on till they came in sight of his father's capital at this the prince was filled with joy and bethought himself to show his beloved the seat of his dominion and his father's power and dignity and give her to know that it was greater than that of her sire so he set her down in one of his father's gardens without the city where his parent was wont to take his pleasure and carrying her into a doomed summer-house prepared there for the king left the ebony horse at the door and charged the damsel keep watch over it saying sit here till my messenger come to thee for i go now to my father 
to make ready a palace for thee and show thee my royal estate she was delighted when she heard these words and said to him do as thou wilt and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section two read by lars rolander Section three, volume five of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, volume five, section three three hundred and sixty fifth night to three hundred and sixty eighth night when it was the three hundred and sixty fifth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the maiden was delighted when she heard these words and said to him do as thou wilt for she thereby understood that she should not enter the city but with due honour and worship as became her rank then the prince left her and betook himself to the palace of the king his father who rejoiced in his return and met him and welcomed him and the prince said to him know that i have brought with me the king's daughter of whom i told thee and have left her without the city in such a garden and come to tell thee that thou mayst make ready the procession of estate and go forth to meet her and show her thy royal dignity and troops and guards answered the king with joy and gladness and straightway bade decorate the town with the goodliest adornment then he took horse and rode out in all magnificence and majesty he and his host high officers and household with drums and kettle drums fives and clarions and all manner instruments whilst the prince drew forth of his treasuries jewelry and apparel and what else are the things which king hoards and made a rare display of wealth and splendour moreover he got ready for the princess a canopied litter of brocades green red and yellow wherein he set indian and greek and abyssinian slave girls then he left the litter and those who were therein and preceded them to the pavilion where he had set her down and searched but found not neither princess nor horse when he saw this he beat his face and rent his raiment and began to wander round about the garden as he had lost his wits after which he came to his senses and said to himself how could she have come at the secret of this horse seeing i told her nothing of it maybe the persian sage who made the horse hath chanced upon her and stolen her away in revenge for my father's treatment of him then he sought the guardians of the garden and asked them if they had seen any pass the precincts and said hath any one come in here tell me the truth and the whole truth or i will at once strike off your heads they were terrified by his threats but they answered with one voice we have seen no man enter save the persian sage who came to gather healing herbs so the prince was certified that it was indeed he that had taken away the maiden and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixty-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the prince heard their answer he was certified that the sage had taken away the maiden and abode confounded and perplexed concerning his case and as he was abashed before the folk and turning to his sire told him what had happened and said to him take the troops and march them back to the city as for me i will never return till i have cleared up this affair when the king heard this he wept and beat his breast and said to him o oh, my son calm thy choler and master thy chagrin and come home with us and look what king's daughter thou wouldst fain have that i may marry thee to her but the prince paid no heed to his words and farewelling him departed whilst the king returned to the city and their joy was changed into sore annoy 
now as destiny issued her decree when the prince left the princess in the garden house and betook himself to his father's palace for the ordering of his affair the persian entered the garden to pluck certain samples and scenting the sweet savour of musk and perfumes that exhaled from the princess and impregnated the whole place followed it till he came to the pavilion and saw standing at the door the horse which he had made with his own hands his heart was filled with joy and gladness for he had bemourned its loss much since it had gone out of his hand so he went up to it and examining its every part found it whole and sound whereupon he was about to mount and ride away when he bethought himself and said needs must i first look what the prince hath brought and left here with the horse so he entered the pavilion and seeing the princess sitting there as she were the sun shining sheen in the sky serene knew her at the first glance to be some high-born lady and doubted not but the prince had brought her thither on the horse and left her in the pavilion whilst he went to the city to make ready for her entry in state procession with all splendour then he went up to her and kissed the earth between her hands whereupon she raised her eyes to him and finding him exceedingly foul of face and favour asked who art thou and he answered o oh, my lady i am a messenger sent by the prince who hath bidden me bring thee to another pleasance nearer the city for that my lady the queen cannot walk so far and is unwilling of her joy in thee that another should forestall her with thee quoth she where is the prince and quoth the persian he is in the city with his sire and forthwith he shall come for thee in great state said she o oh, thou say me could he find none handsomer to send to me whereat loud laughed the sage and said yea verily he hath not a mameluk as ugly as i am but o oh, my lady let not the ill favour of my face and the foulness of my form deceive thee hadst thou profited of me as hath the prince verily thou wouldst praise my affair indeed he chose me as his messenger to thee because of my uncomeliness and loathsomeness in his jealous love of thee else hath he mamelukes and negro slaves pages eunuchs and attendants out of number each goodlier than other when as she heard this it commended itself to her reason and she believed him so she rose forthright and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixty-seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the persian sage acquainted the princess with the case of the king's son she believed him so she rose forthright and putting her hand in his said o oh, my father what hast thou brought me to ride he replied o oh, my lady thou shalt ride the horse thou camest on and she i cannot ride it by myself whereupon he smiled and knew that he was her master and said i will ride with thee myself so he mounted and taking her up behind him bound her to himself with firm bonds while she knew not what he would with her then he turned the ascent pin whereupon the belly of the horse became full of wind and it swayed to and fro like a wave of the sea and rose with them high in air nor slackened in its flight till it was out of sight of the city now when shams al nahir saw this she asked him ho oh, thou what is become of that thou toldest me of my prince making me believe that he sent thee to me answered the persian allah damn the prince he is a mean and skinflint knave she cried woe to thee how darest thou disobey thy lord's commandment whereto the persian replied he is no lord of mine knowest thou who i am rejoined the princess i know nothing of thee save what thou toldest me and retorted he what i told thee was a trick of mine against thee and the king's son i have long lamented the loss of this horse which is under us for i constructed it and made myself master of it but now i have gotten firm hold of it and thee too 
and i will burn his heart even as he hath burnt mine nor shall he ever have the horse again no never so be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear for i can be of more use to thee than he and i am generous as i am wealthy my servants and slaves shall obey thee as their mistress i will robe thee in finest raiment and thine every wish shall be at thy will when she heard this she buffeted her face and cried out saying ah well away i have not won my beloved and i have lost my father and mother and she wept bitter tears over what had befallen her whilst the sage fared on with her without ceasing till he came to the land of the greeks and alighted in a verdant mead abounding in streams and trees now this meadow lay near a city wherein was a king of high potions and it chanced that he went forth that day to hunt and divert himself as he passed by the meadow he saw the persian standing there with the damsel and the horse by his side and before the sage was ware the king's slaves fell upon him and carried him and the lady and the horse to their master who noting the foulness of the man's favour and his loathsomeness and the beauty of the girl and her loveliness said o oh, my lady what kin is this oldster to thee the persian made haste to reply saying she is my wife and the daughter of my father's brother but the lady at once gave him the lie and said o oh, king by allah i know him not nor is he my husband nay he is a wicked magician who hath stolen me away by force and fraud thereupon the king bade bastinado the persian and they beat him till he was well nigh dead after which the king commanded to carry him to the city and cast him into jail and taking from him the damsel and the ebony horse though he knew not its properties nor the secret of its motion set the girl in his seraglio and the horse amongst his hordes such was the case with the sage and the lady but as regards prince kamar al akmar he garbed himself in travelling gear and taking what he needed of money set out tracking that trail in very sorry plight and journeyed from country to country and city to city seeking the princess and inquiring after the ebony horse whilst all who heard him marvelled at him and deemed his talk extravagant thus he continued doing a long while but for all his inquiry and quest he could hit on no new news of her at last he came to her father's city of sanaa and there asked for her but could get no tidings of her and found her father mourning her loss so he turned back and made for the land of the greeks continuing to inquire concerning the twain as he went and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and sixty-eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the king's son made for the land of the greeks continuing to inquire concerning the two as he went along till as chance would have it he alighted at a certain khan and saw a company of merchants sitting at talk so he sat down near them and heard one say o oh, my friends i lately witnessed a wonder of wonders they asked what was that and he answered i was visiting such a district in such a city naming the city wherein was the princess and i heard its people chatting of a strange thing which had lately befallen it was that their king went out one day hunting and coursing with a company of his courtiers and the lords of his realm and issuing from the city they came to a green meadow where they spied an old man standing with a woman sitting hard by a horse of ebony the man was foulest foul of face and loathly of form but the woman was a marvel of beauty and loveliness and elegance and perfect grace and as for the wooden horse it was a miracle never saw eyes aught goodlier than it nor more gracious than its make asked the others and what did the king with them and the merchant answered as for the man the king seized him and questioned him of the damsel and he pretended that she was his wife 
and the daughter of his paternal uncle but she gave him the lie forthright and declared that he was a sorcerer and a villain so the king took her from the old man and bade beat him and cast him into the trunk house as for the ebony horse i know not what became of it when the prince heard these words he drew near to the merchant and began questioning him discreetly and courteously touching the name of the city and of its king which when he knew he passed the night full of joy and as soon as dawned the day he set out and travelled sans surcease till he reached that city but when he would have entered the gatekeepers laid hands on him that they might bring him before the king to question him of his condition and the craft in which he was skilled and the cause of his coming thither such being the usage and custom of their ruler now it was supper time when he entered the city and it was then impossible to go in to the king or take counsel with him respecting the stranger so the guards carried him to the jail thinking to lay him by the heels there for the night but when the warders saw his beauty and loveliness they could not find it in their hearts to imprison him they made him sit with them without the walls and when food came to them he ate with them what sufficed him as soon as they had made an end of eating they turned to the prince and said what countryman art thou i came from fars answered he the land of chosroes when they heard this they laughed and one of them said o chosroan i have heard the talk of men and their histories and i have looked into their conditions but never saw i or heard i a bigger liar than the chosron which is with us in the jail quoth another and never did i see aught fouler than his favour or more hideous than his visionomy asked the prince what have ye seen of his lying and they answered he pretendeth that he is one of the wise now the king came upon him as he went a-hunting and found with him a most beautiful woman and a horse of the blackest ebony never saw i a handsomer as for the damsel she is with the king who is enamoured of her and would fain marry her but she is mad and were his man a leech as he claimeth to be he would have healed her for the king doth his utmost to discover a cure for her case and a remedy for her disease and this whole year past hath he spent treasure upon physicians and astrologers on her account but none can avail to cure her as for the horse it is in the royal hoard house and the ugly man is here with us in prison and as soon as night falleth he weepeth and bemoaneth himself and will not let us sleep and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section three read by lars rolander section four volume five of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by lars rolander the book of a thousand nights and a night volume five section four three hundred and sixty ninth night to three hundred and seventy second night when it was the three hundred and sixty ninth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the warders had recounted the case of the persian necromancer they held in prison and his weeping and wailing the prince at once devised a device whereby he might compass his desire and presently the guards of the gate being minded to sleep led him into the jail and locked the door so he overheard the persian weeping and bemoaning himself in his own tongue and saying alack and alas for my sin that i sinned against myself and against the king's son in that which i did with the damsel for i neither left her nor won my will of her all this cometh of my lack of sense in that i sought for myself that which i deserved not 
and which befitted not the like of me for whoso seeketh what suiteth him not at all falleth with the like of my fall now when the king's son heard this he accosted him in persian saying how long will this weeping and wailing last say me thinkest thou that hath befallen thee that which never befell other than thou now when the persian heard this he made friends with him and began to complain to him of his case and misfortunes and as soon as the morning morrowed the warders took the prince and carried him before their king informing him that he had entered the city on the previous night at a time when audience was impossible quoth the king to the prince whence comest thou and what is thy name and trade and why hast thou travelled hither he replied as to my name i am called in persian harja as to my country i come from the land of fars and i am of the men of art and especially of the art of medicine and healing the sick and those whom the jinns drive mad for this i go round about all countries and cities to profit by adding knowledge to my knowledge and whenever i see a patient i heal him and this is my craft now when the king heard this he rejoiced with exceeding joy and said o oh, excellent sage thou hast indeed come to us at a time when we need thee then he acquainted him with the case of the princess adding if thou cure her and recover her from her madness thou shalt have of me everything thou seekest replied the prince allah save and favour the king describe to me all thou hast seen of her insanity and tell me how long it is since the excess attacked her also how thou camest by her and the horse and the sage so the king told him the whole story from first to last adding the sage is in jail quoth the prince o auspicious king and what hast thou done with the horse quoth the king o youth it is with me yet laid up in one of my treasure chambers whereupon said the prince within himself the best thing i can do is first to see the horse and assure myself of its condition if it be whole and sound all will be well and end well but if its motor works be destroyed i must find some other way of delivering my beloved thereupon he turned to the king and said to him o king i must see the horse in question haply i may find in it somewhat that will serve me for the recovery of the damsel with all my heart replied the king and taking him by the hand showed him into the place where the horse was the prince went round about it examining its condition and found it whole and sound whereat he rejoiced greatly and said to the king allah save and exalt the king i would fain go in to the damsel that i may see how it is with her for i hope in allah to heal her by my healing hand through means of the horse then he bade them take care of the horse and the king carried him to the princess's apartment where her lover found her wringing her hands and writhing and beating herself against the ground and tearing her garments to tatters as was her wont but there was no madness of jinn in her and she did this but that none might approach her when the prince saw her thus he said to her no harm shall betide thee o ravishment of the three worlds and went on to soothe her and speak her fair till he managed to whisper i am kamar al akmar whereupon she cried out with a loud cry and fell down fainting for excess of joy but the king thought this was epilepsy brought on by her fear of him and by her suddenly being startled then the prince put his mouth to her ear and said to her o shams al nahar o seduction of the universe have a care for thy life and mine and be patient and constant for this our position needeth sufferance and skilful contrivance to make shift for our delivery from the tyrannical king my first move will be now to go out to him and tell him that thou art possessed of a jinn 
and hence thy madness but that i will engage to heal thee and drive away the evil spirit if he will at once unbind thy bonds so when he cometh in to thee do thou speak him smooth words that he may think i have cured thee and all will be done for us as we desire quoth she hearkening and obedience and he went out to the king in joy and gladness and said to him o august king i have by thy good fortune discovered her disease and its remedy and have cured her for thee so now do thou go in to her and speak her softly and treat her kindly and promise her what may please her so shall all thou desirest of her be accomplished to thee and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and seventieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the prince feigned himself a leech and went into the damsel and made himself known to her and told her how he purposed to deliver her she cried hearkening and obedience he then fared forth from her and sought the king and said go thou in to her and speak her softly and promise her what may please her so shall all thou desirest of her be accomplished to thee thereupon the king went in to her and when she saw him she rose and kissing the ground before him bade him welcome and said i admire how thou hast come to visit thy handmaid this day whereat he was ready to fly for joy and bade the waiting women and the eunuchs attend her and carry her to the hammam and make ready for her dresses and adornment so they went in to her and saluted her and she returned their salams with the goodliest language and after the pleasantest fashion whereupon they clad her in royal apparel and clasping a collar of jewels about her neck carried her to the bath and served her there then they brought her forth as she were the full moon and when she came into the king's presence she saluted him and kissed ground before him whereupon he joyed in her with joy exceeding and said to the prince o sage o philosopher all this is of thy blessing allah increase to us the benefit of thy healing breath the prince replied o king for the completion of her cure it behoveth that thou go forth thou and all thy troops and guards to the place where thou foundest her not forgetting the beast of black wood which was with her for therein is a devil and unless i exorcise him he will return to her and afflict her at the head of every month with love and gladness cried the king o oh, thou prince of all philosophers and most learned of all who see the light of day then he brought out the ebony horse to the meadow in question and rode thither with all his troops and the princess little weeting the purpose of the prince now when they came to the appointed place the prince still habited as a leech bade them set the princess and the steed as far as i could reach from the king and his troops and said to him with thy leave and at thy word i will now proceed to the fumigations and conjurations and here imprison the adversary of mankind that he may never more return to her after this i shall mount this wooden horse which seemeth to be made of ebony and take the damsel up behind me whereupon it will shake and sway to and fro and fare forwards till it come to thee when the affair will be at an end and after this thou mayst do with her as thou wilt when the king heard his words he rejoiced with extreme joy so the prince mounted the horse and taking the damsel up behind him whilst the king and his troops watched him bound her fast to him then he turned the ascending pin and the horse took flight and soared with them high in air till they disappeared from every eye after this the king abode half the day expecting their return but they returned not so when he despaired of them repenting him greatly of that which he had done and grieving sore for the loss of the damsel he went back to the city with his troops 
he then sent for the persian who was in prison and said to him o oh, thou traitor o oh, thou villain why didst thou hide from me the mystery of the ebony horse and now a sharper hath come to me and hath carried it off together with a slave girl whose ornaments are worth a mint of money and i shall never see any one or anything of them again so the persian related to him all his past first and last and the king was seized with a fit of fury which well nigh ended his life he shut himself up in his palace for a while mourning and afflicted but at last his vassals came in to him and applied themselves to comfort him saying verily he who took the damsel is an enchanter and praised be allah who hath delivered thee from his craft and sorcery and they ceased not from him till he was comforted for her loss thus far concerning the king but as for the prince he continued his career towards his father's capital in joy and cheer and stayed not till he alighted on his own palace where he set the lady in safety after which he went in to his father and mother and saluted them and acquainted them with her coming whereat they were filled with solace and gladness then he spread great banquets for the townsfolk and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and seventy-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the king's son spread great banquets for the townsfolk, and they held high festival a whole month, at the end of which time he went in to the princess, and they took their joy of each other with exceeding joy. But his father brake the ebony horse in pieces, and destroyed its mechanism for flight. Moreover, the prince wrote a letter to the princess's father, advising him of all that had befallen her, and informing him how she was now married to him, and in all health and happiness, and sent it by a messenger, together with costly presents and curious rarities. And when the messenger arrived at the city, which was Sa'ana, and delivered the letter and the presents to the king he read the missive and rejoiced greatly thereat and accepted the presents honouring and rewarding the bearer handsomely moreover he forwarded rich gifts to his son-in-law by the same messenger who returned to his master and acquainted him with what had passed whereat he was much cheered after this the prince wrote a letter every year to his father-in-law and sent him presents till in course of time his sire king sabur deceased and he reigned in his stead ruling justly over his lieges and conducting himself well and righteously towards them so that the land submitted to him and his subjects did him loyal service and kamar al akmar and his wife shams al nahar abode in the enjoyment of all satisfaction and solace of life till there came to them the destroyer of delights and sunderer of societies the plunderer of palaces the carterer for cemeteries and the garnerer of graves and now glory be to the living one who dieth not and in whose hand is the dominion of the worlds visible and invisible moreover i have heard tell the tale of uns al wujud and the wazir's daughter al ward fil akmam or rose in hood there was once in days of yore and in ages and times long gone before a king of great power and lord of glory and dominion galore who had a wazir ibrahim hight and this wazir's daughter was a damsel of extraordinary beauty and loveliness gifted with passing brilliancy and the perfection of grace possessed of abundant wit and in all good breeding complete but she loved wassail and wine and the human face divine and choice verses and rare stories and the delicacy of her inner gifts invited all hearts to love even as saith the poet describing her like moon she shines amid the starry sky robbing in tresses blackest ink out by the morning breezes give her boughs fair drink and like a branch she sways with supple ply 
she smiles in passing us o thou that art fairest in yellow robe or cramoisy thou playst with my wit in love as though sparrow in hand of playful boy were i her name was rose in hood and she was so named for her young and tender beauty and the freshness of her brilliancy and the king loved her in his cups because of her accomplishments and fine manners now it was the king's custom yearly to gather together all the nobles of his realm and play with a ball so when the day came round whereon the folk assembled for ball play the minister's daughter seated herself at her lattice to divert herself by looking on at the game and as they were at play her glance fell upon a youth among the guards than whom never was seen a comelier face nor a goodlier form for he was bright of favour showing white teeth when he smiled tall statured and broad-shouldered she looked at him again and again and could not take her fill of gazing and presently said to her nurse what is the name of yonder handsome young man among the troops replied the nurse oh my daughter the dear fellows are all handsome which of them dost thou mean said rose in hood wait till he come past and i will point him out to thee so she took an apple and as he rode by dropped it on him whereupon he raised his head to see who did this and espied the vasi's daughter at the window as she were the moon of fullest light in the darkness of the night nor did he withdraw his eyes till his heart was utterly lost to her and he recited these lines was archer shot me or was thine eyes ruined lover's heart that thy charms espice was the notched shaft from a host outshot or from latticed window in sudden guise when the game was at an end and all had left the ground she asked her nurse what is the name of that youth i showed thee and the good woman answered his name is uns al wujud whereat rose in hood shook her head and lay down on her couch with thoughts of fire for love then sighing deeply she improvised these couplets he missed not who dubbed thee world's delight a world's love conjoining to bounty's light o thou whose favour the full moon favours whose charms make life and the living bright thou hast none equal among mankind sultan of beauty and proof i'll cite thine eyebrows are likest a well-formed nun and thine eyes are sad by his hand indite thy shape is the soft green bow that gives when asked to all with all gracious bright thou excellest knights of the world in store with delight and beauty and bounty dight when she had finished her verses she wrote them on a sheet of paper which she folded in a piece of gold embroidered silk and placed under her pillow now one of her nurses had seen her so she came up to her and held her in talk till she slept when she stole the scroll from under her pillow and after reading it knew that she had fallen in love with uns al wujud then she returned the scroll to its place and when her mistress awoke she said to her o oh, my lady indeed i am to thee a true counsellor and am tenderly anxious on thy account know that love is a tyrant and the hiding it melteth iron and entaileth sickness and unease nor for whoso confesseth it is there aught of reproach rejoined rose in hood and what is the medicine of passion o nurse mine answered the nurse the medicine of passion is enjoyment quoth she and how may one come by enjoyment quoth the other by letters and messages my lady by whispered words of compliment and by greetings before the world all this bringeth lovers together 
and makes hard matters easy so if thou have aught at heart mistress mine i am the fittest to keep thy secret and do thy desires and carry thy letters now when the damsel heard this her reason flew and fled for joy but she restrained herself from speech till she should see the issue of the matter saying within herself none knoweth this thing of me nor will i trust this one with my secret till i have tried her then said the woman o oh, my lady i saw in my sleep as though a man came to me and said thy mistress and uns al wujud love each other so do thou serve their case by carrying their messages and doing their desires and keeping their secrets and much good shall befall thee so now i have told thee my vision and it is thine to decide quoth rose in hood after she heard of the dream and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and seventy-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that rose in hood asked her nurse after hearing of the dream tell me canst thou keep a secret o my nurse whereto she answered and how should i not keep secrecy i that am of the flower of thee free then the maiden pulled out the scroll whereon she had written the verses and said carry me this my letter to uns al wujud and bring me his reply the nurse took the letter and repairing to uns al wujud kissed his hands and greeted him right courteously then gave him the paper and he read it and comprehending the contents wrote on the back these couplets i soothe my heart and my love repel but my state interprets my love too well when tears flow i tell them mine eyes are ill lest the censor see and my case foretell i was fancy free and unknew i love but i fell in love and in madness fell i show you my case and complain of pain pine and ecstasy that your wrath compel i write you with tears of eyes so belike they explain the love come my heart to quell allah god a face that is veiled with charms whose thrall is moon and the stars as well in her beauty i never beheld the like from her sway the branches learn sway and swell i beg you and tis not too much of pains to call twere boon without parallel i give you a soul you will haply take to which union is heaven disunion hell then he folded the letter and kissing it gave it to the go-between and said to her o nurse incline the lady's heart to me to hear is to obey answered she and carried the script to her mistress who kissed it and laid it on her heart then she opened it and read it and understood it and wrote at the foot of it these couplets o oh, whose heart by our beauty's captive tain have patience and all thou shalt haply gain when we knew that thy love was a true effect and what pained our heart to thy heart gave pain we had granted thee wished for call and more but hindered so doing the chamberlain when the night grows dark through our love's excess fire burns our vitals with might and main and sleep from our beds is driven afar and our bodies are tortured by passion bane hide love in love's code is the first command and from raising his veil thy hand restrain i fell love fulfilled by yon gazelle would he never wander from where i dwell then she folded the letter and gave it to the nurse who took it and went out from her mistress to seek the young man but as she would fare forth the chamberlain met her and said to her whither away to the bath answered she 
but in her fear and confusion she dropped the letter without knowing it and went off unrecking what she had done when one of the eunuchs seeing it lying in the way picked it up when the nurse came without the door she sought for it but found it not so turned back to her mistress and told her of this and what had befallen her meanwhile the wazir came out of the harem and seated himself on his couch whereupon behold the eunuch who had picked up the letter came in to him holding it in hand and said o oh my lord i found this paper lying upon the floor and picked it up so the minister took it from his hand folded as it was and opening it read the verses as above set down then after mastering the meaning he examined the writing and knew it for his daughter's hand whereupon he went to her mother weeping so abundant tears that his beard was wetted his wife asked him what maketh thee weep o my lord and he answered take this letter and see what is therein so she took it and found it to be a love letter from her daughter rose in hood to uns al wujud whereupon the ready drop sprang to her eyes but she composed her mind and gulping down her tears said to her husband o oh, my lord there is no profit in weeping the right course is to cast about for a means of keeping thine honour and concealing the affair of thy daughter and she went on to comfort him and lighten his trouble but he said i am fearful for my daughter by reason of this new passion knowest thou not that the sultan loveth uns al wajid with exceeding love and my fear hath two causes the first concerneth myself it is that she is my daughter the second is on account of the king for that uns al wujud is a favorite with the sultan and peradventure great troubles shall come out of this affair what deemest thou should be done and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 4 read by lars rolander Section 5, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 5 three hundred and seventy third night to three hundred and seventy sixth night when it was the three hundred and seventy third night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the wazir after recounting the affair of his daughter asked his wife what deemest thou should be done and she answered have patience whilst i pray the prayer for right direction so she prayed a two-bow prayer according to the prophetic ordinance for seeking divine guidance after which she said to her husband in the midst of the sea of treasures standeth a mountain named the mount of the bereaved mother the cause of which being so called shall presently follow in its place in salah and thither can none have access save with pains and difficulty and distress do thou make that same her abiding place accordingly the minister and his wife agreed to build on that mountain a virgin castle and lodge their daughter therein with the necessary provision to be renewed year by year and attendance to cheer and to serve her accordingly he collected carpenters builders and architects and dispatched them to the mountain where they builded her an impregnable castle never saw eyes the like thereof then he made ready vivers and carriage for the journey and going in to his daughter by night bade her prepare to set out on a pleasure excursion thereupon her heart presaged the sorrows of separation and when she went forth and saw the preparations for the journey 
she wept with sore weeping and wrote that upon the door which might acquaint her lover with what had passed and with the transports of passion and grief that were upon her transports such as would make the flesh to shiver and hair to stare and melt the hardest stone with care and tear from every eye a tear and what she wrote were these couplets by allah o thou house if my beloved a morn go by and greet with signs and signals lovers ever is wont to fly i pray thee give him our salams in pure and fragrant guise for he indeed may never know where we this eve shall lie i wot not whither they have fared thus bearing us afar at speed and lightly quipped the lighter from one love to fly when starkens night the birds in brake or branches snugly perched wail for our sorrow and announce our hapless destiny the tongue of their condition saith alas alas for woe and heavy brunt of parting blow to lovers must abide when viewed i separation cups were filled to the brim and us with merest sorrow wine fate came so fast to ply i mixed them with becoming share of patient self to excuse but patience for the loss of you her solace doth refuse now when she ended her lines she mounted and they set forward with her crossing and cutting over wold and wild and riant dale and rugged hill till they came to the shore of the sea of treasures here they pitched their tents and built her a great ship wherein they went down with her and her suite and carried them over to the mountain the minister had ordered them on reaching the journey's end to set her in the castle and to make their way back to the shore where they were to break up the vessel so they did his bidding and returned home weeping over what had befallen such was their case but as regards uns al wujud he arose from sleep and prayed the dawn prayer after which he took horse and rode forth to attend upon the sultan on his way he passed by the wazir's house thinking perchance to see some of his followers as a wand but he saw no one and looking upon the door he read written thereon the verses aforesaid at this sight his senses failed him fire was kindled in his vitals and he returned to his lodging where he passed the day in trouble and transports of grief without finding ease or patience till night darkened upon him when his yearning and love-longing redoubled thereupon by way of concealment he disguised himself in the ragged garb of a fakir and set out wandering at random through the glooms of night distracted and knowing not whither he went so he wandered on all that night and next day till the heat of the sun waxed fierce and the mountains flamed like fire and thirst was grievous upon him presently he spied a tree by whose side was a thin thread of running water so he made towards it and sitting down in the shade on the bank of the rivulet essayed to drink but found that the water had no taste in his mouth and indeed his colour had changed and his face had yellowed and his feet were swollen with travel and travail so he shed copious tears and repeated these couplets the lover is drunken with love of friend on a longing that groweth his joys depend love distracted ardent bewildered lost from home nor may food aught of pleasure lend how can life be delightsome to one in love and from lover parted twere strange unkend i melt with the fire of my pine for them and the tears down my cheek in a stream descend shall i see them say me or one that comes from the camp who the afflicted heart shall tend and after thus reciting he wept till he wetted the hard dry ground but anon without loss of time he rose and fared on again over waste and wold till there came out upon him a lion 
with a neck buried in tangled mane, a head the bigness of a dome, a mouth wider than the door thereof, and teeth like elephants' tusks. Now when Uns al Wujud saw him, he gave himself up for lost, and turning towards the temple of Mecca, pronounced the professions of the faith, and prepared for death. He had read in books that whoso will flatter the lion, beguileth him, for that he is readily duped by smooth speech, and gentled by being glorified. So he began and said, O lion of the forest, O lord of the waste, O terrible Leo, O father of fighters, O sultan of wild beasts, behold, I am a lover in longing, whom passion and severance have been wronging. Since I parted from my dear, I have lost my reasoning gear. Wherefore, to my speech do thou give ear, and have wrath on my passion and hope and fear. When the lion heard this, he drew back from him, and sitting down on his hind quarters, raised his head to him, and began to frisk tail and pause, which, when Uns al Wujud saw, he recited these couplets. Lion of the world, wilt thou murder me, ere I meet her who doomed me to slavery? I am not game, and I bear no fat, for the loss of my love makes me sickness dree, and estrangement from her hath so worn me down, I am like a shape in a shroud we see. O thou sire of spoils, O thou lion of war, Give not my pains to the blamer's gree. I burn with love, I am drowned in tears, For a parting from lover sore misery, And my thoughts of her in the murk of night, For love hath made my being unbe. As he had finished his lines, the lion rose, And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, And ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and seventy-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that as Uns al Wujud ended his lines, the lion arose and stalked slowly up to him, with eyes tear railing, and licked him with his tongue, then walked on before him, signing to him as though saying, Follow me. So he followed him, and the beast ceased not leading him on for a while, till he brought him up a mountain, and guided him to the farther side, where he came upon the track of a caravan over the desert, and knew it to be that of Rose in Hood and her company. Then he took the trail, and when the lion saw that he knew the track for that of the party which escorted her, he turned back and went his way, whilst Uns al Wujud walked along the footmarks day and night, till they brought him to a dashing sea, swollen with clashing surge the trail led down to the sandy shore and there broke off whereby he knew that they had taken ship and had continued their journey by water so he lost hope of finding his lover and with hot tears he repeated these couplets far is the fane and patience faileth me how can i seek them over the abysmal sea or how be patient when my vitals burn, For love of them and sleep waxed insomni. Since the sad day they left the home and fled, My heart's consumed by love's ardency. Sion, Jion, Euphrates like my tears, Make flood no deluged rain its like can see. Mine eyelids chaffed with running tears remain, my heart from fiery sparks is never free. The hosts of love and longing pressed me, And made the hosts of patience break and flee. I've risked my life too freely for their love, And risk of life the least of ills shall be. Allah never punish I that saw those charms, Enshrined and passing full moon's brilliancy. I found me felled by fair wide opened eyes, Which pierced my heart with stringless archery, And soft lith swaying shape enraptured me, As sway the branches of the willow tree, 
with them i covet union that i win o'er love pains cark and care a mastery for love of them i mourn and eve i pine and doubt all came to me from evil ein and when his lines were ended he wept till he swooned away and abode in his swoon a long while but as soon as he came to himself he looked right and left and seeing no one in the desert he became fearful of the wild beasts so he clomb to the top of a high mountain where he heard the voice of a son of adam speaking within a cave he listened and lo they were the accents of a devotee who had forsworn the world and given himself up to pious works and worship he knocked thrice at the cavern door but the hermit made him no answer neither came forth to him wherefore he groaned aloud and recited these couplets what pathway find i my desire to obtain how scape from care and cark and pain and bane all terrors joined to make me old and hoar of head and heart ere youth from me is ta'en nor find i any aid in my passion nor a friend to lighten load of vain and pain how great and many troubles i've endured fortune hath turned her back i see unfain ah mercy mercy on the lover's heart doomed cup of parting and desertion drain a fire is in his heart his vitals waste and severance made his reason vainest vain how dread the day i came to her abode and saw the writ they wrote on doorway lane i wept till gave i earth to drink my grief but still to near and far i did but feign then strayed i till in waste a lion sprang on me and but for flattering words had slain i soothed him so he spared me and lent me aid he too might haply of love's taste complain o devotee that idlest in thy cave me seems eke thou hast learned love's might and main but if at end of woes with them i league straight i'll forget all suffering and fatigue hardly had he made an end of these verses when behold the door of the cavern opened and he heard one say alas the pity of it so he entered and saluted the devotee who returned his salam and asked him what is thy name answered the young man uns al wujud and what caused thee to come hither quoth the hermit so he told him his story in its entirety omitting naught of his misfortunes whereat he wept and said o uns al wujud these twenty years have i passed in this place but never beheld i any man here until yesterday when i heard a noise of weeping and lamentation and looking forth in the direction of the sound saw many people and tents pitched on the seashore and the party at once proceeded to build a ship in which certain of them embarked and sailed over the waters then some of the crew returned with the ship and breaking it up went their way and i suspect that those who embarked in the ship and returned not are they whom thou seekest in that case o uns al wujud thy grief must needs be great and sore and thou art excusable though never yet was lover but suffered love longing then he recited these couplets uns al wujud dost deem me fancy free when pine and longing slay and quicken me i've known love and yearning from the years since mother milk i drank nor ever was free long struggled i with love till learned his smite ask thou of him he'll tell with willing gree love sick and pining drank i passion cup and well nigh perished in mine agony strong was i but my strength to weakness turned and i saw break through patience armory hope not to win love joys without annoy contrary ever links with contrary but fear not change from lover true be true 
unto thy wish some day thine own twill be love hath forbidden to his votaries relinquishment as deadliest heresy the eremite having ended his verse rose and coming up to uns al wujud embraced him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and seventy-fifth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the eremite having ended his verse rose and coming up to uns al wujud embraced him and they wept together till the hills rang with their cries and they fell down fainting when they revived they swore brotherhood in allah almighty after which said uns al wujud this very night will i pray to god and seek of him direction anent what thou shouldst do to attain thy desire thus it was with them but as regards rose in hood when they brought her to the mountain and set her in the castle and she beheld its ordering she wept and exclaimed by allah thou art a goodly place save that thou lackest in thee the presence of the beloved then seeing birds in the island she bade her people set snares for them and put all they caught in cages within the castle and they did so but she sat at a lattice and bethought her of what had passed and desire and passion and distraction redoubled upon her till she burst into tears and repeated these couplets o oh, to whom now of my desire complaining sore shall i bewail my parting from my fear compelled thus to fly flames rage within what underlies my ribs yet hide them i in deepest secret reading i the jealous hostile spy i'm grown as lean attenuate as any pick of tooth by sore estrangement absence ardor ceaseless sob and sigh where is the eye of my beloved to see how i'm become like trees stripped bare of leafage left to linger and to die they tyrannized over me whom they confined in place whereto the lover of my heart may never draw him nigh i beg the sun for me to give greetings a thousandfold at time of rising and again when setting from the sky to the beloved one who shames a full moon's loveliness when shows that slender form that doth the willow branch outvie if rose herself would even with his cheek I say of her, thou art not like it, if to me my portion thou deny. His honey dew of lips is like the grateful water draught, would cool me when a fire in heart upflameth fierce and high. How shall I give him up, who is my heart and soul of me, my malady, my wasting cause, my love, so leech of me? then as the glooms of night closed around her her yearning increased and she called to mind the past and recited also these couplets tis dark my transport and unease now gather might and main and love desire provoketh me to wake my wonted pain the pang of parting takes for ever place within my breast and pining makes me desolate in destitution lane ecstasy sore maltreats my soul and yearning burns my sprite and tears betray love's secrecy which i would lief contain i weet no way i know no case that can make light my load or heal my wasting body or cast out from me this pain a hell of fire is in my heart up flames with lambent tongue and lasa's furnace fires within my liver place have ta'en o thou exaggerating blame for what befell enough i bear with patience whatsoever hath writ for me the pen i swear by allah never to find aught comfort for their loss tis oath of passion's children and their oath are never in vain 
O night, salam so me to friends, and let to them be known of thee true knowledge how I wake and waking ever wone. Meanwhile the hermit said to Uns al Wujud, Go down to the palm grove in the valley and fetch some fibre. So he went and returned with the palm fibre, which the hermit took and twisting into ropes, make therewith a net such as is used for carrying straw, after which he said, O Uns al Wujud, in the heart of the valley groweth a gourd, which springeth up and drieth upon its roots. Go down there and fill this sack with their wind, then tie it together, and casting it into the water, embark thereon, and make for the midst of the sea. So haply thou shalt win thy wish, for whoso never ventureth shall not have what he seeketh. I hear and obey, answered Uns al -Wujud. Then he bade the hermit farewell after the holy man had prayed for him, and betaking himself to the soul of the valley did as his adviser had counselled him, made the sack, launched it upon the water, and pushed from shore. Then there arose a wind which drave him out to sea, till he was lost to the eremit's view, and he ceased not float over the abysses of the ocean, one billow tossing him up and another bearing him down, and he, beholding the while the dangers and marvels of the deep, for the space of three days. At the end of that time fate cast him upon the mount of the bereft mother, where he landed giddy and tottering like a chick unfledged, and at the last of his strength for hunger and thirst, but finding there streams flowing and birds on the branches cooing and fruit-laden trees in clusters and singly growing, he ate of the fruits and drank of the rills. Then he walked on till he saw some white thing afar off, and making for it found that it was a strongly fortified castle. So he went up to the gate, and seeing it locked, sat down by it, and there he sat for three days, when, behold, the gate opened, and an eunuch came out, who, finding Uns al Wujud there, seated, said to him, Whence camest thou, and who brought thee hither? Quoth he, From Ispahan and I was voyaging with merchandise when my ship was wrecked, and the waves cast me upon the farther side of this island. Whereupon the eunuch wept and embraced him, saying, Allah preserve thee, O thou friendly face, Ispahan is mine own country, and I have there a cousin, the daughter of my father's brother, whom I loved from my childhood, and cherished with fond affection but a people stronger than we fell upon us in foray and taking me among other booty cut off my yard and sold me for a castrato whilst i was yet a lad and this is how i came to be in such case and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and seventy-sixth night she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the eunuch who came forth from the castle where Rose in Hood was confined, told Uns al Wujud all his tale, and said, The raiders who captured me cut off my yard and sold me for a castrato, and this is how I came to be in such case. And after saluting him and wishing him long life, the eunuch carried him into the courtyard of the castle where he saw a great tank of water surrounded by trees, on whose branches hung cages of silver with doors of gold, and therein birds were warbling and singing the praises of the requiting king. And when he came to the first cage, he looked in, and lo, a turtle dove on seeing him, raised her voice and cried out, saying, O oh, thou bounty fraught! Whereat he fell down fainting, and after coming to himself he sighed heavily, and recited these couplets. O turtle thou, like me art thou distraught? Then pray the Lord and sing, O bounty fraught. Would I knew, and thy moan were sign of joy, or cry of love desire, in heart inwrought, and moan thou pining for a lover gone, 
who left thee woe begone to pine in thought or if like me hast lost thy fondest friend and severance long desire to memory brought o allah guard a faithful lover's lot i will not leave her though my bones go rot then after ending his verses he fainted again and presently reviving he went on to the second cage wherein he found a ring dove when it saw him it sang out o eternal i thank thee and he groaned and recited these couplets i heard a ring dove chanting plaintively i thank thee o eternal for this misery haply perchance may allah of his grace send me by this long round my love to see full oft she comes with honeyed lips dark red and heaps up low upon love's ardency quoth i while longing fires flame high and fierce in heart and wasting life's vitality and tears like goats of blood go railing down in torrents of her cheeks now pale or blee none ever trod earth that was not born to woe but i will patient dream mine agony so help me allah till that happy day when with my mistress i unite shall be then will i spend my good on lover whites who are of my tribe and of the faith of me and loose the very birds from yale set free and change my grief for gladdest gree and glee then he went on to the third cage wherein he found a mocking-bird which when it saw him set up a song and he recited the following couplets pleaseth me yon hazard of mocking strain like voice of lover pained by love in vain woes me for lovers and how many men by nights and pine and passion low are lain as thou by stress of love they had been made mournless and sleepless by their pain and bane when i went daft for him who conquered me and pined for him who proved of proudest strain my tears in streams down trickled and i cried these long linked tears bind like an adamant chain grew concupiscence severance long and i lost patience hoarse and grief waxed sovereign if justice bide in world and me unite with him i love and allah veil us stain i'll strip my clothes that he my form shall sight with parting distance grief how poor of plight then he went to the fourth cage where he found a bulbul which at sight of him began to sway to and fro and sing its plaintive descant and when he heard his complaint he burst into tears and repeated these couplets the bulbul's note when as dawn is nigh tells the lover from strains of strings to fly complaineth for passion unsal wujud for pine that would being to him deny how many strain do we hear whose sound soften stones and the rock can mollify and the breeze of morning that sweetly speaks of meadows in flowered greenery and scents and sounds in the morning tide of birds and zephyrs in fragrance vie but i think of one of an absent friend and tears ray like rain from a showery sky and the flamey tongues in my breast uprise as sparks from gleed that in dark air fly allah deign vouchsafe to a lover distraught some day the face of his dear to descry for lovers indeed no excuse is clear save excuse of sight an excuse of i then he walked on a little and came to a goodly cage then which was no goodlier there and in it a culver of the forest that is to say a wood pigeon the bird renowned among birds as the minstrel of love longing with a collar of jewels about its neck marvellous fine and fair he considered it a while, and, seeing it absently brooding in its cage, 
he shed tears and repeated these couplets o culver of cops with salams i greet o brother of lovers who woe must weet i love a gazelle who is slender slim whose glances for keenest the scimitar beat for her love are my heart and my vitals afire and my frame consumes in love's fever heat the sweet taste of food is unlawful for me and forbidden is slumber unlawful is sweet endurance and solace have travelled from me and love homes in my heart and grief takes firm seat how shall life deal joy when they flee my sight who are joy and gladness and life and sprite as soon as uns al wujud had ended his verse and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 5 read by lars rolander Section 6, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 6. Three hundred and seventy seventh night to three hundred and eightieth night. When it was the three hundred and seventy seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that as soon as Uns al Wujud had ended his verse, the wood culver awoke from its brooding and cooed a reply to his lines and shrilled and trilled with its thrilling notes till it all but spake with human speech, and the tongue of the case talked for it, and recited these couplets. O lover, thou bringest to thought a tide, when the strength of my youth first faded and died, and a friend of whose form I was enamoured, seductive and dight with beauty's pride, whose voice as he sat on the sandhill tree, from the nay sweet sound turn my heart aside a fowler snared him in net the while oh that man would leave me at large he cried i had hoped he might somewhat of mercy show when a hapless lover he so espied but alas might him who tore me away in his hardness of heart from my lover's side but aye my desire for him groweth more, and my heart with the fires of disjunction is fried. Allah guard a true lover who strives with love, and hath borne the torments I still abide, and seeing me bound in this cage with mind of wrath release me my love to find. Then Uns al Wujud turned to his companion, the Isbahi, and said, What palace is this? Who built it, and who abideth in it? Quoth the eunuch, The vazir of a certain king built it to guard his daughter, fearing for her the accidents of time and the incidents of fortune, and lodged her herein, her and her attendants, nor do we open it say once in every year, when their provision cometh to them. And Uns al Wujud said to himself, I have gained my end, though I may have long to wait. Such was his case, but as regards Rose in Hood, of a truth she took no pleasure in eating or drinking, sitting or sleeping, but her desire and passion and distraction redoubled on her, and she went wandering about the castle corners but could find no issue wherefore she shed tears and recited these couplets they have cruelly ta'en me from him my beloved and made me taste anguish in prison tain they have fired my heart with the flames of love bared all sight of him whom to see i'm fain 
in a lofty palace they prisoned me on a mountain placed in the middle main if they'd have me forget him right vain's their wish for my love is grown of a stronger strain how can i forget him whose face was cause of all i suffer of all i plain the whole of my days in sorrow spent and in thought of him through the night i'm lain remembrance of him cheers my solitude while i lorn of his presence and lone remain would i knew it after this all my fate to oblige the desire of my heart will deign when her verses were ended she ascended to the terrace roof of the castle after donning her richest clothes and trinkets and throwing a necklace of jewels around her neck then binding together some dresses of balbac stuff by way of rope she tied them to the crenels and let herself down thereby to the ground and she fared on over wastes and waterless wilds till she came to the shore where she saw a fisherman plying here and there over the sea for the wind had driven him on to the island when he saw her he was affrighted and pushed off again flying from her but she cried out and made pressing signs to him to return versifying with these couplets o fisherman no care hast thou to fear i am but an earth-born maid in mortal sphere i pray thee linger and my prayer grant and to my true unhappy tale give ear pity so allah spare thee warmest love say hast thou seen him my beloved fair i love a lovely youth whose face excels sunlight and passes moon when clearest clear the fawn that sees his glance is fain to cry i am his thrall and own himself no peer beauty hath written on his winsome cheek rare lines of pregnant sense for every seer who sights the light of love his soul is saved who strays is infidel to hell anear and thou in mercy show his sight o rare thou shalt have every wish the dearest dear of rubies and what likest are to them fresh pearls and unions new the sea shall tear my friend thou wilt for sure grant my desire whose heart is melted in love's hottest fire when the fisherman heard her words he wept and made moan and lamented then recalling what had betided himself in the days of his youth when love had the master over him and longing and desire and distraction were sore upon him and the fires of passion consumed him replied with these couplets what fair excuse is this my pining plight with wasted limbs and tears unceasing blight and eyelids open in the nightly murk and heart like fire stick ready fire to smite indeed love burdened us in early youth and true from false coin soon we learned aright then did we sell our soul on way of love and drank of many a well to win her sight venturing very life to gain her grace and make high profit perilling a might tis love's religion whoso buys with life his lover's grace with highest gain is dight and when he ended his verse he moored his boat to the beach and said to her embark so i may carry thee whither thou wilt thereupon she embarked and he put off with her but they had not gone far from land before there came out a stern wind upon the boat and drove it swiftly out of sight of shore now the fisherman knew not whither he went and the strong wind blew without ceasing three days when it fell by leave of allah almighty and they sailed on and ceased not sailing till they came in sight of a city sitting upon the seashore 
and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and seventy-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the fisherman's craft carrying rose in hood made the city sitting upon the seashore, the man set about making fast to the land. Now the king of the city was a prince of Pith and Pusans, named Dirbas the Lion, and he chanced at that moment to be seated with his son at the window in the royal palace giving upon the sea, and happening to look out seawards, they saw the fishing boat make the land. They observed it narrowly, and espied therein a young lady, as she were the full moon overhanging the horizon edge with pendants in her ears of costly balas rubies and a collar of precious stones about her throat hereby the king knew that this must indeed be the daughter of some king or great noble and going forth of the sea-gate of the palace went down to the boat where he found the lady asleep and the fisherman busied in making fast to shore so he went up to her and aroused her whereupon she awoke weeping and he asked her whence comest thou and whose daughter art thou and what be the cause of thy coming hither and she answered i am the daughter of ibrahim wazir to king shamik and the manner of my coming hither is wondrous and the cause thereof marvellous and she told him her whole story first and last hiding naught from him then she groaned aloud and recited these couplets tear drops have chaffed mine eyelids and railed down in wondrous wise for parting pain that fills my sprite and turns to springs mine eyes for sake of friend who ever dwells within my vitals honed and i may never win my wish of him in any guise he hath the favour fair and bright and brilliant is his face which every turk and arab white in loveliness outvies the sun and fullest moon loud low whenas his charms they sight and lover-like they bend to him whenever he deigneth rise a wondrous spell of grammary like call bedecks his eyne and shows thee bow with shaft on string make ready ere it flies o thou to whom i told my case expecting all excuse pity a lover white for whom love shafts such fate devise verily love hath cast me on your coast despite of me a will now weak and fain i trust mine honour thou wilt prize for noble men when as perchance alight upon their bounds grace worthy guests confess their worth and raise to dignities then o thou hope of me to lovers folly veil afford and be to them reunion cause thou only leafest lord and when she had ended her verses she again told the king her sad tale and shed plenteous tears and recited these couplets bearing on her case we lived till saw we all the marvels love can bear each month to thee we hope shall fare as rajab fair is it not wondrous when i saw them march a morn that i with water o oh, eyes in heart lit flames that flare that these mine eyelids rain fast dropping goats of blood that now my cheek grows gold where rose and lily were as though the safflower you that overspread my cheeks were joseph's coat made stain of lying blood to wear now when the king heard her words he was certified of her love and longing and was moved to wrath for her so he said to her fear nothing and be not troubled thou hast come to the term of thy wishes for there is no help but that i win for thee thy will and bring thee to thy desire and he improvised these couplets daughter of nobles who thine aim shalt gain 
hear gladdest news nor fear aught hurt of bane this day i'll pack up wealth and send it on to shamik guarded by a champion train fresh pods of musk i'll send him and brocades and silver white and gold of yellow vein yes and a letter shall inform him eke that i of kinship with that king am fain and i this day will lend thee bestest aid that all thou covetest thy soul a sane i too have tasted love and know its taste and can excuse whoso the same cup drain then ending his verse he went forth to his troops and summoned his vazir and causing him to pack up countless treasure commanded him carry it to king shamik and say to him needs must thou send me a person named uns al wujud and say moreover the king is minded to ally himself with thee by marrying his daughter to uns al wujud thine officer so there is no help but thou dispatch him to me that the marriage may be solemnized in her father's kingdom and he wrote a letter to king shamik to this effect and gave it to the minister charging him strictly to bring back uns al wujud and warning him and thou fail thou shalt be deposed and degraded answered the wazir i hear and obey and setting out forthright with the treasures in due course arrived at the court of king shamik whom he saluted in the name of king dirbas and delivered the letter and the presents now when king shamik read the letter and saw the name of uns al wujud he burst into tears and said to the wazir and where or where is uns al wujud he went from us and we know not his place of abiding only bring him to me and i will give thee double the presents thou hast brought me and he wept and groaned and lamented saying these couplets to me restore my dear i want not wealth untold nor crave i gifts of pearls or gems or store of gold he was to us a moon in beauty's heavenly fold passing in form and soul with row compare with hold his form a will of wand his fruit lures manifold but will of lacketh power men's hearts to have and hold i reared him from a babe on cot of coaxing rolled and now i mourn for him with woe in soul and soul then turning to the wazir who had brought the presents and the missive he said go back to thy liege and acquaint him that uns al wujud hath been missing this year past and his lord knoweth not whither he is gone nor hath any tidings of him answered the minister of king dirbas o oh, my lord my master said to me and thou fail to bring him back thou shalt be degraded from the vacerate and shall not enter my city how then can i return without him so king shamik said to his wazir ibrahim take a company and go with him and make his search for uns al wujud everywhere he replied hearkening and obedience and taking a body of his own retainers set out accompanied by the wazir of king dirbas seeking uns al wujud and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and seventy ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ibrahim, wazir to King Shamik, took him a body of his retainers and, accompanied by the minister of King Dirbas, set out seeking Uns al Wujud. And as often as they fell in with wild Arabs, or others they asked of the youth saying tell us have you seen a man whose name is so and so and his semblance thus and thus but they all answered we know him not still they continued their quest inquiring in city and hamlet and seeking in fertile plain and stony hall and in the wild and in the wold till they made the mountain of the bereaved mother and the wazir of king dirbas said to ibrahim 
why is this mountain thus called he answered once of old time here sojourned a genii of the jinn of china who loved a mortal with passionate love and being in fear of her life from her own people searched all the earth over for a place where she might hide him from them till she happened on this mountain and finding it cut off from both men and jinn there being no access to it carried off her beloved and lodged him therein there when she could escape notice of her kith and kin she used privily to visit him and continued so doing till she had borne him a number of children and the merchants sailing by the mountain in their voyages over the main heard the weeping of the children as it were the wailing of a woman bereft of her babes and said is there here a mother bereaved of her children for which reason the place was named the mountain of the bereaved mother and the wazir of king dirbas marvelled at his words then they landed and making for the castle knocked at the gate which was opened to them by an eunuch who knew the wazir ibrahim and kissed his hands the minister entered and found in the courtyard among the serving men a fakir which was unsal wujud but he knew him not and said whence cometh yonder white quoth they he is a merchant who has lost his goods but saved himself and he is an ecstatic so the wazir left him and went on into the castle where he found no trace of his daughter and questioned her women who answered we wot not how or whither she went this place misliked her and she tarried in it but a short time whereupon he wept sore and repeated these couplets who thou the house whose birds were singing gay whose sills their wealth and pride were wont display till came the lover wailing for his love and found thy doors wide open to the way would heaven i knew where is my soul that erst was homed in house whose owners fared away twas stored with all things bright and beautiful and showed its porters ranged in fair array they clothed it with brocades a bride become would i knew whither went its lords ah say after ending his verses he again shed tears and groaned and bemoaned himself exclaiming there is no deliverance from the destiny decreed by allah nor is there any escape from that which he hath predestined then he went up to the roof and found the strips of balbac stuff tied to the crenels and hanging down to the ground and thus it was he knew that she had descended thence and had fled forth as one distracted and demented with desire and passion presently he turned and seeing there two birds a gore crow and an owl he justly deemed this an omen of ill so he groaned and recited these couplets i came to my dear friend's door of my hopes the goal whose sight mote assuage my sorrow and woes of soul no friends found i there nor was there another thing to find save a corby crow and an ill-omened owl and the tongue of the case to me seemed to say indeed this parting two lovers fond was cruel and foul so taste thou the sorrow thou madest them taste and live in grief when thy ways and now in thy sorrow prowl then he descended from the castle roof weeping and bade the servants fare forth and search the mound for their mistress so they sought for her but found her not such was their case but as regards unsal wujud when he was certified that rose in hood was indeed gone he cried with a great cry and fell down in a fainting fit nor came to himself for a long time whilst the folk deemed that his spirit had been withdrawn by the compassionating one and that he was absorbed in contemplation of the splendour majesty and beauty of the requiting one then despairing of finding uns al wujud and seeing that the wazir ibrahim was distracted for the loss of his daughter the minister of king dirbas addressed himself to return to his own country 
albeit he had not attained the object of his journey and while bidding his companion adieu said to him i have a mind to take the facker with me it may be allah almighty will incline the king's heart to me by his blessing for that he is a holy man and thereafter i will send him to his bahan which is near our country do as thou wilt answered ibrahim so they took leave of each other and departed each for his own motherland the wazir of king dirbas carrying with him uns al wujud and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and eightieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the wazir of king dirbas carried with him uns al wujud who was still insensible they bore him with them on mule-back he unknowing if he were carried or not for three days when he came to himself and said where am i thou art in company with the minister of king dirbas replied they and went and gave news of his recovering to the wazir who sent him rose-water and sherbet of sugar of which they gave him to drink and restored him then they ceased not faring on till they drew near king dirbas capital and the king being advised of his wazir's coming wrote to him saying if uns al wujud be not with thee come not to me ever now when the wazir read the royal mandate it was grievous to him for he knew not that rose in hood was with the king nor why he had been sent in quest of uns al wujud nor the king's reason for desiring the alliance whilst uns al wujud also knew not whither they were bearing him or that the wazir had been sent in quest of him nor did the wazir know that the fakir he had with him was uns al wujud himself and when the minister saw that the sick man was whole he said to him i was dispatched by the king on an errand which i have not been able to accomplish so when he heard of my return he wrote to me saying except thou have fulfilled my need enter not my city and what is the king's need asked uns al wujud so the wazir told him the whole tale and he said fear nothing but go boldly to the king and take me with thee and i will be surety to thee for the coming of uns al wujud at this the wazir rejoiced and cried is this true what thou sayest yes replied he whereupon the wazir mounted and carried him to king dirbas who after receiving their salutation said to him where is uns al wujud answered the young man o king i know where he is so the king called him to him and said where returned uns al wujud he is near hand and very near but tell me what thou wouldst with him and i will fetch him into thy presence the king replied with joy and good gree but the case calleth for privacy so he ordered the folk to withdraw and carrying uns al wujud into his cabinet told him the whole story whereupon quoth the youth robe me in rich raiment and i will forthright bring uns al wujud to thee so they brought him a sumptuous dress and he donned it and said i am uns al wujud the world's delight and to the envious a despite and presently he smote with his glances every sprite and began these couplets to recite my loved one's name in cheerless solitude a cheereth me and driveth me of my desperance and despondency i have no helper but my tears that ever flow in fount and as they flow they lighten woe and force my grief to flee my longing is so violent not like it e'er was seen my love tale is a marvel and my love a sight to see i spend the night with lids of eye that never close in sleep and pass in passion twixt the hells of eden's heavenly i had of patience fairish store but now no more have i and love's sole gift to me hath been i growing misery 
my frame is wasted by the pain of parting from my own and longing changed my shape and form and made me other be mine eyelids by my torrent tears are chaffed and ulcerate the tears whose flow to stay is mere impossibility my manly strength is sore impaired for i have lost my heart how many griefs upon my griefs have i been doomed to dree my heart and head are like in age with similar hoariness by loss of beauty's lord of lords the galaxy despite our wills they parted us and doomed us parted won while they our lords desire no more than love in unity then ah would heaven that i wot if stress of parting done the world will grant me sight of them in union fain and free roll up the scroll of severance which others would unroll efface my trouble by the grace of meeting's jubilee and shall i see them home with me in cup company and change my melancholic mood for joy and jollity and when he had ended his verses the king cried aloud by allah ye are indeed a pair of lovers true and fain and in beauty's heaven of shining stars at twain your story is wondrous and your case marvellous then he told him all that had befalled rose in hood and uns al wujud said where is she o king of the age she is with me now answered dirbas and sending for the kazi and the witnesses drew up the contract of marriage between her and him then he honoured uns al wujud with favours and bounties and sent to king shamik acquainting him with what had befallen whereat this king joyed with exceeding joy and wrote back the following purport since the ceremony of contract hath been performed at thy court it behoveth that the marriage and its consummation be at mine then he made ready camels horses and men and sent them in quest of the pair and when the embassy reached king dirbas he gave the lovers much treasure and dispatched them to king shamik's court with a company of his own troops the day of their arrival was a notable day never was seen a grander for the king gathered together all the singing women and players of instruments of music and made wedding banquets and held high festival seven days and on each day he gave largesse to the folk and bestowed on them sumptuous robes of honour then uns al wujud went in to rose in hood and they embraced and sat weeping for excess of joy and gladness whilst she recited these couplets joyance is come dispelling cark and care we are united enviers may despair the breeze of union blow in quickening forms hearts and vitals fresh with fragrant air the splendour of delight with sense appears and round us flags and drums show gladness rare deem not we're weeping for our stress of grief it is for joy our tears as torrents fare how many fears we've seen that now are past and bore we patient what was sore to bear one hour of joyance made us both forget what from excess of terror grayed our hair and when the verses were ended they again embraced and ceased not from their embrace till they fell down in a swoon and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section six read by lars rolander Section 7, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 7. 381st Night to 384th Night. When it was the three hundred and eighty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Uns al Wujud and Rosinhood embraced when they foregathered and ceased not from their embrace till they fell down in a swoon for the delight of reunion. And when they came to themselves, Uns al Wujud recited these couplets How joyously sweet are the nights that unite when my darling danes keep me the troth she did plight when union conjoins us in all that we have and parting is severed and sundered from sight to us comes the world with her favour so fair out of frown and aversion and might despite hath planted her banner good fortune for us and we drink of her cup in the purest delight we have met and complained of the pitiful past, and of nights a full many that doomed us to blight. But now, O oh, my lady, the past is forgot, the compassionate pardon the past for unright. How sweet is existence, how glad is to be, this union my passion doth only incite and when he ended his verses they once more embraced drowned in the sea of passion and lay down together in the private apartment carousing and conversing and quoting verses and telling pleasant tales and anecdotes on this wise seven days passed over them whilst they knew not night from day and it was to them for very stress of gaiety and gladness pleasure and possession as if the seven days were but one day with never a morrow nor did they know the seventh day but by the coming of the singers and players on instruments of music whereat rose in hood beyond measure wondered and improvised these couplets in spite of envious jealousy at end we have won all we hoped of the friend We've crowned our meeting with a close embrace, On quilts where new brocades with sandal blend, On bed of perfumed leather, which the spoils Of downy birds luxuriously distend. But I abstain me from unneeded wine, When honeyed use of lips sweet musk can lend. Now from the sweets of union we unknow, Time near and far, if slow or fast it wend the seventh night hath come and gone o oh, strange how went the nights we never recked or kenned till on the seventh wishing joy they said allah prolong the meet of friend with friend when she had finished her song uns al wujud kissed her more than a hundred times and recited these couplets o oh, day of joys to either lover fain the loved one came and freed from lonely pain she blessed me with all inner charms she hath and companied with inner grace deep lain she made me drain the wine of love till i was faint with joys her love had made me drain we toyed and joyed and on each other lay then fell to wine and soft melodious strain and for excess of joyance never knew how went the day and how it came again fair fall each lover may he union win and gain of joy like me the amplest gain nor weet the taste of severance bitter fruit and joys assain them as they us assain then they went forth and distributed to the folk arms and presents of money and raiment and rare gifts and other tokens of generosity after which rose in hood bade clear the bath for her and turning to uns al wujud said to him o coolth of my eyes i have a mind to see thee in the hammam 
and therein we will be alone together he joyfully consented to this and she let send the hammam with all sorts of perfumed woods and essences and light the wax candle then of the excess of her contentment she recited these couplets oh who didst win my love in other date and present dear must speak of past estate and oh who art my soul's sufficiency nor want i other friends with me to mate come to the hammam o my light of eyes and enter eden through Jehenna gate we'll send with ambergris and aloes wood till float the heavy clouds with fragrant freight and to the world will pardon all her sins and sue for mercy the compassionate and i will cry when i descry thee there good cheer sweet love all blessings on thee wait whereupon they arose and fared to the bath and took their pleasure therein after which they returned to their palace and there abode in the fullness of enjoyment till there came to them the destroyer of delights and the sunderer of societies and glory be to him who changes not neither ceaseth and to whom everything returneth and they also tell a tale of abu nowas with the three boys and the caliph harun al rashid abu nowas one day shut himself up and making ready a richly furnished feast collected for it meats of all kinds and of every colour that lips and tongue can desire then he went forth to seek a minion worthy of such entertainment saying allah my lord and my master i beseech thee to send me one who befitteth this banquet and who is fit to carouse with me this day hardly had he made an end of speaking when he espied three youths handsome and beardless as they were of the boys of paradise differing in complexion but fellows in in incomparable beauty and all hearts yearned with desire to the swaying of their bending shapes even to what saith the poet i passed a beardless pair without compare and cried i love you both you fairly fair moneyed quoth one quoth i and lavish too then said the fair pair Pere, se notre affaire. Now Abu Nowas was given to these joys, and loved to sport and make merry with fair boys, and cull the rose from every brightly blooming cheek, even as saith the bard. Full many a reverend shake feels sting of flesh, love's pretty faces shows at pleasure's depot, awakes in Mosul land of purity and all the day dreams only of aleppo so he accosted them with a salutation and they returned his greeting with civility and all honour and would have gone their several ways but he stayed them repeating these couplets steer ye your steps to none but me who hath a mine of luxury old wine that shines with brightest blee made by the monk in monastery and mutton meat the toothsomest and birds of all variety then eat of these and drink of those old wines that bring you jollity and have each other turn by turn shampooing this my tool you see thereupon the youths were beguiled by his verses and consented to his wishes and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and eighty-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when abu nowas beguiled the youth with his wishes saying we hear and obey and accompanied him to his lodging where they found all ready that he had set forth in his couplets they sat down and ate and drank and made merry a while after which they appealed to abu nowas to decide which of them was handsomest of face and shapeliest of form 
so he pointed to one of them and having kissed him twice over recited the following verses i'll ransom that beauty spot with my soup where is it and where is a money dole praise him who hairless hath made that cheek and bid beauty bide in that mole that mole then he pointed to another and kissing his lips repeated these couplets and loveling weareth on his cheek a mole like musk which virgin camphor never lets off it my peepers marvel such a contrast seeing and cried the mole to me now bless the prophet then he pointed to the third and after kissing him half a score times repeated these couplets melted pure gold in silvern bowl to drain the youth whose fingers wore a winey stain he with the drawer served one cup of wine and served his wandering eyes the other twain a loveling of the sons of turks a fawn whose waist conjoins the double mounts honine could eve's corrupting daughters tempt my heart content with twofold lure twould bear the bane unto diar i bakr made land this one lures that lures two mosque cities of the plain now each of the youths had drunk two cups and when it came to the turn of abu novas he took the goblet and repeated these couplets drink not strong wine save at the slender dearling's hand each like to other in all gifts the spirit grace for wine can never gladden tooper's heart and soul unless the cup boy show a bright and sparkling face then he drank off his cup and the bowl went round and when it came to abenovas again joyance got the mastery of him and he repeated these couplets for cup friends cup succeeding cup a sign brimming with grape juice brought in endless line by hand of brown lip beauty who is sweet at wake as apple or musk finest fine drink not the wine except from hand of fawn whose cheek to kiss is sweeter than the wine presently the drink got into his noddle drunkenness mastered him and he knew not hand from head so that he lolled from side to side in joy and inclined to the used one and all anon kissing them and anon embracing them leg over lying leg and he showed no sense of sin or shame but recited these couplets none wotteth best joyance but generous youth when the pretty ones deign with him company keep this sings to him sings to him that when he wants a pick-me-up lying there all of a heap and when of a loveling he needeth a kiss he takes from his lips or a draught or a nip heaven bless them how sweetly my day with them sped a wonderful harvest of pleasure i reap let us drink our good liquor both watered and pure and agree to swive all who dare slumber and sleep while they were in this deboshed state behold there came a knocking at the door so they bade him who knocked enter and behold it was the commander of the faithful harun al rashid when they saw him they all rose and kissed ground before him and abu novas threw off the fumes of the wine for awe of the caliph who said to him holla abu novas he replied adsum at thy service o commander of the faithful whom allah preserve the caliph asked what state is this and the poet answered o prince of true believers my state indubitably dispenseth with questions quoth the caliph o abu novas i have sought direction of allah almighty and have appointed the kazi of pimps and panders asked he dost thou indeed invest me with that high office o commander of the faithful and the caliph answered i do whereupon abu novas rejoined o commander of the faithful 
hast thou any suit to prefer to me hereat the caliph was wroth and presently turned away and left them full of rage and passed the night sore and angered against abu nowas who amid the party he had invited spent the merriest of nights and the jolliest and the joyousest and when day break dawned and the star of morn appeared it sheen and shone he broke up the sitting and dismissing the youth donned his court dress and leaving his house set out for the palace of the caliph now it was the custom of the commander of the faithful when the divan broke up to withdraw to his sitting saloon and summon thither his poets and cup companions and musicians each having his own place which he might not overpass so it happened that day he retired to his saloon and the friends and familiars came and seated themselves each in his rank and degree presently in walked abu nowas and was about to take his usual seat when the caliph cried to masrur the sworder and bade him strip the poet of his clothes and bind an ass's pack saddle on his back and a halter about his head and a crupper under his rump and lead him round to all the lodgings of the slave girls and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and eighty-third night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the caliph commanded masrur the sworder to strip abu nowas of his court suit and bind an asp's pack saddle on his back and a halter about his head and a crupper under his rump and lead him round to all the lodgings of the slave girls and the chambers of the harem that the women might make mock of him then cut off his head and bring it to him hearkening and obedience replied masrur and doing with abu nowas as the caliph had bidden him led him round all the chambers whose number equalled the days of the year but abu nowas was a funny fellow so he made all the girls laugh with his buffooneries and each gave him something whereby he returned not say with a pocketful of money and while this was going on behold jaafar the barmecide who had been absent on an important business for the commander of the faithful entered and recognizing the poet albeit in his plight said to him holla abu nowas he said here at thy service o our lord jaafar asked what offence hast thou committed to bring this punishment on thee thereupon he answered none whatsoever except that i made our lord the caliph a present of the best of my poetry and he presented me in return with the best of his raiment when the prince of true believers heard this he laughed from a heart full of wrath and pardoned abu nowas and also gave him a myriad of money and they also recount the tale of abdallah bin ma'amar with the man of bassorah and his slave girl a certain man of bassorah once bought a slave girl and reared and educated her right well moreover he loved her very dearly and spent all his substance in pleasuring and merrymaking with her till he had not left and extreme poverty was sore upon him so she said to him o oh, my master sell me for thou needest my price and it maketh my heart ache to see thy sorry and wantful plight if thou vend me and make use of my value twill be better for thee than keeping me by thee and haply almighty allah will ample thee and amend thy fortune he agreed to this for the straightness of his case and carried her to the bazaar where the broker offered her for sale to the governor of bassorah by name abdallah bin ma'amar al taimi and she pleased him so he bought her for five hundred dinars and paid the sum to her master but when he took the money and was about to go away the girl burst into tears and repeated these two couplets may coins thou gainst joy in heart instil for me remaineth naught save saddest ill 
i say unto my soul which sorely grieves thy friend departeth and thou will nor nil and when her master heard this he groaned and replied in these couplets albeit this thy case lack all resource nor findeth aught but death's doom pardon still evening and morning thoughts of thee will dole comfort to heart all woes and griefs fulfil peace be upon thee meet we now no more nor pair except at even ma'amar's will now when abdullah bin ma'amar heard these verses and saw their affection he exclaimed by allah i will not assist fate in separating you for it is evident to me that ye two indeed love each other so take the money and the damsel o man and allah bless thee in both for verily parting be grievous to lovers so they kissed his hand and going away ceased not to dwell together till death did them part and glory be to him whom death overtaketh not and among stories is that of the lovers of the banu osra there was once among the banu osra a handsome and accomplished man who was never a single day out of love and it chanced that he became enamoured of a beauty of his own tribe and sent her many messages but she ceased not to entreat him with cruelty and disdain till for stress of love and longing and desire and distraction he fell sick of a sore sickness and took to his pillow and murdered sleep his malady redoubled on him and his torments increased and he was well nigh dead when his case became known among the folk and his passion notorious and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and eighty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the man took to his pillow, and murdered sleep. So his case became known, and his passion notorious, and his infirmity grew upon him, and his pains redoubled until he was well nigh dead his family and hers were urgent with her to visit him but she refused till he was at the point of death when being told of this she relented towards him and vouchsafed him a visit as soon as he saw her his eyes ran over with tears and he repeated from a broken heart and by the life passed thee my funeral train a bier upborne upon the necks of four wilt thou not follow it and greet the grave where shall my corpse be graved for evermore hearing this she wept with sore weeping and said to him by allah i suspected not that passion had come to such a pass with thee as to cast thee into the arms of death had i wist of this i had been favourable to thy wish and thou shouldst have had thy will at this his tears streamed down even as the clouds rail rain and he repeated this verse she drew near when as death was departing us and deigned union grant when twas useless all then he groaned one groan and died so she fell on him kissing him and weeping and ceased not weeping until she swooned away and when she came to herself she charged her people to bury her in his grave and with streaming eyes recited these two couplets we lived on earth a life of fair content and tribe and house and home of us were proud but time in whirling flight departed us to join us now in womb of earth and shroud then she fell again to weeping nor gave over shedding tears and lamenting till she fainted away and she lay three days senseless then she died and was buried in his grave this is one of the strange chances of love 
and I have heard related a tale of the Wazir of al jaman and his young brother. It is said that Badr al-Din, Wazir of al jaman had a young brother of singular beauty, and kept straight watch over him. So he applied himself to seek a tutor for him, and coming upon a sheikh of dignified and reverend aspect, chaste and religious, lodged him in a house next his own. This lasted a long time, and he used to come daily from his dwelling to that of Sahib Badr al-Din, and teach the young brother. After a while the old man's heart was taken with love for the youth, and longing grew upon him, and his vitals were troubled, till one day he bemoaned his case to the boy, who said, What can I do, seeing that I may not leave my brother night or day? and thou thyself seest how careful he is over me quoth the sheikh my lodging adjoineth thine so there will be no difficulty when thy brother sleepeth to rise and entering the privy feign thyself asleep then come to the parapet of the terrace roof and i will receive thee on the other side of the wall so shalt thou sit with me an eye twinkling and return without thy brother's knowledge i hear and obey answered the lad and the tutor began to prepare gifts suitable to his degree now when a while of the night was past he entered the water closet and waited until his brother lay down on his bed and took patience till he was drowned in sleep when he rose and going to the parapet of the terrace roof found standing there to await him the old man, who gave him his hand, and carried him to the sitting-chamber, where he had made ready various dainties for his entertainment, and they sat down to carouse. Now it was the night of the full moon, and as they sat with the wine-cup going round, her rays shone upon them, and the governor fell to singing but whilst they were thus in joy and jollity and mirth and merriment such as confoundeth the wit and the sight and defieth description lo the wazir awoke and missing his brother arose in a fright and found the door open so he went up to the roof and hearing a noise of talk climbed over the parapet to the adjoining terrace and saw a light shining from the lodging he looked in from behind the wall, and espied his brother and his tutor sitting at carouse. But the sheikh became aware of him, and sang, cup in hand, to a lively measure, these couplets. He made me drain his wine of honeyed lips, toasting with cheeks, which rose and myrtle smother, then knighted in embrace cheek to my cheek, a loveling midst mankind without another when the full moon arose on us and shone pray she traduce us not to the big brother and it proved the perfect politeness of the wazir badr al-din that when he heard this he said by allah i will not betray you and he went away and left them to their diversions they also tell a tale concerning the loves of the boy and girl at school a free boy and a slave girl once learned together in school and the boy fell passionately in love with the girl and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 7 read by lars rolander Section 8, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 8. Three hundred and eighty fifth night to three hundred and eighty eighth night. When it was the three hundred and eighty fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, 
that the lad fell passionately in love with the slave lass so one day when the other boys were heedless he took her tablet and wrote on it these two couplets what sayst thou of him by sickness waste until he's clean distraught for love of thee who in the transport of his pain complains nor can bear load of heart in secrecy now when the girl took her tablet she read the verses written thereon and understanding them wept for wrath of him then she wrote thereunder these two couplets and if we behold a lover love for don desiring us our favours he shall see yea what he wills of us he shall obtain and so befall us what befalling be now it chanced that the teacher came in on them and taking the tablet unnoticed read what was written thereon so he was moved to pity of their case and wrote on the tablet beneath those already written these two couplets addressed to the girl console thy lover fear no consequence he is daft with loving lows insanity but for the teacher fear not aught from him love pained he learnt long before learnt ye presently it so happened that the girl's owner entered the school about the same time and finding the tablet read the above verses indited by the boy the girl and the schoolmaster and wrote under them these two couplets may allah never make you parting dree and be your censurer shamed wearily but for the teacher never by allah i of mine beheld a bigger pimp than he then he sent for the kazi and witnesses and married them on the spot moreover he made them a wedding feast and treated them with exceeding munificence and they ceased not abiding together in joy and happiness till there came to them the destroyer of delights and the severer of societies and equally pleasant is the story of al mutalamis and his wife umaima it is related al mutalamis once fled from al nu'uman bin munsir and was absent so long that folk deemed him dead now he had a beautiful wife umaima by name and her family urged her to marry again but she refused for that she loved her husband al mutalamis very dearly however they were urgent with her because of the multitude of her suitors and importuned with her till at last she consented all be reluctantly and they espoused her to a man of her own tribe now on the night of the wedding al mutalamis came back and hearing in the camp a noise of pipes and tabrets and seeing signs of a wedding festival asked some of the children what was the merrymaking to which they replied they have married umaima wife of al mutalamis to such an one and he goes in to her this night when he heard this he planned to enter the house amongst the mob of women and saw the twain seated on the bridal couch by and by the bridegroom came up to her whereupon she sighed heavily and weeping recited this couplet would heaven i knew but many are the shifts of joy and woe in what far distant land thou art my mutalamis o now al mutalamis was a renowned poet so he answered her saying right near at hand o my mine whenever the caravan halted i never ceased for thee to pine i would thou know when the bridegroom heard this he guessed how the case stood and went forth from them in haste improvising i was in bestest luck but now my luck goes contrary a hospitable house and room contain your loves you too and he returned not but left the twain to their privacy so al mutalamis and his wife abode together in all comfort and solace of life 
and in all its joys and jollities, till death parted them. And glory be to him at whose command the earth and the heavens shall arise. And among other tales is that of the Caliph Harun al Rashid and Queen Subaida in the bath. The Caliph Harun al Rashid loved the Lady Subaida with exceeding love, and laid out for her a pleasance wherein he made a great tank, and set thereabouts a screen of trees, and led thither water from all sides. Hence the trees grew and interlaced over the basin so densely that one could go in and wash without being seen of any for the thickness of the leafage. It chanced one day that Queen Subaida entered the garden, and coming to the swimming bath, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and eighty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Queen Subaida entered the garden one day, and, coming to the swimming bath, gazed upon its goodliness and the sheen of the water and the overshading of the trees pleased her now it was a day of exceeding heat so she doffed her clothes and entering the tank which was not deep enough to cover the whole person fell to pouring the water over herself from an ewer of silver it also happened that the caliph heard she was in the pool so he left his palace and came down to spy upon her through the screen of the foliage he stood behind the trees and espied her mother nude, showing everything that is kept hidden. Presently she became aware of him, and turning saw him behind the trees, and was ashamed that he should see her naked. So she laid her hands on her parts, but the mount of Venus escaped from between them, by reason of its greatness and plumpness, and the caliph at once turned and went away wondering and reciting this couplet i looked on her with loving eyn and grew anew my old repine but he knew not what to say next so he sent for abu Novas and said to him make me a piece of verse commencing with this line i hear and obey replied the poet and in an eye twinkling extemporized these couplets I looked on her with longing eyne, and grew anew my old repine, for the gazelle who captured me, where the two lotus trees incline, there was the water poured on it from ewer of the sylvan mine, and seen me she had hidden it, but was too plump for fingers fine. Would heaven that I were on it, an hour or better two hours line. Thereupon the commander of the faithful smiled, and made him a handsome present, and he went away rejoicing. And I have heard another story of Harun al-Rashid and the three poets. The prince of true believers, Caliph Harun al-Rashid, was exceeding restless one night. So he rose and walked about his palace, till he happened upon a handmaid overcome with wine. Now he was prodigiously enamoured of this damsel, so he played with her, and pulled her to him, whereupon her soul fell down, and her petticoat trousers were loosed, and he besought her of amorous favour. But she said to him, O commander of the faithful, wait till to-morrow night, for I am unprepared for thee, knowing not thy coming. So he left her, and went away. But when the morrow showed its light, and the sun shone bright, he sent a page to her, saying, The commander of the faithful is about to visit thine apartment. But she replied, Day doth away with the promise of night. So he said to his courtiers, Make me somewhat of verse introducing these words. The promise of night is effaced by day. Answered they, We hear and obey and al-rakashi came forward and recited the following couplets by allah couldst thou but feel my pain thy rest had turned and had fled away 
hath left me in sorrow and love distraught unseen and unseeing that fairest may she promised me grace then jilted and said the promise of night is effaced by day then abu musab came forward and recited these couplets when wilt thou be wise and love heat allay that from food and sleeping so leads astray suffices thee not ever weeping eye and vitals on fire when thy name they say he must smile and laugh and in pride must cry the promise of night is effaced by day last came abu Novas and recited the following couplets as love waxed longer less met we tway and fell out but ended the youthless fray one night in the palace i found her foe yet of modesty still there was some display the veil from her shoulders had slipped and showed her loosened trousers love's seat and stay and rattled the breezes her huge hind cheeks and the branch where two little pomegranates lay quoth i give me tryst where to quoth she to-morrow the fane shall wear best array next day i asked her thy word said she the promise of night is effaced by day the caliph bade give a myriad of money each to al rakashi and abu musab but bade strike off the head of abu novas saying thou wast with us yesternight in the palace said he by allah i slept not but in my own house i was directed to what i said by thine own words as to the subject of the verse and indeed quoth almighty allah and he is the truest of all speakers as for poets devils pursue them dost thou not see that they rove as bereft of their senses through every valley and that they say that which they do not so the caliph forgave him and gave him two myriads of money and another tale is that of musab bin al subair and aisha his wife it is told of musab bin al subair that he met in al medina isa who was one of the shrewdest of women and said to her i have a mind to marry aisha daughter of talha and i should like thee to go herewards and spy out for me how she is made so she went away and returning to musab said i have seen her and her face is fairer than health she has large and well-opened eyes and under them a nose straight and smooth as a cane oval cheeks and a mouth like a cleft pomegranate a neck as a silver ewer and below it a bosom with two breasts like twin pomegranates and further down a slim waist and a slender stomach with a navel therein as it were a casket of ivory and back parts like a hummock of sand and plumpy rounded thighs and calves like columns of alabaster but i saw her feet to be large and thou wilt fall short with her in time of need upon this report he married her and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and eighty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Issa this wise reported of Aisha bin Tala, Musab married her, and went in to her. And presently Issa invited Aisha and the women of the tribe, Kuryash, to her house, when Aisha sang these two couplets, with Musab standing by and the lips of girls that are perfume sweet so nice to kiss when with smiles they greet yet never tasted i them but in thought of him and by thought the ruler rules worldly seat the night of musab's going in unto her he departed not from her till after seven bouts 
and on the morrow a free woman of his met him and said to him may i be thy sacrifice thou art perfect even in this and a certain woman said i was with aisha when her husband came in to her and she lusted for him so he fell upon her and she snarked and snorted and made use of all wonder of movements and marvellous new inventions and i the while within hearing so when he came out from her i said to her how canst thou do thus with thy rank and nobility and condition and i in thy house quoth she verily a woman should bring her husband all of which she is mistress by way of excitement and rare buckings and wrigglings and motivations what dislikes thou of this and i answered i would have this by nights rejoined she thus is it by day and by night i do more than this for when he seeth me desire stirreth him up and he falleth in heat so he putteth it out to me and i obey him and it is as thou seest and there also hath reached me an account of abu al aswad and his slave girl abu al aswad bought a native-born slave girl who was blind of an eye and she pleased him but his people decried her to him whereat he wondered and turning the palms of his hands upwards recited these two couplets they find me fault with her where i default never find save haply that a speck in either eye may show but if her eyes have fault a fault her form hath none slim built above the waist and heavily made below and this is also told of harun al rashid and the two slave girls the caliph harun al rashid lay one night between two slave girls one from al medina and the other from kufa and the kufite rubbed his hands whilst the medinite rubbed his feet and made his concern stand up quoth the kufite i see thou wouldst keep the whole of the stock in trade to thyself give me my share of it and the other answered i have been told by malik on the authority of hisham ibn orva who had it of his grandfather that the prophet said whoso quickeneth the dead the dead belongeth to him and is his but the kufite took her unawares and pushing her away seized it all in her own hand and said al aamasha telleth us on the authority of kaisama who had it of abdallah bin masud that the prophet declared game belongeth to him who taketh it not to him who raiseth it and this is also related of the caliph harun al rashid and the three slave girls the caliph harun al rashid once slept with three slave girls a meccan a medinite and an irakite the medina girl put her hand to his yard and handled it whereupon it rose and the meccan sprang up and drew it to herself quoth the other what is this unjust aggression a tradition was related to me by malik after al suri after abdallah ibn salim after said bin said that the apostle of allah whom allah bless and keep said whoso enquickeneth a dead land it is his and the meccan answered it is related to us by sufyan from abu sanad from al aarai from abu horiaira that the apostle of allah said the quarry is his who catcheth it not his who starteth it but the iraq girl pushed them both away and taking it to herself said this is mine till your contention be decided and they tell a tale of the miller and his wife there was a miller who had an ass to turn his mill 
and he was married to a wicked wife whom he loved while she hated him because she was sweet upon a neighbor who misliked her and held aloof from her one night the miller saw in his sleep one who said to him dig in such a spot of the asses round in the mill and thou shalt find a hoard when he awoke he told his wife the vision and bade her keep the secret but she told her neighbor and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and eighty-eighth night she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the miller's wife told the secret to the neighbor whom she loved, thinking to win his favor, and he agreed with her to come to her by night. So he came, and they dug in the mill, and found the treasure, and took it forth. Then he asked her, How shall we do with this? And she answered, We will divide it into two halves and will share it equally between us and do thou leave thy wife and i will cast about to rid me of my husband then shalt thou marry me and when we are conjoined we will join the two halves of the treasure one to other and all will be in our hands quoth he i fear lest satan seduce thee and thou take some other man other than myself for gold in the house is like the sun in the world. I reck, therefore, it were right that the money be all in my hands, so thou give thy whole mind to getting free of thy husband and coming to me. Quoth she, I fear even as thou fearest, nor will I yield up my part to thee, for it was I directed thee to it. When he heard this, greed of gain prompted him to kill her so he slew her and threw her body into the empty hoard hole but day overtook him and hindered him from covering it up he therefore took the money and went his way now after a while the miller awoke and missing his wife went into the mill where he fastened the ass to the beam and shouted to it it went on a little then stopped whereupon he beat it grievously but the more he bashed it the more it drew back for it was affrighted at the dead woman and could not go forward thereupon the miller unknowing what hindered the donkey took out a knife and goaded it again and again but still it would not budge then he was wroth with it knowing not the cause of its obstinacy and drove the knife into its flanks and it fell down dead but when the sun rose he saw his donkey lying dead and likewise his wife in the place of the treasure and great was his rage and sore his wrath for the loss of his hoard and the death of his wife and his ass all this came of his letting his wife into his secret and not keeping it to himself and i have heard this tale of the simpleton and the sharper a certain simpleton was once walking along hauling his ass after him by the halter when a pair of sharpers saw him and one said to his fellow i will take that ass from yonder wight asked the other how wilt thou do that follow me and i will show thee how answered the first so the coney catcher went up to the ass and loosing it from the halter gave the beast to his fellow then he halted his own head and followed tom fool till he knew the other had got clean off with the ass when he stood still the oaf hailed at the halter but the rascal stirred not so he turned and seeing the halter on a man's neck said to him what art thou quoth the sharper i am thine ass and my story is a wondrous one and tis this know that i have a pious old mother and come in to her one day drunk and she said to me o oh, my son repent to the almighty of these thy transgressions but i took my staff and beat her whereupon she cursed me and allah changed me into an ass and caused me fall into thy hands where i have remained till this moment however to-day my mother called me to mind 
and her heart yearned towards me so she prayed for me and the lord restored me to my former shape amongst the sons of adam cried the silly one there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great allah upon thee o my brother acquit me of what i have done with thee in the way of riding and so forth then he let the coney catcher go and returned home drunken with chagrin and concern as with wine his wife asked him what aileth thee and where is the donkey and he answered thou knowest not what was this ass but i will tell thee so he told her the story and she exclaimed alack and alas for the punishment we shall receive from almighty allah how could we have used a man as a beast of burden all this while and she gave alms by way of atonement and prayed pardon of heaven then the man abode a while at home idle and feckless till she said to him how long wilt thou sit at home doing not go to the market and buy us an ass and ply thy work with it accordingly he went to the market and stopped by the ass-stand where behold he saw his own ass for sale so he went up to it and clapping his mouth to its ear said to it woe to thee thou never do well doubtless thou hast been getting drunk again and beating thy mother but by allah i will never buy thee more and he left it and went away and they tell a tale concerning the Kasi Abu Yusuf with Harun al-Rashid and Queen Zubaydah. The Caliph Harun al-Rashid went up one noontide to his couch, to lie down, and mounting, found upon the bedcloths semen freshly emitted, whereat he was startled and troubled with sore trouble. So he called the Lady Zubaydah, and said to her, What is that spilt on the bed? she looked at it and replied o commander of the faithful it is semen quoth he tell me truly what this meaneth or i will lay violent hands on thee forthright quoth she by allah o commander of the faithful indeed i know not how it came there and i am guiltless of that whereof you suspectest me so he sent for the kazi abu yusuf and acquainted him of the case the judge raised his eyes to the ceiling and seeing a crack therein said to the caliph o commander of the faithful in very sooth the bat hath seed like that of a man and this is bat semen then he called for a spear and thrust it into the crevice whereupon down fell the bat in this manner the caliph's suspicions were dispelled and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section eight. Read by Lars Rolander. Section nine, volume five of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maury Cunin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 9. When it was the three hundred and eighty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Kazi Abu Yusuf took the spear and thrust it into the crevice, down fell the bat, and thus the caliph's suspicions were dispelled, and the innocence of Zubaydah was made manifest. Whereat she gave loud and liberal vent to her joy, and promised Abi Yusuf a magnificent reward. Now there were with her certain delicious fruits, out of their season, and she knew of others in the garden. So she asked Abi Yusuf, O Imam of the Faith, which wouldst thou rather have of the two kinds of fruit, those that are here, or those that are not here. And he answered, Our code forbiddeth us to pronounce judgment on the absent. When as they are present, we will give our decision. So she let bring the two kinds of fruit before him, and he ate of both. 
Quoth she, What is the difference between them? And quoth he, As often as I think to praise one kind, the adversary putteth in the claim. The caliph laughed at his answer, and made him a rich present. And Zubaida also gave him what she had promised him, and he went away rejoicing. See then, the virtues of this imam, and how his hands were manifest the truth, and the innocence of the lady Zubaida. And amongst other stories is that of the Caliph al-Hakim and the merchant. The Caliph al-Hakim bi Amrullah was riding out in state procession one day when he passed along a garden wherein he saw a man surrounded by negro slaves and eunuchs. He asked him for a draught of water, and the man gave him to drink, saying, Belike, the commander of the faithful will honor me by alighting in this my garden. So the caliph dismounted, and with his suite entered the garden, whereupon the said man brought out to them a hundred rugs, and a hundred leather mats, and a hundred cushions, and set before them a hundred dishes of fruits, and a hundred bowls of sweetmeats, and a hundred jars of sugared sherbets, at which the caliph marveled with much amaze, and said to his host, O man, verily this thy case is wondrous. Didst thou know of our coming, and make preparation for us? He replied, No, by Allah, O commander of the faithful. I knew not of thy coming, and I am a merchant of the rest of thy subjects. But I have a hundred concubines. So, when the commander of the faithful honored me by alighting with me, I sent to each of them, bidding her send me her morning meal in the garden. So they sent me each of her furniture and the surplus of her meat and drink. And every day each sendeth me a dish of meat, and another of cooling marinades, and also a platter of fruits, and a bowl of sweetmeats, and a jar of sherbet. This is my noonday dinner, nor have I added aught thereto for thee. Then the commander of the faithful, Al-Hakim bi Amrullah, prostrated himself in thanksgiving to the Almighty, extolled and exalted be his name, and said, Praise be Allah, who hath been so bountiful to one of our lieges, that when he entertaineth the caliph and his host without making ready for them, nay, he feedeth them with the surplusage of his day's provision. Then he sent for all the dirhams in the treasury that had been struck that year, and they were in number three thousand and seven hundred thousand. Nor did he mount until the money came, when he gave it to the merchant, saying, Use this as thy state may require, and thy generosity deserveth more than this. Then he took his horse and rode away. And I have heard a story concerning King Kisra Anushirwan and the village damsel. The just king, Kisra Anushirwan, one day rode forth to the chase, and in pursuit of a deer became separated from his suite. Presently he caught sight of a hamlet near hand, and being sore athirst, he made for it, and presenting himself at the door of a house that lay by the wayside, asked for a draught of water. So a damsel came out and looked at him, then, going back into the house, pressed the juice from a single sugar cane into a bowl and mixed it with water, after which she strewed on the top some scented stuff, as it were dust, and carried it to the king. Thereupon he, seeing in it what resembled dust, drank it little by little, till he came to the end. And when he said to her, O damsel, the drink is good, and how sweet it has been, but for the dust in it that troubleth it. Answered she, O guest, I put in that powder for a purpose. And he asked, Why didst thou thus? So she replied, I saw thee exceedingly thirsty, and feared that thou wouldst drain the whole at one draught, and that this would thee mischief. And but for this dust that troubled the drink, so hadst thou done. The king wondered at her words, knowing that they came of her wit and good sense, and said to her, From how many sugar canes didst thou express this draught? One, answered she, whereat Anushirwan marveled, and calling for the register of the village taxes, saw that its assessment was but little, and bethought him to increase it on his return to his palace, saying in himself, A village where they get this much juice out of one sugar cane, why is it so lightly taxed? He then left the village and pursued his chase, 
And as he came back at the end of the day, he passed alone by the same door, and calling again for drink. Whereupon the same damsel came out, and knowing him at a look, went in to fetch him water. It was some time before she returned, and Anushirwan wondered thereat, and said to her, Why hast thou tarried? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninetieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Anushirwan hurried the damsel and asked her, Why hast thou tarried? She answered, Because a single sugar cane gave not enough for thy need, so I pressed three, but they yielded not so much as one did before. Rejoined he, What is the cause of that? And she replied, The cause of it is that when the sultan's mind is changed against a folk, their prosperity ceaseth, and their good waxeth less. So Anushirwan laughed, and dismissed from his mind that which he had purposed against the villagers. Moreover, he took the damsel to wife then and there, being pleased with her much wit and acuteness, and the excellence of her speech. And they tell another tale of the water carrier and the goldsmith's wife. There was once in the city of Bokhara a water carrier, who used to carry water to the house of a goldsmith, and had done this thirty years. Now that goldsmith had a wife of exceeding beauty and loveliness, brilliancy and perfect grace, and she was withal renowned for piety, chastity, and modesty. One day the water carrier came, as of custom, and poured the water into the cisterns. Now the woman was standing in the midst of the court, so he went up close to her, and taking her hand, stroked it and pressed it, and then went away and left her. When her husband came home from the bazaar, she said to him, I would have thee tell me what thing thou hast done in the market this day to anger Almighty Allah. Quoth he, I have done nothing to offend the Lord. Nay, rejoined she, but by Allah thou hast indeed done something to anger him, and unless thou tell me the whole truth, I will not abide in thy house, and thou shalt not see me, nor will I see thee. So he confessed, I will tell thee the truth of what I did this day. It so chanced that as I was sitting in my shop, as of want, a woman came up and bade me make her a bracelet of gold. Then she went away, and I wrought her a bracelet and laid it aside. But when she returned, and I brought her out the bracelet, she put forth her hand, and I clasped the bracelet on her wrist, and I wondered at the whiteness of her hand and the beauty of her wrist, which would captivate any beholder. And I recalled what the poet saith, Her forearms dight with their bangles show, Like fire ablaze on the waves aflow, As by purest gold where the water girt, And belted around by living low. So I took her hand, and pressed it, and squeezed it. Said the woman, Great God! Why didst thou this ill thing? Know that the water carrier, who hath come to our house these thirty years, nor sawst thou ever any treason in him, took my hand this day, and pressed it, and squeezed it. Said her husband, O woman, let us crave pardon of Allah. Verily, I repent of what I did, and do thou ask forgiveness of the Lord for me. She cried, Allah, pardon me and thee, and receive us into his holy keeping. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninety-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the goldsmith's wife cried out, Allah, pardon me and thee, and receive us into his holy keeping. And on the next day, the water carrier came to the jeweler's wife, and throwing himself at his feet, groveled in the dust, and besought pardon of her, saying, O my lady, acquit me of that which Satan deluded me to do, for it was he who seduced me and led me astray. She answered, Go thy ways, the sin was not in thee, but in my husband, for that he did what he did in his shop, and Allah hath retaliated upon him in this world.
and it related that the goldsmith, when his wife told him how the water carrier had used her, said, Tit for tat and blow for blow. Had I done more, the water carrier had done more. Which became a current byword among the folk. Therefore it behoveth a wife to be both outward and inward with her husband, contenting herself with little from him, if he cannot give her much, and taking pattern by Aisha the truthful and Fatima the virgin mother, Allah Almighty except of them the twain, that she may be of the company of the righteous ancestry. And I have heard of the following tale of Khusrau and Shirin and the fisherman. King Khusrau Shahinshah of Persia loved fish, and one day as he sat in his saloon, he and Shirin his wife, there came a fisherman with a great fish, and he laid it before the king, who was pleased and ordered the man four thousand dirhams. Thereupon Shirin said to the king, Thou hast done ill. Asked he, And why? And she answered, Because, if after this thou give one of thy courtiers a like sum, he will disdain it, and say, He hath given me the like of what he gave the fisherman. And if thou give him less, the same will he say, He despiseth me, and giveth me less than he gave the fisherman. Rejoined Khusrau, Thou art right, but it would dishonor a king to go back on his gift, and the thing is done. Quoth Shirin, If thou wilt, I will contrive thee a means to get it back from him. Quoth he, How so? And she said, Call back, if thou please, the fisherman, and ask him if the fish be male or female. If he say male, say thou, we want a female. And if he say female, say, we want a male. So the king sent for the fisherman, who was a man of wit and astuteness, and said to him, Is this fish male or female? Whereupon the fisherman kissed the ground and answered, This fish is a hermaphrodite, neither male nor female. Khusrau laughed at his clever reply and ordered him other four thousand dirhams. So the fisherman went to the treasurer and taking his eight thousand dirhams, placed them in the sack he had with him. Then throwing it over his shoulder, he was going away when he dropped a dirham. So he laid the bag off his back and stooped down to pick it up. Now the king and Shirin were looking on, and the queen said, O king, didst thou note the meanness of the man, in that he must needs stoop down to pick up the one dirham, and could not bring himself to leave it for any of the king's servants? When the king heard these words, he was exceeding wroth with the fisherman, and said, Thou art right, O Shirin. So he called the man back, and said to him, Thou low-minded carl, thou art no man. How couldst thou put the bag with all this money off thy back, and bend thee groundwards to pick up the one dirham, and grudge to leave it where it fell? Thereupon the fisherman kissed the earth before him, and answered, May Allah prolong the king's life. Indeed, I did not pick up the dirham off the ground because of its value in my eyes, but I raised it off the earth, because on one of its faces is the likeness of the king, and on the other his name. And I feared lest any should unwittingly set foot upon it, thus dishonoring the name and the presentment of the king, and I be blamed for this offense. The king wondered at his words, and approved of his wit and shrewdness, and ordered him yet another four thousand dirhams. Moreover, he bade cry abroad in his kingdom, saying, It behoveth none to be guided by women's counsel. For whoso followeth their advice, loseth with his one dirham other twain. And here is the tale they tell of Yaha bin Khalid the Barmecide and the poor man. Yaha bin Khalid the Barmecide was returning home one day from the Caliph's palace, when he saw at the gate of his mansion a man who rose as he drew near and saluted him, saying, O Yaha, I am in sore need of that which is in thy hand, and I make Allah my intermediary with thee. So Yaha caused a place to be set aside for him in his house, and bade his treasurer carry him a thousand dirhams every day, and ordered that his diet be of the choicest of his own meat. 
The man abode in this case a whole month, at the end of which time, having received in all thirty thousand dirhams, and fearing lest Yaha should take the money from him because of the greatness of the sum, he departed by stealth, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninety-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the man taking with him the money departed by stealth. But when they told Yaha of this, he said, By Allah, though he had tarried with me to the end of his days, yet had I not stinted him of my largesse, nor cut off from him the bounties of my hospitality. For indeed the excellences of the Barmecides were past count, nor can their virtues be committed to description, especially those of Yaha bin Khalid, for he was an ocean of noble qualities. Even as saith the poet of him, I asked of bounty, Art thou free? Quoth she, No, I am slave to Yaha, Khalid's son. Batan, asked I, Allah forfend, quoth she, by airship, sire to sire's transmission. And the following is related of Muhammad al Amin and the slave girl. Ja'afar bin Musa al Hadi once had a slave girl, a ludist, called al Badr al Kabir than whom there was not in her time a fairer of face, nor a shapelier of shape, nor a more elegant of manners, nor a more accomplished in the art of singing and striking the strings. She was indeed perfect in beauty and extreme in every charm. Now, Muhammad al-Amin, son of Zubaydah, heard of her and was urgent with Ja'far to sell her to him. But he replied, Thou knowest, it beseemeth not one of my rank to sell slave girls, nor set prices on concubines. But, were she not a rearling, I would send her to thee as a gift, not grudge her to thee. And Muhammad al Amin, some days after this, went to Jafar's house to make merry. And the host set before him that which behooveth to set before true friends, and bade the damsel al Badr al Kabir to sing to him and to gladden him. So she tuned the lute and sang with a ravishing melody, whilst Muhammad al-Amin fell to drinking and jollity and bade the cupbearers ply Jafar with much wine till they made him drunken, when he took the damsel and carried her to his own house, but laid not a finger on her. And when the morrow dawned, he bade invite Jafar, and when he came, he set wine before him, and made the girl sing to him from behind the curtain. Jafar knew her voice, and was angered at this. But, of the nobleness of his nature, and the magnanimity of his mind, he showed no change. Now when the carousal was at an end, al Amin commanded one of his servants to fill the boat wherein Jafar had come, with dirhams and dinars, and all manner of jewels and jacinths, and rich raiment, and goods galore. So he laid therein a thousand myriads of money, and a thousand fine pearls, each worth twenty thousand dirhams. Nor did he give over loading the barge with all manner of things precious and rare, till the boatman cried out for help, saying, This boat cannot hold any more. Whereupon he bade them carry all this to Jafar's palace. Such are the exploits of the magnanimous. Allah have mercy on them. And a tale is related of the sons of Yaha bin Khalid and Sa'id bin Salim al-Bahili. Quoth Sa'id bin Salim al-Bahili, I was once in a very narrow case during the days of Harun al-Rashid, and debts accumulated upon me, burdening my back, and these I had no means of discharging. I was at my wit's end what to do, for my doors were blocking up with creditors, and I was without cease importuned for payment by claimants, who dunned me in crowds, till at last I was sore perplexed and troubled. So I betook myself to Abdallah bin Malik al Khuzai, and besought him to extend the hand of aid with his judgment, and direct me of his good counsel to the door of relief. And he said, None can save thee from this thy strait and sorrowful state, save the Barmecides. 
Quoth I, Who can brook their pride and put up patiently with their arrogant pretensions? And quoth he, Thou wilt put up with all this for the bettering of thy case. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 9. Recording by Maury Cunin. Section number 10, volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maury Cunin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 10. When it was the 393rd night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Abdallah ibn Malik al Khuzai said to Sa'id bin Salim, Thou wilt put up with all this for the bettering of thy case. So I left him suddenly, continued Sa'id, and went straight to Al-Fazl and Jafar, sons of Yaha bin Khalid, to whom I related my circumstances. Whereto they replied, Allah give thee his aid, and render thee by his bounties, independent of his creatures, and vouchsafe thee abundant weal, and bestow on thee what shall suffice thee without the need of any but himself. For whatso he willeth, that he can. And he is gracious with his servants, and knoweth their wants. So I went out from the twain, and returned to Abdallah, with straitened breast, and mind perplexed and heavy of heart, and repeated to him what they had said. Quoth he, Thou wouldst do well to abide with us this day, that we may see what Allah Almighty will decree. So I sat with him a while, when, lo, up came my servant, who said to me, O oh, my Lord, there are at our door many laden mules, and with them a man who says he is the agent of Al-Fazl and Jafar ben Yaha. Quoth Abdallah, I trust that relief is come to thee. Rise up and go see what is the matter. So I left him, and hastening to my house, found at the door a man who gave me a note wherein was written the following. After thou hadst been with us, and we heard thy case, we betook ourselves to the caliph, and informed him that ill condition had reduced thee to the humiliation of begging. Whereupon he ordered us to supply thee with a thousand thousand dirhams from the treasury. We represented to him, The debtor will spend this money in paying off creditors and wiping off debt, Whence then shall he provide for his subsistence? So he ordered thee other three hundred thousand, and each of us hath also sent thee, of his proper wealth, a thousand thousand dirhams, so that thou hast now three thousand thousand and three hundred thousand dirhams, wherewithal to order and amend thine estate. See then the munificence of these magnificos, Almighty Allah have mercy on them. And a tale is told of the woman's trick against her husband. A man brought his wife a fish one Friday, and bidding her to cook it against the end of the congregational prayers, went out to his craft and business. Meanwhile, in came her friend who bade her to a wedding at his house. So she agreed, and laying the fish in a jar of water, went off with him and was absent a whole week till the Friday following. Whilst her husband sought her from house to house and inquired after her, but none could give him any tidings of her. So on the next Friday she came home and he fell foul of her, but she brought out to him the fish, alive from the jar, and assembled the folk against him and told them of her tale. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninety-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the woman brought out the fish alive from the water jar, and assembled the folk against her husband, and told them her tale. He also told his, but they credited him not, and said, 
It cannot be that the fish should have remained alive all this while. So they proved him mad and imprisoned him and mocked him, whereupon he shed tears in floods and recited these two couplets. Old hag of high degree in filthy life, whose face her monstrous lewdness witness, when menstruous she bods, when clean she hoards, and all her time bod or adulteress is. And a tale is related of the devout woman and the two wicked elders. There was, in times of yore, and in ages long gone before, a virtuous woman among the children of Israel, who was pious and devout, and used every day to go out to the place of prayer, first entering a garden which adjoined thereto, and there making the minor ablution. Now there were in this garden two old men, its keepers, and both sheikhs fell in love with her and sought her favors. But she refused, whereupon said they, Unless thou yield thy body to us, we will bear witness against thee of fornication. Quoth she, Allah will preserve me from your frowardness. Then they opened the garden gate and cried out, and the folk came to them from all places, saying, What aileth you? Quoth they, We found this damsel in company with a youth who was doing lewdness with her, but he escaped from our hands. Now it was the want of the people in those days to expose adulterer and adulteress to public reproach for three days, and after stoned them. So they cried her name in the public streets for three days, while the two elders came up to her daily, and laying their hands on her head, said, Praise be Allah, who hath sent down on thee his righteous indignation. Now on the fourth day, when they bore her away to stone her, they were followed by a lad named Daniel, who was then only twelve years old, and this was to be the first of his miracles, upon our prophet and upon him the blessing and peace. And he ceased not following them to the place of execution, till he came up with them and said to them, Hasten not to stone her, till I judge between them. So they set him in a chair, and he sat down and summoned the old men separately. Now he was the first ever separated witnesses. Then he said to the first, What sawest thou? So he repeated to him the story, and Daniel asked, In what part of the garden did this befall? And he answered, On the eastern side, under a pear tree. Then he called the other old man and asked him the same question, and he replied, On the western side of the garden, under an apple tree. Meanwhile the damsel stood by, and with her hands and eyes raised heavenwards, implored the Lord for deliverance. Then Allah Almighty sent down his blasting leaven fire upon the elders and consumed them. And on this wise the Lord made manifest the innocence of the damsel. Such was the first of the miracles of the prophet Daniel, on whom be blessing and peace. And they relate a tale of Jafar the Barmecide and the old Badawi. The commander of the faithful, Harun al-Rashid, went out one day with Abu Yaqub, the cup champion, and Jafar the Barmecide, and Abu Nawas into the desert, where they fell in with an old man propped against his ass. The caliph bade Jafar learn of him whence he came. So he asked him, Whence comest thou? And he answered, From Basora. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninety-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Jafar asked the man, Whence comest thou? He answered, from Basora. Quoth Jafar, And whither goest thou? Quoth the other, To Baghdad. Then Jafar inquired, And what wilt thou do there? And the old man replied, I go to seek medicine for my eye. Said the caliph, O Jafar, make thou sport with him. And answered Jafar, I shall hear what I shall exceedingly mislike. But al-Rashid rejoined, I charge thee on my authority, jest with him. 
Thereupon Jafar said to the Badawi, If I prescribe thee a medicine that shall profit thee, what wilt thou give me in return? Quoth the other, Allah Almighty will requite this kindness with what is better for thee than any requital of mine. Continued Jafar, Now lend me an ear, and I will give thee a prescription which I have given to none but thee. What is that? asked the Badawi, and Jafar answered, Take three ounces of wind breaths, and the like of sunbeams, and the same of moonshine, and as much of lamplight. Mix them well together, and let them lie in the wind three months. Then place them three months in a mortar without a bottom, and pound them into a fine powder, and after trituration, set them in a cleft platter, and let it stand in the wind other three months. After which, use of this medicine three drachms every night in thy sleep, and inshallah thou shalt be healed and whole. Now, when the Badawi heard this, he stretched himself out to full length on the donkey's back and let fly a terrible loud fart and said to Jafar, Take this fart in payment of thy prescription. When I have followed it, if Allah grant me recovery, I will give thee a slave girl who shall serve thee in thy lifetime a service, wherewith Allah shall cut short thy term. And when thou diest, and the Lord hurrieth thy soul to hellfire, she shall blacken thy face with her skite of her mourning for thee, and shall keen and beat her face, saying, O frosty beard, what a fool thou wast. Thereupon Harun al-Rashid laughed till he fell backward, and ordered the Badawi three thousand silver pieces. And a tale is told of the Caliph Omar bin al-Khattab and the young Badawi. The Sharif Hussein bin Rayyan relateth that the Caliph Omar bin al-Khattab was sitting one day judging the folk and doing justice between his subjects, attended by the best and wisest of his counselors. When there came up to him a youth, comely and cleanly attired, upon whom two very handsome youths had laid hold and were hauling by the collar till they set him in the presence. Whereupon the commander of the faithful Omar looked at him and looked at them and bade them loose him. Then, calling him near to himself, asked the twain, What is your case with him? They answered, O prince of true believers, we are two brothers by one mother, and as followers of verity known we are. We had a father, a very old man of good counsel, honored by the tribes, sound of baseness, renowned for goodliness, who reared us tenderly in childhood, and loaded us with favors in manhood. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninety-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the two youths said to the commander of the faithful Omar, son of Khattab, Our father was a man honored by the tribes, sound of baseness, and renowned for goodliness, who reared us delicately in childhood, and loaded us with favors in manhood, in fine, a sea of noble and illustrious qualities, worthy of the poet's praise. Is Abs Sakr of Shaiban? they asked. Quoth I, nay, by my life, of him's Shaiban. How many a sire rose high by a noble son, as Allah's prophet glorified Adnan. Now he went forth this day to his garden, to refresh himself amongst its trees and pluck the ripe fruits, when this young man slew him wrongously and swerved from the road of righteousness. Wherefore we demand of thee the retribution of his crime and call upon thee to pass judgment upon him, according to the commandment of Allah. Then Omar cast a terrible look at the accused youth and said to him, Verily, thou hearest the complaint these two young men prefer. What hast thou in reply to aver? But he was brave of heart and bold of speech, having doffed the robe of pusillanimity and put off the garb of cowardry. So he smiled and spake in the most eloquent and elegant words, 
and after paying the usual ceremonial compliments to the caliph, said, By Allah, O commander of the faithful, I have indeed given ear to their complaint, and they have told the truth in that which they tell, so far as they have set out what befell. And the commandment of Allah is a decreed decree. But I will forthright state my case between thy hands, and it is for thee to give commands. Know then, O prince of the faithful, that I am a very Arab of the Arabies, the noblest of those that are beneath the skies. I grew up in the dwellings of the wold and fell, till evil times my tribe befell. When I came to the outskirts of this town, with my family and whatso goods I own, and as I went along one of the paths leading to its gardens, orchards, and garths, with my she-camels highly esteemed, and by me most precious deemed, and in the midst of them a stallion of noble blood and shape right good, a plenteous getter of brood, by whom the females abundantly bore, and walked among them as though a kingly crown he wore. One of the she-camels broke away, and running to the garden of these young men's father, where the trees showed above the wall, put forth her lips, and began to feed as in a stall. I ran to her to drive her away, when, behold, there appeared at a breach of the wall an old man and gray, whose eyes sparkled with angry ray. Holding in his right a stone to throw, and swaying to and fro with a swing like a lion ready for a spring, he cast the stone at my stallion, and it killed him, for it struck a vital part. When I saw the stallion drop dead beside me, I felt live coals of anger kindled in my heart. So I took up the very same stone, and throwing it at the old man, it was the cause of his bane and ban. Thus, it was his own wrongful act returned to him anew, and the man was slain of that wherewith he slew. When the stone struck him, he cried out with a great cry and shrieked out a terrible shriek, whereupon I hastened from the spot. But these two young men hurried after me, and laid hands on me, and before thee carried me. Quoth Omar, Almighty Allah accept of him, Thou hast confessed what thou committedest, and of acquittal there is no possible occasion. For urgent is the law of retaliation, and they cried for mercy, but it was not a time to escape. The youth answered, I hear and obey the judgment of the imam, and I consent to all required by the law of al-Islam. But I have a young brother, whose old father before his decease appointed to him wealth in great store and gold galore, and committed his affair to me before Allah, saying, I give this into thy hand for thy brother. Keep it for him with all thy might. So I took the money and buried it, nor doth any know of it but I. Now, if thou adjudge me to be justest forthright, the money will lost, and thou wilt be the cause of its loss. Wherefore the child will sue thee for his due on the day when the Creator shall judge between his creatures. But if thou wilt grant me three days' delay, I will appoint some guardian to administer the affairs of the boy, and return to answer my debt and I have one who will be my surety for the fulfillment of this my promise. So the commander of the faithful bowed his head a while, then raised it, and looking round upon those present, said, Who will stand surety by my side for his return to this place? And the youth looked at the faces of those who were in company, and pointing to Abu Zar, in the preference to all present, said, this man shall answer for me, and be my bail. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 10. Recording by Maury Kunin. Section 11, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton the book of a thousand nights and a night volume five section eleven three hundred ninety seventh night to four hundredth night when it was the three hundred and ninety seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the youth pointed to abazar and said this man shall answer for me and be my bail omar Allah accept of him, said, O Abu Zar, dost thou hear these words, and wilt thou be surety to me for the return of this youth? He answered, Yes, O commander of the faithful, I will be surety for him for three days. So the caliph accepted his guarantee, and let the young man go. Now when the appointed time passed, and the days of grace were nearly or quite at end, yet the youth came not, the caliph took seat in his council, with the companions surrounding him, like the constellations about the moon, Abu Zar and the plaintiffs being also present. And the avengers said, Where is the defendant, O Abu Zar, and how shall he return, having once fled? But we will not stir from our places, till thou bring him to us, that we may take of him our blood revenge. Replied Abu Zar, By the truth of the all-wise king, if the three days of grace expire, and the young man returneth not, I will fulfill my warranty, and surrender my person to the imam. And added Omar, whom Allah accept, By the Lord, if the young man appear not, I will assuredly execute on Abu Zar that which is prescribed by the law of al-islam thereupon the eyes of the bystanders ran over with tears those who looked on groaned aloud and great was the clamour then the chiefs of the companions urged the plaintiffs to accept the blood wit and deserve the thanks of the folk but they both refused and would accept nothing save the talion however as the folk were swaying to and fro like waves and loudly bemoaning Abu Zar, behold, up came the young Badawi, and standing before the Imam, saluted him right courteously, with sweat-beaded face, and shining with the crescent's grace, and said to him, I have given the lad in charge to his mother's brothers, and have made them acquainted with all that pertaineth to his affairs, and let them into the secrets of his monies, after which I braved the heats of noon, and have kept my word as a free-born man. Thereupon the folk marveled, seeing his good faith and loyalty, and his offering himself to death with so stout a heart, and one said to him, How noble a youth art thou, and how loyal to thy word of honour, and thy devoir! Rejoined he, Are ye not convinced that when death presenteth itself none can escape from it and indeed i have kept my word that it be not said good faith is gone from among mankind said abu zar by allah o commander of the faithful i became warrant for this young man without knowing to what tribe he belonged nor had i seen him before that day but when he turned away from all who were present and singled me out saying this man shall answer for me and be my bail, I thought it not right to refuse him, and generosity forbade to disappoint his desire, there being no harm in compliance therewith, that it be not brooded abroad, benevolence is gone from among mankind. Then said the two young men, O commander of the faithful, we forgive this youth our father's blood, seeing that he hath changed desolation into cheerfulness, that it be not said, Humanity is gone from among mankind. So the caliph rejoiced in the acquittance of the youth and his truth and good faith. Moreover, he magnified the generosity of Abu Zar, extolling it over all his companions, and approved the resolve of the two young men for its benevolence, 
giving them praise with thanks, and applying to their case the saying of the poet. Who doth kindness to men shall be paid again? Ne'er is kindness lost betwixt God and men. Then he offered to pay them from the treasury the blood wit for their father, but they refused, saying, We forgave him only of our desire unto Allah, the bountiful, the exalted, and he who is thus intentioned followeth not his benefits with reproach or with mischief. And amongst the tales they relate is that of the Caliph al Mahmun and the Pyramids of Egypt. It is told that the Caliph al Mamun, son of Harun al Rashid, when he entered the God guarded city of Cairo, was minded to pull down the pyramids, that he might take what was therein. But when he went about to do this, he could not succeed, albeit his best was done. He expended a mint of money in the attempt. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred ninety-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that al Mamun, attempting to pull down the pyramids, expended his mint of money, but succeeded only in opening up a small tunnel in one of them, where in it it said he found treasure to the exact amount of the monies he had spent in the works, neither more nor less. Whereat he marvelled, and taking what he found there, desisted from his determination. Now the pyramids are three, and they are one of the wonders of the world. Nor is there on the face of earth aught like them for height and fashion and mysteries, for they are built of huge rocks, and the builders proceeding by piercing one block of stone, and setting therein upright rods of iron, after which they pierced a second block of stone, and lowered it upon the first. Then they poured melted lead upon the clamps, and set the blocks in geometrical order, till the building was complete. Now the height of each pyramid was an hundred cubits, of the normal measure of the day, and it had four faces, each three hundred cubits long from the base, and thence battering upwards to a point. The ancients say that in the western pyramid are thirty chambers of party-colored cyanite, full of precious gems and treasures galore, and rare images and utensils, and costly weapons which are anointed with ergomantic unguents, so that they may not rest until the day of resurrection. Therein also are vessels of glass, which bend and break not, containing various kinds of compound drugs and sympathetic waters. In the second pyramid are the records of the priests, written on tablets of cyanide, to each priest his tablet, whereupon are engraved the wonders of his craft and his feats, and on the walls are the human figures like idols, working with their hands at all manner of mechanism, and seated on stepped thrones. Moreover, to each pyramid there is a guardian treasurer, who keepeth watch over it, and wardeth it, to all eternity, against the ravages of time, and the shifts of events. And indeed the marvels of these pyramids astound all who have sight and insight. Many are the poems that describe them. Thou shalt thereby profit no small matter, and among the rest, quoth one of them, If kings would see their high emprise preserved, Twill be by tongues of monuments they laid. Seest not the pyramids? These two endure, despite what change time and change have made. And quoth another, Look on the pyramids, and hear the twain. Recount their annals of the long-gone past. Could they but speak, high marvels had they told, Of what time did to man, from first to last. 
and quoth a third. My friend, I prithee tell me, neath the sky, is aught with Egypt's pyramids can compare? Buildings which frighten time, all be what dwells, on back of earth, in fear of time, must fare. If on their marvels rest my sight no more, yet these I ever shall in memory bear. And quoth a fourth. Where is the man who built the pyramids? What was his tribe? What day and where his tomb? The monuments survive the men who built a while till overthrown by touch of doom. And men also tell a tale of the thief and the merchant. There was once a thief who repented to Almighty Allah with sincere penitence. So he opened himself a shop for the sale of stuffs, where he continued to trade a while. It so chanced one day that he locked his shop and went home, and in the night there came to the bazaar an artful thief disguised in the habit of the merchant, and pulling out keys from his sleeve said to the watchman of the market, Light me this wax candle. The watchman took the taper and went to light it, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and ninety-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the watchman took the taper and went to light it, whilst the thief opened the shop and lit another candle he had by him. When the watchman came back, he found him seated in the shop, account books in hand, and reckoning with his fingers. Nor did he cease to do thus till point of day, when he said to the man, Fetch me a camel driver and his camel, to carry some goods for me. So the man fetched him a camel, and the thief took four bales of stuffs, and gave them to the camelier, who loaded them on his beast. Then he gave the watchman two dirhams, and went away after the camel driver leaving the watchman believing him to be the owner of the shop. Now when the morning dawned and day broke, the merchant came and the watchman began greeting him with blessings because of the two dirhams. But the shopkeeper wondered at his words as one not knowing what he meant. When he opened his shop he saw the droppings of the wax and the account book lying on the floor and looking round found four bales of stuffs missing. So he asked the watchman what had happened, and he told him what has passed in the night, and what had been said to the camelier. Whereupon the merchant bade him fetch the man, and asked him, Whither didst thou carry the stuffs this morning? Answered the driver, To such a landing place, and I stowed them on board such a vessel. Said the merchant, Come with me thither. So the camel driver carried him to the landing place, and said to him, This be the bark, and this be her owner. Quoth the merchant to the seaman, Whither didst thou carry the merchant and the stuff? Answered the boatmaster, To such a place where he fetched a camel driver, and setting the bales on the camel, went his ways I know not whither. Fetch me the camelier who carried the goods, said the merchant. So he fetched him, and the merchant said to him, Whither didst thou carry the bales of goods from the ship? To such a khan, answered he. And the merchant rejoined, Come thither with me, and show it to me. So the camel man went with him to a place far distant from the shore, and showed him the khan, where he had set down the stuffs, and at the same time, the false merchant's magazine, which he opened and found therein his four bales bound up as they had been packed. The thief had laid his cloak over them. So the merchant took the cloak, as well as the bales, and delivered them to the camel driver, who laid them on his camel. 
after which he locked the magazine and went away with the cameleer. On the way he was confronted with the thief who followed him, till he had shipped the bales, when he said to him, O my brother, Allah have thee in his holy keeping, thou hast indeed recovered thy goods, and naught of them is lost. So give me back my cloak. The merchant laughed, and giving him back his cloak, let him go unhindered, whereupon both went their ways. And they tell a tale of Masrur the eunuch and Ibn al-Karibi. The commander of the faithful, Harun al-Rashid, was exceedingly restless one night. So he said to his wazir Ja'far, I am sleepless to-night, and my breast is straightened, and I know not what to do. Now his castrato Masrur was standing before him, and he laughed. Whereupon the caliph said, At whom laughest thou? Is it to make mock of me, or hath madness seized thee? Answered Masrur, Nay, by Allah, O commander of the faithful. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundredth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Harun al-Rashid said to Masrur the sorter, Dost thou laugh to make mock of me, or hath madness seized thee? Answered Masrur, Nay, by Allah, O commander of the faithful, I swear by thy kinship to the prince of apostles, I did it not of my free will, but I went out yesterday to walk within sight of the palace, and coming to the bank of the Tigris, saw there the folk collected. So I stopped and found a man, Ibn al-Karibi Hait, who was making them laugh. But just now I recalled what he said, and laughter got the better of me, and I crave pardon of thee, O commander of the faithful. Quoth the caliph, Bring him to me forthright. So Masrur repaired in all haste to Ibn al-Karibi, and said to him, Answer the summons of the commander of the faithful, whereto he replied, I hear and obey. But on condition, added Masrur, that if he give thee aught, thou shalt have a quarter, and the rest shall be mine. Replied the droll, Nay, thou shalt have half, and I half. Rejoined Masrur, Not so, I will have three quarters. Lastly said Ibn al-Karibi, Thou shalt have two-thirds, and I the other third. To which Masrur agreed, after much higgling and haggling, and they returned to the palace together. Now when Ibn al-Karibi came into the caliph's presence, he saluted him as men greet the caliphate, and stood before him. Whereupon said al-Rashid to him, If thou do not make me laugh, I will give thee three blows with this bag. Quoth Ibn al-Karibi in his mind, And a small matter were blows with that bag, seeing that beating with whips hurteth me not, for he thought the bag was empty. Then he began to deal out his drolleries, such as would make the dismalest jemmy guffaw, and gave vent to all manner of buffooneries. But the caliph laughed not, neither smiled, whereat Ibn al-Karibi marvelled and was chagrined and affrighted. Then said the commander of the faithful, Now hast thou earned the beating, and gave him a blow with the bag, wherein were four pebbles, each two rotols in weight. The blow fell on his neck, and he gave a great cry. Then calling to mind his compact with Masrur, said, Pardon, O commander of the faithful, hear two words from me. Quoth the caliph, Say on, and quoth Ibn al-Karibi, Masrur made it a condition with me, and I a covenant with him, that whatsoever largesse might come to me of the bounties of the commander of the faithful, one-third thereof should be mine, and the rest his. Nor did he agree to leave me so much as one-third, save after much higgling and haggling. I have had my share, and here standeth he, ready to receive his portion, 
so pay him the two other blows. Now when the caliph heard this, he laughed until he fell on his back. Then calling Masrur, he gave him a blow, whereat he cried out and said, O commander of the faithful, the one-third sufficeth me, give him the two-thirds. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 11 Recording by Eva Easton Section 12, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 12, 401st through 404th Night. When it was the four hundred and first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Masrur cried out, O commander of the faithful, the one-third sufficeth me, give him the two-thirds. So the caliph laughed at them and ordered them a thousand dinars each, and they went away, rejoicing at the largesse. And of the tales they tell, is one of the devotee prince. The commander of the faithful, Harun al-Rashid, had a son, who from the time he attained the age of sixteen, renounced the world, and walked in the way of ascetics and devotees. He was wont to go out to the graveyards and say, Ye once ruled the world, but that saved you not from death, and now are ye come to your sepulchres. Would heaven I knew what ye said, and what is said to you. And he wept, as one weepeth who is troubled with fear and apprehension, and repeated the words of the poet. Affright me funerals at every time, and wailing women grieve me to the soul. Now it chanced one day, as he sat among the tombs, according to his custom, his father passed by in all his state surrounded by his wazirs and lords of the realm. And the officers of his household, who seeing the caliph's son, with a gown of wool and stuff on his body, and a twist of wool on his head, by way of turband, said to one another, Verily this youth dishonoureth the commander of the faithful among kings. But if he reproved him, he would leave his present way of life. The caliph heard these words, so quoth he to his son, O my dear child, of a truth thou disgracest me by thy present way of life. The young man looked at him and made no reply. Then he beckoned to a bird perched on the battlements of the palace and said to it, O thou bird, I conjure thee by him who created thee, a light upon my hand whereupon straightway it swooped down and perched on his finger. Then, quoth he, return to thy place, and it did so. Presently he said, A light on the hand of the commander of the faithful, but it refused there to perch. And he cried to his father, It is thou that disgracest me amongst the holy ones by the love of the world. And now I am resolved to part from thee never to return to thee, save in the world to come. Then he went down to Basora, where he took to working with those which wrought in clay, receiving as his days higher but a dirham and a danik. And with the danik he fed himself, and gave alms of the dirham. Quoth Abu Amir of Basora, There fell down a wall in my house, so I went forth to the station of the artisans to find a man who should repair it for me, and my eyes fell on a handsome youth of a radiant countenance. So I saluted him and asked him, O my friend, dost thou seek work? 
Yes, answered he. And I said, Come with me and build a wall. He replied, On certain conditions I will make with thee. Quoth I, What are they, O my friend? And quoth he, My wage must be a dirham and a danik. And again, when the muezzin calleth to prayer, thou shalt let me go pray with the congregation. It is well, answered I, and carried him to my lace, where he fell to work, such work as I never saw the like of. Presented I named to him the morning meal, but he said no, and I knew that he was fasting. When he heard the call to prayer, he said to me, Thou knowest the condition? Yes, answered I. So he loosed his girdle, and applying himself to the lesser ablution, made it after a fashion than which I never saw a fairer. Then he went to the mosque, and prayed with the congregation, and returned to his work. He did the same upon the call to mid-afternoon prayer, and when I saw him fall to work again thereafterward, I said to him, O oh, my friend, verily the hours of labor are over. A workman's day is but till the time of afternoon prayer. But he replied, Praise to the Lord my services till the night. And he ceased not to work till nightfall, when I gave him two dirhams. Whereupon he asked, What is this? And I answered, By Allah, this is but part of thy wage, because of thy diligence in my service. But he threw them back to me, saying, I will have no more than was agreed upon between us twain. I urged him to take them, but could not prevail upon him. So I gave him the dirham and the danik, and he went away. And when morning dawned, I went to the station, but found him not. So I inquired for him, and was told, He cometh thither only on Sabbaths. Accordingly, when Saturday came, I betook me to the market, and finding him there, said to him, Bismillah, do me the favor to come and work for me. Said he, Upon the conditions thou wottest, and I answered, Yes. Then carrying him to my house, I stood to watch him, where he could not see me. And he took a handful of puddled clay, and laid it on the wall. When, behold, the stones ranged themselves one upon other. And I said, On this wise are Allah's holy ones. He worked out his day, and did even more than before. And when it was night, I gave him his hire, and he took it and walked away. Now when the third Saturday came round, I went to the place of standing, but found him not. So I asked after him, and they told me, He is sick and lying in the shanty of such a woman. Now this was an old wife, renowned for piety, who had a hovel of reeds in the burial ground. So I fared thither, and found him stretched on the floor, which was bare, with a brick for a pillow, and his face beaming like the new moon with light. I saluted him, and he returned my salam, and I sat down at his head, weeping over his fair young years, and absence from home, and submission to the will of his Lord. Then said I to him, Hast thou any need? Yes, answered he, and I said, What is it? He replied, Come hither to-morrow in the forenoon, and thou wilt find me dead. Wash me, and dig my grave, and tell none thereof. But shroud me in this my gown, after thou hast unsewn it, and taken out what thou shalt find in the bosom pocket which keep with thee. Then, when thou hast prayed over me, and laid me in the dust, go to Baghdad, and watch for the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, till he come forth, when do thou give him 
what thou shalt find in the breast of my gown, and bear him my salutation. Then he ejaculated the profession of the faith, and glorified his God in the most eloquent of words, reciting these couplets. Carry the trust of him whom death awaits to Al-Rashid, and God reward thy care. And say, an exile who desired thy sight, long loving from afar, sends greeting fair. Nor hate nor irk, no, him from thee withdrew. Kissing thy right to heaven brought him near. But what estranged his soul, O sire, from thee, is that thy worldly joys it would not share. Then he betook himself to prayer, asking pardon of Allah. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the youth then betook himself to asking pardon of Allah, and to invoking prayer and praise upon the Apostle and the Lord of the Just, and repeating verses of the Koran, after which he recited these couplets. O sire, be not deceived by worldly joys, for life must pass, and joy must learn to mourn. When thou art told of folk in evil plight, think thou must answer for all hearts forlorn. And when thou bear thy dead towards the tombs, know thou wilt likewise on that way be born. Continued Abu the Basri. Now when the youth had ended his charge and his verses, I left him and went home. On the morrow I returned at the appointed hour, and found him indeed dead, the mercy of Allah be upon him. So I washed him, and unsewing his gown, found in the bosom a ruby worth thousands of gold pieces, and said to myself, By Allah this youth was indeed weaned from worldly things. After I had buried him, I made my way to Baghdad, and going to the caliph's palace, waited till he came forth, when I addressed him in one of the streets, and gave him the ruby, which when he saw, he knew and fell down in a fainting fit. His attendants laid hands on me, but he revived and said to them, Release him, and bring him courteously to the palace. They did his bidding, and when he returned, he sent for me, and carrying me into his chamber, said to me, How doth the owner of this ruby? Quoth I, Verily he is dead, and told him what had passed. Whereupon he fell a-weeping, and said, The son hath gained, but the sire hath lost. Then he called out, saying, Ho, such a one! And behold, there came out to him a lady, who when she saw me would have withdrawn, but he cried to her, Come, and mind him not. So she entered and saluted, and he threw her the ruby, which when she saw and she knew, she shrieked a great shriek, and fell down in a swoon. As soon as she came to herself, she said, O commander of the faithful, what hath Allah done with my son? And he said to me, Do thou tell her his case? as he could not speak for weeping. Accordingly I repeated the story to her, and she began to shed tears, and say in a faint and wailing voice, How I have longed for thy sight, O solace of mine eyes! Would I might have given thee to drink, when thou hadst none to slake thy thirst! Would I might have cheered thee, when as thou foundest never a cheerer! and she poured forth tears, and recited these couplets. I weep for one whose lot a lonely death befell, without a friend to whom he might complain and moan, and after glory and glad union with his friends, he woke to desolation, 
friendless, lorn, and lone. What fortune hides a while, she soon to all men shall show. Death never spared a man, no, not a single one. O absent one, my lord decreed thee strangerhood. Far from thy nearest friends, and to long exile gone, Though death forbid my hope of meeting here again, On doom day's morrow we shall meet again, my son. Quoth I, Commander of the Faithful, Was he indeed thy son? Quoth he, Yes, and indeed, before I succeeded to this office, He was wont to visit the learned and company with the devout. But when I became caliph, he grew estranged from me, and withdrew himself apart. Then said I to his mother, Verily, this thy son hath cut the world, and devoted his life to Almighty Allah, and it may be that hard times shall befall him, and he be smitten with trial of evil chance. Wherefore do thou, given him this ruby, which he may find useful in hour of need? So she gave it to him, conjuring him to take it, and he obeyed her bidding. Then he left to us the things of our world, and removed himself from us. Nor did he cease to be absent from us, till he went to the presence of Allah, to whom be honor and glory, pious and pure. Then said he, Come, show me his grave. So I traveled with him to Basora, and showed him his son's grave, and when he saw it he wept and lamented, till he fell down in a swoon, after which he recovered, and asked pardon of the Lord, saying, We are Allah's, and unto him we are returning, and involved blessings on the dead. Then he asked me to become his companion, but I said to him, O commander of the faithful, Verily, in thy son's case is for me the most momentous of admonitions. And I recited these couplets. Tis I am the stranger visited by none. I am the stranger, though in town my own. Tis I am the stranger, lacking kith and son, and friend to whom I mote for aidance run. I house in mosques, which are my only home, my heart there wones and shall for ever wone. Then laud ye Allah, Lord of worlds, as long as soul and body dwell in union. And a famous tale is told of The unwise schoolmaster who fell in love by report. Quoth one of the learned, I passed once by a school wherein a schoolmaster was teaching children. So I entered, finding him a good-looking man and a well-dressed, when he rose to me and made me sit with him. Then I examined him in the Koran and in syntax and prosody and lexicography, and, behold, he was perfect in all required of him. So I said to him, Allah, strengthen thy purpose. Thou art indeed versed in all that is requisite. Thereafter I frequented him a while, discovering daily some new excellence in him, and quoth I to myself, This is indeed a wonder in any domini, for the wise are agreed upon a lack of wit in children's teachers. Then I separated myself from him, and sought him, and visited him only every few days till coming to see him one day, as of wont, I found the school shut, and made enquiry of his neighbors, who replied, Someone is dead in his house. So I said in my mind, It behoveth me to pay him a visit of condolence, and going to his house knocked at the door, when a slave girl came out to me and asked, What dost thou want? And I answered, I want thy master. She replied, He is sitting alone, mourning. And I rejoined, Tell him that his friend so-and-so seeketh to console him. She went in and told him, and he said, 
admit him. So she brought me in to him, and I found him seated alone and his head bound with mourning fillets. So I said to him, Allah requite thee amply, this is a path all must perforce tread, and it behoveth thee to take patience. Adding, But who is dead unto thee? He answered, One who was dearest of the folk to me, and best beloved. Perhaps thy father? No. Thy brother? No. One of thy kindred? No. Then asked I, What relation was the dead to thee? And he answered, My lover. Quoth I to myself, This is the first proof to swear by his lack of wit. So I said to him, Assuredly there be others than she, and fairer. And he made answer, I never saw her, that I might judge whether or no there be others fairer than she. Quoth I to myself, This is another proof positive. Then I said to him, And how couldst thou fall in love with one thou hast never seen? He replied, Know that I was sitting one day at the window, when, lo, there passed by a man, singing the following distich, Um Amr, thy boons Allah repay, give back my heart, be it where it may. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and third night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the schoolmaster continued, When I heard the man humming these words as he passed along the street, I said to myself, Except this Um Amru were without equal in the world, the poets had not celebrated her in Ode and Canzon. So I fell in love with her. But two days after, the same man passed, singing the following couplet. Ass and Um Amr went their way, nor she nor ass returned for I. Thereupon I knew she was dead, and mourned for her. This was three days ago, and I have been mourning ever since. So I left him, concluded the learned one, and fared forth, having assured myself of the weakness of the gerund grinder's wit. And they tell another and a similar tale of the foolish Domini. Once upon a time a schoolmaster was visited by a man of letters who entered a school, and sitting down by the host's side, entered into discourse with him, and found him an accomplished theologian, poet-grammarian, philologist, and poet, intelligent, well-bred, and pleasant-spoken, whereat he wondered, saying in himself, It cannot be that a man who teacheth children in a school should have a perfect wit. Now when he was about to go away, the pedant said to him, Thou art my guest to-night, and he consented to receive hospitality, and accompanied him to his house, where he made much of him, and set food before him. They ate and drank and sat talking, till a third part of the night was past, when the host spread his guest a bed, and went up to his harem. The stranger lay down and addressed himself to sleep, when, behold, there arose a great clamour in the women's rooms. He asked what was the matter, and they said, A terrible thing hath befallen the sheikh, and he is at the last gasp said he, Take me up to him. So they took him up to the pedagogue, whom he found lying insensible, with his blood streaming down. He sprinkled water on his face, and when he revived he asked him, What hath betided thee? When thou leftest me thou wast in all good cheer and whole of body. And he answered, O my brother, after I left thee, I sat meditating on the creative works of Almighty Allah, and said to myself, In everything the Lord hath created for man, there is an use. 
for he to whom be glory made the hands to seize the feet to walk the eyes to see the ears to hear and the penis to increase and multiply and so on with all the members of the body except these two ballocks there is no use in them so i took a razor i had by me and cut them off and there befell me what thou seest so the guest left him and went away saying he was in the right who said verily no schoolmaster who teacheth children can have a perfect wit though he know all the sciences and they tell a pleasant tale of the illiterate who set up for a schoolmaster there was once among the menials of a certain mosque a man who knew not how to write or even to read and who gained his bread by gulling folk one day it occurred to him to open a school and teach children so he got together writing tablets and written papers and hung them up in a high place then he greatened his turban and sat down at the door of the school and when the people who passed by saw his huge headgear and tablets and scrolls they thought he must be a very learned pedagogue so they brought him their children and he would say to this write and to that read and thus the little ones taught each other now one day as he sat as of wont at the door of the school behold up came a woman letter in hand and he said in his mind this woman doubtless seeketh me that i may read her the missive she hath in her hand how shall i do with her seeing that i cannot read writing and he would fain have gone down and fled from her but before he could do this she overtook him and said to him whither away quoth he i purpose to pray the noon prayer and return quoth she noon is yet distant so read me this letter he took the letter and turning it upside down fell to looking at it now shaking his head till his turban quivered then dancing his eyebrows and anon showing anger and concern now the letter came from the woman's husband who was absent and when she saw the dominie do on this wise she said to herself doubtless my husband is dead and this learned doctor of law and religion is ashamed to tell me so so she said to him o oh my lord if he be dead tell me but he shook his head and held his peace then said she shall i rend my raiment rend replied he shall i beat my face as she and he answered beat so she took the letter from his hand and returned home fell a-weeping she and her children presently one of her neighbors heard her sobbing and asking what aileth her was answered of a truth she had gotten a letter telling her that her husband is dead quoth the man this is a falsehood for I had a letter from him but yesterday, advising me that he is whole and in good health, and will be with her after ten days. So he rose forthright, and going in to her said, Where is the letter which came to thee? She brought it to him, and he took it, and read it, and lo, it ran as follows. After the usual salutations, I am well and in good health and whole and will be with you all after ten days meanwhile i send you a quilt and an extinguisher so she took the letter and returning to the schoolmaster said to him what induced thee to deal thus with me and she repeated to him what her neighbour had told her of her husband's well-being and of his having sent her a quilt and an extinguisher answered he thou art in the right o good woman for i was at the time and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the four hundred and fourth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the pedagogue replied verily i was at that time fashed and absent-minded and seeing the extinguisher wrapped up in the quilt i thought that he was dead 
and they had shrouded him. The woman not smoking the cheat said, Thou art excused, and taking the letter went her ways. And they relate a story of the king and the virtuous wife. A certain king once went forth in disguise to look into the affairs of his lieges. Presently he came to a great village which he entered unattended, and being athirst, stopped at the door of a house and asked for water. There came out to him a fair woman with a gugglet, which she gave him, and he drank. When he looked at her he was ravished with her, and besought her favours. Now she knew him, so she led him into the house, and making him sit down, brought out a book, and said to him, Look therein whilst I order my affair, and return to thee. So he looked into the book, and behold, it treated of the divine prohibition against adultery, and of the punishments which Allah hath prepared for those who commit adulterous sin. When he read this, his flesh quaked, and his hair bristled, and he repented to Almighty Allah. Then he called the woman, and giving her the book, went away. Now her husband was absent, and when he returned, she told him what had passed. Whereat he was confounded, and said in himself, I fear lest the king's desire have fallen upon her, and he dared not have to do with her, and know her carnally after this. When some time had passed, the woman told her kinsfolk of her husband's conduct, and they complained of him to the king, saying, Allah advance the king. This man hired of us a piece of land for tillage, and tilled it a while, then left it fallow, and neither tilled it nor forsook it, that we might let it to one who would till it. Indeed, harm is come to the field, and we fear its corruption, for such land as that, if it not be sown, spoileth. Quoth the king to the man, What hindereth thee from sowing thy land? Answered he, Allah advance the king. It reached me that the lion entered the field, wherefore I stood in awe of him and dared not draw near it, since knowing that I cannot cope with the lion, I stand in fear of him. The king understood the parable and rejoined, saying, O man, the lion trod and trampled not thy land, and it is good for seed, so do thou till it, and Allah prosper thee in it for the lion hath done it no hurt. Then he bade give the man and his wife a handsome present, and sent them away. And amongst the stories is that of Abid al-Rahman, the Maghribi's stories of the Rukh. There was once a man of the people of West Africa, who had journeyed far and wide, and traversed many a desert and a tide. He was once cast upon an island, where he abode a long while, and returning thence to his native country, brought with him the quill of a wing feather of a young rook, whilst yet in egg and unhatched. And this quill was big enough to hold a goat skin of water, for it is said that the length of the rook chick's wing, when he cometh forth of the egg, is a thousand fathoms. The folk marvelled at this quill when they saw it, and the man who was called Abid al-Rahman the Moor, and he was known to boot as the Chinaman for his long sojourn in Cathay, related to them the following adventure, one of many of his traveller's tales of marvel. He was on a voyage in the China seas, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 12. Recording by Eva Easton, Slotsburg, New York. Section 13, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 13. When it was the four hundred and fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Abd al-Rahman, the Mormon, the Chinaman, was wont to tell wondrous tales, amongst which was the following. He was on a voyage in the China Seas with a company of merchants, when they sighted an island from afar. So they steered for it, and, making fast thereto, saw that it was large and spacious. The ship's crew went ashore to get wood and water, taking with them hatchets and ropes and water skis, the travellers accompanying them, and presently espied a great dome, white and gleaming, and hundred cubits long. So they made towards it, and drawing near found that it was an egg of the rook, and fell on it with axes and stones and sticks till they uncovered the young bird and found the chick as it were a firm set hill. So they plucked out one of the wing feathers, but could not do so save by helping one another, for all the quills were not full grown, after which they took what they could carry of the young bird's flesh, and cutting the quill away from the vein, returned to the ship. Then they set sail, and putting out to sea, voyaged with a fair wind all that night, till the sun rose, and while everything went well, they saw the rook come flying after them, as he were a vast cloud, with a rock in his talons, like a great heap bigger than the ship. As soon as he poised himself in air over the vessel, he let fall the rock upon it, but the craft, having great way on her, out went the rock, which fell into the sea with a loud crash and a horrible. So Allah decreed their deliverance and saved them from the doom, and they cooked the young bird's flesh and ate it. Now there were amongst them old white-bearded men, and when they awoke on the morrow they found that their beards had turned black, nor did any who had eaten of the young rook grow gray ever after. Some said the cause of the return of youth to them and the ceasing of hoariness from them was that they had heated the pot with arrow wood, whilst others would have it that it came of eating the rook chick's flesh. And this is indeed a wonder of wonders. And a story is related of Adi bin Zaid and the Princess Hind. Al Numan bin Al Munzar, king of the Arabs of Iraq, had a daughter named Hind, who went out one Pash, which is a feast day of the Nazarenes, to the White Church to take the sacrament. She was eleven years old and was the loveliest woman of her age and time, and it so chanced that on the same day came to Hira a young man called Adi bin Zaid, with presents from the Kosro to Al Nuaman and he also went to the white church to communicate. He was tall of stature and fair of favor, with handsome eyes and smooth cheeks, and had with him a company of his people. Now there was with him bint al Nuaman, a slave girl named Mariah, who was enamored of Adi, but had not been able to foregather with him. So when she saw him in the church, she said to him, Look at yonder youth. By Allah, he is handsomer than all thou seest. Hind asked, And who is he? And Mariah answered, Adi bin Zaid. Quoth al Nuamin's daughter, I fear lest he know me, if I draw nearer to look on him. Quoth Mariah, How should he know thee, when he hath never seen thee? So she drew near him, and found him jesting with the youths his companions, and indeed he surpassed them all, not only in his personal charms, but in the excellence of his speech the eloquence of his tongue, and the richness of his raiment. When the princess saw him, she was ravished with him. Her reason was confounded, and her color changed. And Mariah, seeing her inclination to him, said to her, Speak him. So she spoke to him and went away. Now when he looked upon her and heard her speech, he was captivated by her, and his wit was dazed. His heart fluttered, and his color changed, so that his companions suspected him, and he whispered one of them to follow her and find out who she was. The young men went after her, and returning, informed him that she was Princess Hind, daughter of al Nuamin. So Adi left the church, knowing not whether he went, for excess of love, and reciting these two couplets. O friends of me, one favor more, I pray, unto the covenants find more your way. Turn me, that so I face the land of Hind, then go, and fairest greetings for me say. Then he went to his lodging and lay that night restless and without appetite for the food of sleep. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn, 
of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Adi ended his verses, he went to his lodging and lay that night restless and without appetite for the food of sleep. Now on the morrow, Mariah accosted him, and he received her kindly, though before he would not incline to her, and said to her, What is thy will? Quoth she, I have a want of thee. And quoth he, Name it, for by Allah thou shalt not ask me aught, but I will give it thee. So she told him that she loved him, and her want of him was that he would grant her a lover's privacy, and he agreed to do her will, on condition that she would serve him with Hind, and devise some device to bring them together. Then he took her into a vinter's tavern in one of the by-streets of Hira, and lay with her. After which she returned to Hind, and asked her, Dost thou not long to see Adi? She answered, How can this be? Indeed my longing for him makes me restless, and no repose is left me since yesterday. Quoth Mariah, I will appoint him to be in such a place where thou canst look on him from the palace. Quoth Hind, Do what thou wilt, and agreed with her upon the place. So Adi came, and the princess looked out upon him, and, when she saw him, she was like to topple down from the palace top, and said, O Mariah, except thou bring him in to me this night, I shall die. So saying, she fell to the ground in a fainting fit, and her serving-woman lifted her up and bore her into the palace. Whilst Mariah hastened to al Nuamin and discovered the whole matter to him with perfect truth, telling him that indeed she was mad for the love of Adi, and except he marry her to him, she must be put to shame and die of love for him, which would disgrace her father among the Arabs, adding at the end, There is no cure for this but wedlock. The king bowed his head a while in thought, and exclaimed again and again, Verily we are Allah's, and unto him we are returning. Then said he, Woe to thee! How shall the marriage be brought about, seeing I mislike to open the matter? And she said, he is yet more ardently in love, and yet more desireful of her than she is of him. And I will so order the affair that he shall be unaware of his case being known to thee. But do not betray thyself, O king. Then she went to Adi, and after acquainting him with everything, said, Make a feast, and bid the king thereto. And when the wine hath gotten the better of him, ask of him his daughter, for he will not refuse thee. Quoth Adi, I fear lest this enrage him against me, and be the cause of enmity between us. But quoth she, I came not to thee till I had settled the whole affair with him. Then she returned to al Nuamin and said to him, Seek of Adi that he entertain thee in his house. Replied the king, There is no harm in that. And after three days besought Adi to give him and his lords the morning meal in his house. He consented, and the king went to him. And when the wine had taken effect on al Nuamin, Adi rose, and sought of him his daughter in wedlock. He consented, and married them, and brought her to him after three days, and they abode at al Nuamin's court in all solace of life and its delight. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Adi abode with Hind bint al Nuamin bin Munzar, three years in all solace of life and its delight, after which time the king was wroth with Adi and slew him. Hind mourned for him with grievous mourning, and built her an ermitage outside the city, whither she retired and became a religious, weeping and bewailing her husband till she died. And her hermitage is seen to this day in the suburbs of Hira. They also tell a tale of... D. Ebel al Kuza e with the lady and Muslim bin al Walid. Quoth D. Ebel al Kuza, I was sitting one day at the gate of al Kark when a damsel came past. Never saw I a fairer faced or better formed than she, walking with a voluptuous swaying gait and ravishing all beholders, with her lithe and undulating pace. Now, as my eyes fell on her, I was captivated by her, and my vitals trembled and meseemed my heart flew forth of my breast. So I stood before her, and I accosted her with this verse. The tears of these eyes find easy release, but sleep flies these eyelids without surcease. Whereon she turned her face, and looking at me straightway, 
made answer with this distich. A trifle this, and his eyes be sore, when her eyes say yes to his love's caprice. I was astounded at the readiness of her reply, and the fluency of her speech, and rejoined with this verse. Say, cloth heart, of my fair inclined to him, whose tears like a swelling stream increase. And she answered me without hesitation thus, If thou crave our love, know that love's alone, and a debt to be paid by us twain apiece. Never entered my ears aught sweeter than her speech, nor ever saw I brighter than her face. So I changed rhyme and rhythm to try her, in my wonder at her words, and repeated this couplet. Will fate with joy of union ever bless our sight, and one desireful one with other one unite? She smiled at this, never saw I fairer than her mouth, nor sweeter than her lips, and answered me without stay or delay in the following distich. Pray tell me what hath fate to do betwixt us twain. Thou art elate, so bless our aim with union and delight. At this I sprang up and fell to kissing her hands, and cried, I had not thought that fortune would vouchsafe me such occasion. Do thou follow me, not of bidding, or against thy will, but of the grace of thee and thy favor to me? Then I went on, and she after me. Now at that time I had no lodging, I deemed fit for the like of her. But Muslim bin al-Walid was my fast friend, and he had a handsome house, so I made for his abode, and knocked at the door, whereupon he came out, and I saluted him, saying, "'Tis for time like this that friends are treasured up? And he replied, With love and gladness, come in, you twain. So we entered, but found money scarce with him. However, he gave me a kerchief, saying, Carry it to the bazaar, and sell it, and buy food, and what else thou needest. I took the handkerchief, and hastening to the market, sold it, and bought what we required of victuals and other matters. But when I returned, I found that Muslim had retired with her to an underground chamber. When he heard my step, he hurried out, and said to me, Allah requite thee the kindness thou hast done me, O Abu Ali, and reward thee in time to come and reckon it of thy good deeds on the day of doom. So saying, he took from me the food and wine, and shut the door in my face. His words enraged me, and I knew not what to do. But he stood behind the door, shaking for mirth, and when he saw me thus, he said to me, I conjure thee on my life, O Abu Ali, tell who it was composed this couplet. I lay in her arms all night, leaving him, to sleep foul-hearted but clean of staff. At this my rage redoubled, and I replied, Who wrote this other couplet? One, I wish him in belt a thousand horns, exceeding in mighty height manaf. Then I began to abuse him, and reproach him with the foulness of his action and his lack of honor. And he was silent, never uttering a word. But when I had finished, he smiled and said, Out on thee, O fool! Thou hast entered my house, and sold my kerchief, and spent my silver. So with whom art thou wroth, O pimp? Then he left me, and went away to her, whilst I said, By Allah, thou art right to twit me as nincompoop and pander. Then I left his door, and went away in sore concern, and I feel its trace in my heart to this very day. For I never had my will of her, nor, indeed, ever heard of her more. And amongst other tales is that about... Isaac of Mosul and the Merchant. Quoth Ishaq bin Ibrahim al Masali, It so chanced that one day, feeling weary of being on duty at the palace and in attendance upon the caliph, I mounted horse and went forth at break of dawn, having a mind to ride out in the open country and take my pleasure. So I said to my servants, If there come a messenger from the caliph or another, Say that I set out at daybreak upon a pressing business, and that ye know not whither I am gone. Then I fared forth alone, and went round about the city, till the sun waxed hot, when I halted in a great thoroughfare known as Al-Haram. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and eighth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ishaq ben Ibrahim the Musali continued, When the sun waxed hot, I halted in a great thoroughfare known as Al-Haram, to take shelter in the shade, and found it in a spacious wing of a house which projected over the street. And I stood there but a little while before there came up a black slave, leading an ass bestridden by a damsel. 
and under her were housings set with gems and pearls, and upon her were the richest of clothes. Richness can go no farther. And I saw that she was elegant of make, with languorous look and graceful mind. I asked one of the passers by who she was, and he said, She is a singer. So I fell in love with her at first sight. Hardly could I keep my seat on horseback. She entered the house at whose gate I stood, and as I was planning a device to gain access to her, there came up two men, young and comely, who asked admission, and the housemaster gave them leave to enter. So they alighted, and I also, and they entered, and I with them, they supposing that the master of the house had invited me. And we sat a while till food was brought, and we ate. Then they set wine before us, and the damsel came out with a lute in her hand. She sang, and we drank, till I rose to obey a call of nature. Thereupon the host questioned the two others of me, and they replied that they knew me not, whereupon quoth he, This is a parasite, but he is a pleasant fellow, so treat him courteously. Then I came back and sat down in my place, whilst the damsel sang to a pleasing air these two couplets. Say to the she-gazelle, who's no gazelle, and cold Ariel, who's no Ariel, who lies with male, and yet no female is, whose gait is female, most unlike the male. She sang it right well, and the company drank, and her song pleased them. Then she carolled various pieces to rare measures, and amongst the rest one of mine, which consisted of this distich. Bare hills and campground desolate, and friends who all have gained their gait, how severance after union leaves me and their homes in saddest state. Her singing this time was even better than the first. Then she chanted other rare pieces, old and new amongst them, another of mine with the following two couplets. Say to angry lover who turns away, and shows thee his side whatso thou, thou wroughtest all that by thee was wrought. Alb, twas haply thy sport and play. I prayed her to repeat the song that I might correct it for her, whereupon one of the two men accosted me and said never saw we a more impudent lick platter than thou art thou not content with a sponging but thou must eke meddle and muddle a very sooth in thee is the saying made true parasite and pushing white so i hung down my head for shame and made him no answer whilst his companion would have withheld him from me but he would not be restrained Presently they rose to pray, but I lagged behind a little, and, taking the lute, screwed up the sides and brought it into perfect tune. Then I stood up in my place to pray with the rest, and when we had ended praying, the same man fell again to blaming and reviling me, and persisted in his rudeness, whilst I held my peace. Thereupon the damsel took the lute, and touching it, knew that it had been altered, and said, who hath touched my lute? Quoth they, None of us have touched it. Quoth she, Nay, by Allah, someone hath touched it, and he is an artist, a past master in the craft, for he hath arranged the strings and tuned them like one who is a perfect performer. Said I, It was I tuned it, and said she, Then Allah upon thee, take it and play on it. So I took it, and playing a piece so difficult and so rare, that it went nigh to deaden the quick and quicken the dead. I sang thereto these couplets. I had a heart, and with it lived my life. T'was seared with fire, and burnt with loving low. I never won the blessing of her love. God would not on his slave such boon bestow. If what I've tasted be the food of love, must taste it all men who love food would know. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section thirteen. Recording by Matt Pagan. Section fourteen, volume five of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 14. When it was the four hundred and ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, 
that Ishak of Mosul thus continued. Now, when I had finished my verse, there was not one of the company but sprang from his place and sat down like schoolboys before me, saying, Allah upon thee, O our Lord, sing us another song. With pleasure, said I, and playing another measure in masterly fashion, sang thereto these couplets. O thou whose heart is melted down by force of amor's fire, and griefs from every side against thy happiness conspire, Unlawful is that he who pierced my vitals with his shaft, my blood between my midriff and my breastbone, he desire. T'was plain upon our severance day that he had set his mind on an eternal parting moved by tongue of envious liar. He sheds my blood he ne'er had shed except by wound of love. Will none demand my blood of him, my wreck of him require? When I had made an end of this song, there was not one of them but rose to his feet and threw himself upon the ground for excess of delight. Then I cast the lute from my hand, but they said, Allah upon thee, do not this wise, but let us hear another song, so Allah Almighty increase thee of his bounty. Replied I, O folk, I will sing you another song, and another, and another, and will tell you who I am. I am Ishak bin Ibrahim al-Musali, and by Allah, I bear myself proudly to the caliph when he seeketh me. Ye have today made me hear abuse from an unmannerly carl such as I loathe, and by Allah I will not speak a word nor sit with you, till ye put yonder quarrelsome churl out from among you. Quoth the fellow's companion to him, This is what I warn thee against, fearing for thy good name. So they hent him by the hand and thrust him out, and I took the lute and sang over again the songs of my own composing which the damsel had sung. Then I whispered the host that she had taken my heart, and that I had no patience to abstain from her. Quoth he, She is thine on one condition. I asked, What is that? And he answered, It is that thou abide with me a month, when the damsel and all belonging to her of raiment and jewelry shall be thine. I rejoined, It is well, I will do this. So I tarried with him a whole month, whilst none knew where I was, and the caliph sought me everywhere, but could come by no news of me. And at the end of this time the merchant delivered to me the damsel, together with all that pertained to her of things of price, and an eunuch to attend upon her. So I brought all that to my lodging, feeling as I were lord of the whole world, for exceeding delight in her. Then I rode forthright to al Mamun, and when I stood in the presence, he said, Woe to thee, O Ishak, where hast thou been? So I acquainted him with the story, and he said, Bring me that man at once. Thereupon I told him where he lived, and he sent and fetched me and questioned him of the case. When he repeated the story, and the caliph said to him, Thou art a man of right, generous mind, and it is only fitting that thou be aided in thy generosity. Then he ordered him an hundred thousand dirhams, and said to me, O Ishak, bring the damsel before me. So I brought her to him, and she sang and delighted him, and being greatly gladdened by her, he said to me, I appoint her turn of service every Thursday, when she must come and sing to me from behind the curtain. And he ordered her fifty thousand dirhams, so by Allah I profited both myself and others by my ride. And amongst the tales they tell is one of the three unfortunate lovers. Quoth al Utbi, I was sitting one day with a company of educated men telling stories of the folk when the talk turned upon legends of lovers, and each of us said his say their aunt. Now there was in our company an old man who remained silent till all had spoken and had no more to say, when, quoth he, Shall I tell you a thing the like of which you never heard? No, never? Yes, quoth we. And he said, Know then that I had a daughter who loved a youth, but we knew it not. While the youth loved a singing girl, who in her turn loved my daughter. One day I was present at an assembly wherein were also the youth. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and tenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the sheikh continued. 
one day i was present at an assembly wherein were also the youth and the singing girl and she chanted to us these couplets prove how love bringeth low lover those tears that run lowering him still the more when pity finds he none cried the youth by allah thou hast said well o my mistress dost thou incite me to die answered the girl from behind the curtain yes if thou be a true lover so he laid his head on a cushion and closed his eyes and when the cup came round to him we shook him and behold he was dead therewith we all flocked to him and our pleasure was troubled and we grieved and broke up at once when i came home my people took in bad part my returning before the appointed time and i told them what had befallen the youth thinking that thereby i should greatly surprise them my daughter heard my words and rising went from the sitting chamber into another whither i followed her and found her lying with her head on a cushion even as i had told of the young man so i shook her and lo she was dead then we laid her out and set forth next morning to bury her whilst the friends of the young man set forth in like guise to bury him as we were on the way to the burial place we met a third funeral and asking whose it was were told that it was that of the singing girl who hearing of my daughter's death had done even as she did and was dead so we buried them all three on one day and this is the rarest tale that ever was heard of lovers and they also tell a tale of how abu hassan break wind they recount that in the city kalkaban of al yaman there was a man of the fazli tribe who had left badawi life and become a townsman for many years and was a merchant of the most opulent merchants his wife had deceased when both were young and his friends were instant with him to marry again ever quoting to him the words of the poet go gossip re-wed thee for prime draweth near a wife is an almanac good for the year so being weary of contention abu hassan entered into negotiations with the old women who procure matches and married a maid like canopus when he hangeth over the seas of al hind he made high festival therefore bidding to the wedding banquet kith and kin olima and fakirs friends and foes and all his acquaintances of that countryside the whole house was thrown open to feasting there were rices of five several colours and sherbets of as many more and kids stuffed with walnuts and almonds and pistachios and a camel colt roasted whole so they ate and drank and made mirth and merriment and the bride was displayed in her seven dresses and one more to the women who could not take their eyes off her at last the bridegroom was summoned to the chamber where she sat enthroned and he rose slowly and with dignity from his divan but in so doing for that he was over full of meat and drink lo and behold he let fly a fart great and terrible thereupon each guest turned to his neighbor and talked aloud and made as though he had heard nothing fearing for his life but a consuming fire was lit in abu hassan's heart so he pretended a call of nature and in lieu of seeking the bride chamber he went down to the house court and saddled his mare and rode off weeping bitterly through the shadow of the night in time he reached lahaj where he found a ship ready to sail for india so he shipped on board and made calicut of malabar here he met with many arabs especially hazramis who recommended him to the king and this king who is a kafir trusted him and advanced him to the captainship of his body guard he remained ten years in all solace and delight of life at the end of which time he was seized with homesickness and the longing to behold his native land was that of a lover pining for his beloved and he came near to die of yearning desire but his appointed day had not dawned so after taking the first bath of health he left the king without leave and in due course landed at makala of hazramat here he donned the rags of a religious and keeping his name and case secret fared for cockabon afoot enduring a thousand hardships of hunger thirst and fatigue and braving a thousand dangers from the lion the snake and the ghoul but when he drew near his old home he looked down upon it from the hills with brimming eyes and said in himself haply they might know thee so i will wander about the outskirts and hearken to the folk 
Allah grant that my case be not remembered by them. He listened carefully for seven nights and seven days, till it so chanced that as he was sitting at the door of a hut, he heard the voice of a young girl, saying, O oh, my mother, tell me the day when I was born, for such an one of my companions is about to take an omen for me. And the mother answered, Thou was born, O my daughter, on the very night when Abu Hassan farted. Now the listener no sooner heard these words than he rose up from the bench and fled away, saying to himself, Verily thy fart hath become a date, which shall last for ever and ever, even as the poet said, As long as palms shall shift the flower, as long as palms shall sift the flower. And he ceased not traveling and voyaging, and returned to India, and there abode in self-exile till he died, and the mercy of Allah be upon him. And they tell another story of the lovers of the Banu Tai. Kasim, son of Adi, was wont to relate that a man of the Banu Tamim spoke as follows. I went out one day in search of an estray, and coming to the waters of the Banu Tay, saw two companies of people near one another, and behold, those of one company were disputing among themselves even as the other. So I watched them and observed in one of the companies a youth wasted with sickness, as he were a worn-out, dried-up water-skin. And as I looked on him, lo, he repeated these couplets. What ails the beauty she returneth not? Is beauty's irk or grudging to my lot? I sickened, and my friends all came to call. What stayed thee calling with a friendly knot? Hadst thou been sick, I had come running fast. To thee nor threats had kept me from the spot. Mid them I miss thee, and I lie alone. Sweetheart, to lose thy love, sad loss I wot. His words were heard by a damsel in the other company, who hastened towards him, and when her people followed her, she fought them off. Then the youth caught sight of her, and sprang up and ran towards her, whilst the people of his party ran after him and laid hold of him. However, he hailed and freed himself from them, and she in like manner loosed herself, and when they were free, each ran to other, and meeting between the two parties, embraced and fell dead upon the ground. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and eleventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the young man and the maid met between the two parties, and embraced, and both fell dead upon the ground, whereat came there out an old man from one of the tents, and stood over them, exclaiming, Verily we are Allah's, and unto him we are returning. Then weeping sore, he said, Allah hath ruth on you both. By the Almighty, though you were not united in your lives, I will at least unite you after your deaths. And he bade lay them out, so they washed them and shrouded them in one shroud, and dug for them one grave, and prayed one prayer over them both, and buried them in one tomb. Nor was there man or woman in the two parties, but I saw weeping over them and buffeting their faces. Then I questioned the sheikh of them, and he said, She was my daughter, and he my brother's son, and love brought them to the pass thou seest. I exclaimed, Allah amend thee, but why didst thou not marry them to each other? Quoth he, I feared shame and dishonor, and now I am fallen into both. And they tell a tale of The Mad Lover. Quoth Abu Labas al-Mubarad, I set out one day with a company to al-Barid on an occasion, and coming to the monastery of Hirakal, we alighted in its shade. Presently a man came out to us and said, There are madmen in the monastery, and amongst them one who speaketh wisdom. If ye saw him, ye would marvel at his speech. So we arose all and went into the monastery, where we saw a man seated on a skin mat in one of the cells with bare head and eyes intently fixed upon the wall. We saluted him, and he returned our salam without looking at us, and one said to us, Repeat some verses to him, for when he heareth verse he speaketh. So I repeated these two couplets. O best of race to whom gave Hawa boon of birth, 
except for thee the world were neither sweet nor fair. Thou art he whose face by Allah shown to man doth ward off death, decay, and hoary hair. When he heard from me this praise of the apostle, he turned towards us and repeated these lines. Well, Allah wotteth I am sorely plagued, nor can I show my pain to human sight. Two souls have I, one soul is here contained, while other woneth in another sight. Meseems the absent souls like present soul, and that she suffers what to me is dight. Then he asked us, Have I said well or said ill? And we answered, Thou hast said the clean contrary of ill, well, and right well. Then he put out his hand to a stone that was by him and took it up, whereupon, thinking he would throw it at us, we fled from him. But he fell to beating upon his breast there with violent blows, and said to us, Fear not, but draw near and hear somewhat from me, and receive it from me. So we came back, and he repeated these couplets. When they made their camel's yellow white kneel down at dawning gray, they mounted her on crooper, and the camel went his way. Mine eyeballs through the prison wall beheld them, and I cried with streaming eyelids and a heart that burned in dire dismay, O camel driver, turn thy beast, that I farewell my love. In parting and farewelling her I see my doomed day. I'm faithful to my vows of love, which I have never broke. Would heaven I kenned what they have done with vows that vowed they. Then he looked at me and said, Say me, dost thou know what they did? Answered I, Yes, they are dead. Almighty Allah have mercy on them. At this his face changed, and he sprang to his feet and cried out, How knowest thou they be dead? And I replied, Were they alive, they had not left thee thus. Quoth he, by Allah, thou art right, and I care not to live after them. Then his side muscles quivered, and he fell on his face, and we ran up to him and shook him and found him dead. The mercy of the Almighty be on him. At this we marveled and mourned for him, and sore mourning laid him out and buried him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twelfth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that al Mubarad thus continued. When the man fell, we mourned over him with sore mourning, and laid him out and buried him. And when I returned to Baghdad, and went in to the Caliph al Mutawakil, he saw the trace of tears on my face, and said to me, What is this? So I told him what had passed, and it was grievous to him, and he cried, What moved thee to deal thus with him? By Allah, if I thought thou didst not repent it and regret him, I would punish thee therefore. And he mourned for him the rest of the day. And amongst the tales they tell is one of the prior who became a Muslim. Quoth Abu Bakir Muhammad ibn al-Anbari, I once left Anbar on a journey to Amuriyah, where there came out to me the prior of the monastery and superior of the monkery abd al masi hight and brought me into the building there i found forty religious who entertained me that night with fair guest right and i left them after seeing among them such diligence in adoration and devotion as i never beheld the like of in any others next day i farewelled them and fared forth and after doing my business at amuriyah I returned to my home at Anbar. And next year I made pilgrimage to Mecca, and as I was circumambulating the holy house, I saw Abd al Masi, the monk also compassing the Kaaba, and with him five of his fellows, the shavelings. Now, when I was sure that it was indeed he, I accosted him, saying, Art thou not Abd al Masi, the religious? And he replied, Nay, I am Abdallah, the desirous. Therewith I fell to kissing his gray hairs and shedding tears. Then taking him by the hand, I led him aside into a corner of the temple and said to him, Tell me the cause of thy conversion to all Islam. And he made reply, Verily, twas a wonder of wonders, and befell thus. 
a company of Muslim devotees came to the village wherein is our convent, and sent a youth to buy them food. He saw in the market a Christian damsel selling bread, who was of the fairest of women, and he was struck at first sight with such love of her that his senses failed him, and he fell on his face in a fainting fit. When he revived, he returned to his companions and told them what had befallen him, saying, Go ye about your business, I may not go with you. They chided him and exhorted him, but he paid no heed to them. So they left him whilst he entered the village and seated himself at the door of the woman's booth. She asked him what he wanted, and he told her that he was in love with her, whereupon she turned from him. But he abode in his place three days without tasting food, keeping his eyes fixed on her face. Now when as she saw that he departed not from her, she went to her people and acquainted them with his case, and they set on him the village boys, who stoned him and bruised his ribs and broke his head. But for all this he would not budge. Then the villagers took counsel together to slay him. But a man of them came to me and told me of his case, and I went to him and found him lying prostrate on the ground. So I wiped the blood from his face and carried him to the convent, and dressed his wounds, and there he abode with me fourteen days. But as soon as he could walk, he left the monastery. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 14Section 15, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 5, Section 15 When it was the four hundred and thirteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Abdullah the religious continued. So I carried him to the convent, and dressed his wounds, and he abode with me fourteen days. But as soon as he could walk, he left the monastery, and returned to the door of the woman's booth, where he sat gazing on her as before. When she saw him, she came out to him, and said, By Allah, thou movest me to pity. Wilt thou enter my faith, that I may marry thee? He cried, Allah forbid that I should put off the faith of unity and enter that of plurality. Quoth she, Come in with me to my house, and take thy will of me, and wend thy ways in peace. Quoth he, Not so, I will not waste the worship of twelve years for the lust of an eye-twinkle. Said she, Then depart from me forthwith. And he said, My heart will not suffer me to do that. Whereupon she turned her countenance from him. Presently the boys found him out, and began to pelt him with stones. And he fell on his face, saying, Verily, Allah is my protector, who sent down the book of the Koran, and he protecteth the righteous. At this I sallied forth, and driving away the boys, lifted his head from the ground, and heard him say, Allah mine, unite me with her in paradise. Then I carried him to the monastery, but he died before I could reach it. And I bore him without the village, and I dug for him a grave and buried him. And next night, when half of it was spent, the damsel cried with a great cry, and she in her bed. So the villagers flocked to her and questioned her of her case. Quoth she, As I slept, behold, the Mosul man came in to me, and taking me by the hand, carried me to the gate of paradise. But the guardian denied me entrance, saying, Tis forbidden to unbelievers. So I embraced all Islam at his hands, and, entering with him, beheld therein pavilions and trees, such as I cannot describe to you. Moreover, he brought me to a pavilion of jewels, and said to me, Of a truth, this is my pavilion and thine, nor will I enter it save with thee. But after five nights thou shalt be with me therein, if it be the will of Allah Almighty. Then he put forth his hand to a tree, which grew at the door of the pavilion, and plucked therefrom two apples, and gave them to me, saying, Eat this, and keep the other, that the monks may see it. So I ate one of them, and never tasted I aught sweeter. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fourteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the woman continued. So he plucked two apples and gave them to me, saying, Eat this, and keep the other, that the monks may see it. So I ate one of them, and never tasted I aught sweeter. 
Then he took my hand and fared forth and carried me back to my house. And when I awoke, I found the taste of the apple in my mouth and the other in my hand. So saying, she brought out the apple, and in the darkness of the night it shone as it were a sparkling star. So they carried her, and the apple with her, to the monastery, where she repeated her vision and showed it to us. Never saw we its like among all the fruits of the world. Then I took a knife and cut the apple into pieces according as we were folk in company, and never knew we aught more delicious than its savour, nor more delightsome than its scent. But we said, Haply this was a devil that appeared unto her to seduce her from her faith. Thereupon her people took her and went away. But she abstained from eating and drinking, and on the fifth night she rose from her bed, and going forth the village to the grave of her Muslim lover, threw herself upon it and died, her family not knowing what was come of her. But on the morrow there came to the village two Muslim elders, clad in hair cloth, and with them two women in light garb, and said, O people of the village, with you is a woman saint, a walia of the friends of Allah, who died a Muslimah, and we will take charge of her in lieu of you. So the villagers sought her and found her dead on the Muslim's grave, and they said, This was one of us, and she died in our faith, so we will take charge of her. Rejoined the two old men, Nay, she died a Muslimah, and we claim her. And the dispute waxed to a quarrel between them, till one of the sheikhs said, Be this the test of her faith. The forty monks of the monastery shall come and try to lift her from the grave. If they succeed, then she died a Nazarene. If not, one of us shall come and lift her up, and if she be lifted by him, she died a Muslimah. The villagers agreed to this, and fetched the forty monks, who heartened one another and came to her to lift her, but could not. Then we tied a great rope round her middle and hailed at it, but the rope broke in sunder, and she stirred not, and the villagers came and did the like but could not move her from her place. At last, when all means failed, we said to one of the two sheikhs, Come thou and lift her. So he went up to the grave, and, covering her with his mantle, said, In the name of Allah the Compassionating, the Compassionate, and of the faith of the Apostle of Allah, on whom be prayers and peace. Then he lifted her, and taking her in his bosom, betook himself with her to a cave hard by where they laid her and the two women came and washed her and shrouded her. Then the two elders bore her to her Muslim lover's grave, and prayed over her, and buried her by his side, and went their ways. Now we were eyewitnesses of all this, and when we were alone with one another, we said, In sooth, the truth is most worthy to be followed, and indeed the verity hath been made manifest to us. Nor is there a proof more patent of the truth of all Islam than that we have seen this day with our eyes. So I and all the monks became Muslims, and on likewise did the villagers. And we sent to the people of Mesopotamia for a doctor of the law, to instruct us in the ordinances of all Islam and the canons of the faith. They sent us a learned man and a pious, who taught us the rites of prayer and the tenets of the faith, and we are now in ease abounding, so to Allah be the praise and the thanks. And they also tell a tale of... The Loves of Abu Isa and Kurat al Ain. Quoth Amru bin Masada, Abu Isa, son of al Rashid and brother to al Mamun, was enamoured of one Kurat al Ain, a slave girl belonging to Ali bin Hashim, and she also loved him, but he concealed his passion, complaining of it to none, neither discovering his secret to any one of his pride and magnanimity. For he had used his utmost endeavour to purchase her of her master, but he had failed. At last, when his patience was at an end, and his passion was sore on him, and he was helpless in the matter, he went in to al Mamun one day of state after the folk had retired, and said to him, O commander of the faithful, if thou wilt this day make trial of thine alcaides by taking them unawares, thou wilt know the generous from the mean, and note each one's place after the quality of his mind. But in saying this, he proposed only to sit with Kurat al Ain in her lord's house. Quoth al Mamun, Right is thy recking, and bade make ready a barge called the Flyer, wherein he embarked with Abu Isa and a party of his chief officers. The first mansion he visited unexpectedly was that of Hamid al Tawil of Tus, whom he found seated. 
and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fifteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that al Mamun embarked with his chief officers and fared on till they reached the mansion of Hamid al Tawil of Tus, and unexpectedly entering, they found him seated on a mat, and before him singers and players with lutes and flagellots and other instruments of music in their hands. So al Mamun sat with him a while, and presently he set before him dishes of nothing but flesh meat, with no birds among them. The caliph would not taste thereof, and Abu Isa said to him, O commander of the faithful, we have taken the owner of this place unawares, and he knew not of thy coming. But now let us go to another place which is prepared for thee and fitted for thee. Thereupon the caliph arose and betook himself with his brother Abu Isa and his suite to the abode of Ali son of Hashim, who, on hearing of their approach, came out and received them with the goodliest of reception, and kissed the earth before the king. Then he brought them into his mansion and opened to them a saloon than which Seir never saw a goodlier. Its floors, pillars, and walls were of many colored marbles, adorned with Greek paintings, and it was spread with matting of Sindh, whereon were carpets and tapestry of Bassara make, fitted to the length and breadth of the room. So the caliph sat a while, examining the house and its ceilings and walls, then said, Give us somewhat to eat. So they brought him forthwith nearly an hundred dishes of poultry besides other birds and brewesses, fritters and cooling marinades. When he had eaten, he said, Give us something to drink, O Ali. And the host set before him in vessels of gold and silver and crystal, raisin wine boiled down to one-third with fruits and spices. And the cup-bearers were pages like moons, clad in garments of Alexandrian stuff, interwoven with gold, and bearing on their breasts beakers of crystal, full of rose-water mingled with musk. So al-Mamun marveled with exceeding marvel at all he saw, and said, Ho thou, Abu al-Hasan! Whereupon Ali sprang to the caliph's carpet, and kissing it, said, At thy service, O commander of the faithful, and stood before him. Quoth al-Mamun, Let us hear some pleasant and merry song. Replied Ali, I hear and obey, O commander of the faithful and said to one of his eunuchs, Fetch the singing women. So the slave went out and presently returned, followed by ten castratos bearing ten stools of gold, which they set down in due order. And after these came ten damsels, concubines of the master, as they were shining full moons or gardens full of bloom, clad in black brocade, with crowns of gold on their heads. And they passed along the room till they sat down on the stools when sang they sundry songs. Al Mamun looked at one of them, and being captivated by her elegance and fair favor, asked her, What is thy name, O damsel? And she answered, My name is Sajahi, O commander of the faithful. And he said, Sing to us, O Sajahi. So she played a lively measure and sang these couplets I walk for fear of interview the weakling's walk, who sees two lion whelps the fount draw nigh. My cloak acts sword. My heart's perplexed with fright, lest jealous hostile eyes the approach descry, till sudden hapt I on a delicate maid, like desert doe that fails her fawns to espy. Quoth the caliph, Thou hast done well, O damsel, whose are these lines? She answered, Written by Amru bin Madi Karib al Zubaydi, and the air is Ma Abid's. Then the caliph and Abu Isa and Ali drank, and the damsels went away and were succeeded by other ten, all clad in flowered silk of al Yaman, brocaded with gold, who sat down on the chairs and sang various songs. The caliph looked at one of the concubines, who was like a wild heifer of the waste, and said to her, What is thy name, O damsel? She replied, My name is Zabiya, O commander of the faithful. And he, Sing to us, Zabiya. So she warbled like a bird with many a trill, and sang these two couplets. Hauris and high-born dames who feel no fear of men, like Meccan game forbidden man to slam. Their soft sweet voices make you deem them whores, but bars them from all whoring all Islam. When she had finished, al Mamun cried, Favored of Allah art thou. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say.
when it was the four hundred and sixteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the slave girl finished her song, al Mamun cried, Favored of Allah art thou, whose is this verse? And she answered, Jarir's, and the air is by Ibn Suraj. Then the caliph and his company drank, whilst the girls went away, and there came forth yet other ten, as they were rubies, robed in bread brocade, inwoven with gold, and purfled with pearls and jewels, whilst all their heads were bare. They sat down on the stools, and sang various airs. So the caliph looked at one of them, who was like the son of the day, and asked her, What is thy name, O damsel? And she answered, O commander of the faithful, my name is Fatin. Sing to us, O Fatin, quoth he, whereat she played a lively measure and sang these couplets. Deign grant thy favors, since tis time I were engraced. To nuff of severance hath it been my lot to taste. Thou art he whose face cloth every gift and charm unite. Yet is my patience spent for that twas sore misplaced. I've wasted life in loving thee, and would high heaven grant me one meeting hour for all this willful waste. Well sung, O Fatin, exclaimed the caliph, whose verse is this? And she answered, Adi bin Zaids, and the air is antique. Then all three drank, whilst the damsels retired and were succeeded by other ten maidens, as they were sparkling stars clad in flowered silk, embroidered with red gold, and girt with jeweled zones. They sat down and sang various motives, and the caliph asked one of them, who was like a wand of willow, What is thy name, O damsel? And she answered, My name is Rasha, O commander of the faithful. Sing to us, O Rasha, quoth he. So she played a lively measure and sang these couplets. And one like Hauri, who can passion heal, like young gazelle that paceth o'er the plain, I drain this wine cup on the toast her cheek, each cup disputing till she bends in twain. Then sleeps the night with me the while I cry, This the only gain my soul would gain. Said the caliph, Well done, O damsel, sing us something more. So she rose, and kissing the ground before him, sang the following distich. She came out to gaze on the bridal at ease in a ship that reeked of amber grease. The caliph was highly pleased with this couplet, and when the slave girl saw how much it delighted him, she repeated it several times. Then said al Mamun, Bring up the flyer, being minded to embark and depart. But Ali bin Hashim said to him, O commander of the faithful, I have a slave girl whom I bought for ten thousand deniers. She hath taken my heart in whole and part, and I would fain display her to the commander of the faithful. If she please him and he will accept of her, she is his, and if not, let him hear something from her. Said the caliph, Bring her to me. And forth came a damsel, as she were a branchlet of willow, with seducing eyes and eyebrows set like twin bows, and on her head she wore a crown of red gold crusted with pearls and jeweled, under which was a fillet bearing this couplet, wrought in letters of chrysolite. A jinnia this with her gin to show, how to pierce man's heart with a stringless bow. The handmaiden walked with the gait of a gazelle in flight, and fit to damn a devotee, till she came to a chair, whereon she seated herself. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and seventeenth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the handmaiden walked with the gait of a gazelle in flight, fit to damn a devotee, till she came to a chair, whereon she seated herself. And al Mamun marvelled at her beauty and loveliness. But when Abu Isa saw her, his heart throbbed with pain, his colour changed to pale, and wan, and he was in evil case. Asked the caliph, O Abu Isa, what aileth thee to change thus? And he answered, O commander of the faithful, it is because of a twitch that seizeth me betimes. Quoth the caliph, Hast thou known yonder damsel before today? Quoth he, Yes, O commander of the faithful, can the moon be concealed? Then said al Mamun to her, What is thy name, O damsel? And she replied, My name is Kurat al-Ain, O commander of the faithful. 
And he rejoined, Sing to us, O Karat al Ain. So she sang these two couplets. The loved ones left thee in middle night, And fared with the pilgrims when dawn shone bright. The tents of pride round the domes they pitched, And with broidered curtains were veiled for sight. Quoth the caliph, Favored of heaven art thou, O Karat al Ain. Whose song is that? Whereto she answered, The words are by Di'ibul al Kuzai, and the air is by Zorzor al Sakhir. Abu Isa looked at her, and his tears choked him, so that the company marveled at him. Then she turned to al Mamun and said to him, O commander of the faithful, wilt thou give me leave to change the words? said he, Sing what thou wilt. So she played a merry measure and caroled these couplets. If thou should please a friend who pleaseth thee, frankly in public practice secrecy, and spurn the slanderer's tale who seldom seeks except the severance of true love to see, they say when lover's near he tires of love, and absence is for love best remedy. Both cures we tried, and yet we are not cured, with all we judge that nearness easier be. Yet nearness is of no avail when he thou lovest lends thee love unwillingly. But when she had finished, Abu Isa said, O commander of the faithful! And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 15「The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night」Volume 5, Section 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 5, Section 16 When it was the 418th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Kurat al Ain had finished her verse, Abu Isa said, O commander of the faithful, though we endure disgrace, we shall be at ease. Dost thou give me leave to reply to her? Quoth the caliph, Yes, say what thou wilt to her. So he swallowed his tears and sang these two distichs. Silent I woned and never owned my love, but from my heart I hid love's blissful boon. Yet if my eyes should manifest my love, Tis for my nearness to the shining moon. Then Kurat al Ain took the lute and played a lively tune and rejoined with these couplets And what thou claimest were the real truth, with only hope content thou hadst not been, nor couldst patient live without the girl, so rare of inner grace and outward mien. But there is nothing in the claim of thee at all save tongue and talk that little me. When Abu Isa heard this, he fell to weeping and wailing, and evidencing his trouble and anguish. Then he raised his eyes to her, and sighing, repeated these couplets. Under my raiment a waste body lies, and in my spirit all compromising cries. I have a heart whose pain shall I endure, and tears like torrents pour these woeful eyes. When e'er a wise man spies me, straight he chides. Love, that misleads me thus in ways unwise. O Lord, I lack the power this dole to bear. Come sudden death or joy in bestest guise. When he had ended, Ali bin Hisham sprang up and kissing his feet said, O my Lord, Allah hearing thy secret hath answered thy prayer and consenteth to thy taking her with all she hath of things rare and fair. So the commander of the faithful have no mind to her. Quoth al Mamun, Had we a mind to her, we would prefer Abu Isa before ourselves and help him to his desire. So saying, he rose and embarking went away, whilst Abu Isa tarried for Qurat al Ain whom he took and carried to his own house, his breast swelling with joy. See then the generosity of Ali, son of Hisham. And they tell a tale of Al-Amin, son of Al-Rashid, and his uncle Ibrahim bin Al-Mahdi. Al-Amin, brother of Al-Mamun, 
once entered the house of his uncle Ibrahim bin al-Mahdi, where he saw a slave girl playing upon the lute, and she being one of the fairest of women, his heart inclined to her. Ibrahim, seeing how it was with him, sent the girl to him with rich raiment and precious ornaments. When he saw her, he thought that his uncle had lain with her, so he was loath to have to do with her. Because of that, and accepting what came with her, sent her back to Ibrahim. His uncle learnt the cause of this from one of Al-Amin's eunuchs. So he took a shift of watered silk and worked upon its skirt in letters of gold these two couplets. No, I declare by him to whom all bow, of nothing neath her petticoat I trow, nor meddle with her mouth, nor aught did I, but see and hear her, and it was enow. Then he clad her in the shift, and, giving her a lute, sent her back again to his nephew. When she came into Al Amin's presence, she kissed ground before him, and tuning the lute, sang thereto these two couplets. Thy breast thou bearedest, sending back the gift, showing unlove for me without and shift. And thou bear spite of past the past forgive, and for the caliphate cast the past adrift. When she had made an end of her verse, Al Amin looked at her and, seeing what was upon her skirt, could no longer control himself. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and nineteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Al Amin looked at the damsel and saw what was upon her skirt, he could no longer control himself, but drew near unto her and kissed her and appointed her a separate lodging in his palace. Moreover, he thanked his uncle for this and bestowed on him the government of Gray. And a tale is told of Al Fath bin Kakin and the Caliph Al Mutawakal. Al Mutawakal was once taking medicine and folks sent him by way of solace all sorts of presents and rarities and things costly and precious. Amongst others, Al-Fath bin Kakin sent him a virgin slave, high-breasted, of the fairest among women of her time, and with her a vase of crystal containing ruddy wine and a goblet of red gold, whereon were graven in black these couplets. Since our imam came forth from medicine, which made him health and hardiness rewin, there is no healing draught more sovereign than well-boiled wine this golden goblet in. Then let him break the seal for him secured, tis best prescription after medicine. Now when the damsel entered, the physician Johanna was with the caliph, and as he read the couplets, he smiled and said, By Allah, O commander of the faithful, Fath is better versed than I in the art of healing, so let not the prince of true believers gainsay his prescription. According, the caliph followed the recipe contained in the poetry and was made whole by the blessing of Allah and won his every wish. And among tales they tell is one of the man's dispute with the learned woman concerning the relative excellence of male and female. Quoth a certain man of learning, I never saw amongst womankind one wittier and wiser, better read, and by nature more generously bred, and in manners and morals more perfected than a preacher of the people of Baghdad by name Sit al Masha'ik. It chanced that she came to Hamas city in the year of the flight 561, and there delivered salutary exhortations to the folk from the professorial chair. Now there used to visit her house a number of students of divinity and persons of learning and polite letters who would discuss with her questions of theology and dispute with her on controversial points. I went to her one day with a friend of mine, a man of years and education, and when we had taken our seats, she set before us a dish of fruit and seated herself behind a curtain. Now she had a brother, a handsome youth, who stood behind us to serve us. And when we had eaten, we fell to disputing upon points of divinity, and I propounded to her a theological question bearing upon a difference between the imams, the founders of the four schools. She proceeded to speak in answer whilst I listened, but all the while my friend fell to looking upon her brother's face and admiring his beauties without paying any heed to what she discoursed. Now as she was watching him from behind the curtain, 
when she had made an end of her speech, she turned to him and said, Methinks thou be of those who give men the preference over women. He replied, Assuredly. And she asked, And why so? Whereto he answered, For that Allah hath made the masculine worthier than the feminine. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twentieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the sheikh replied, For that Allah hath made the masculine worthier than the feminine, and I like the excelling and mislike the excelled. She laughed and presently said, Wilt thou deal fairly with me in debate if I battle the matter with thee? And he rejoined, Yes. Then quoth she, What is the evidence of the superiority of the male to the female? Quoth he, It is of two kinds, traditional and reasonable. The authoritative part deriveth from the Quran and the traditions of the Apostle. As for the first, we have the very words of Almighty Allah, Men shall have the preeminence above women because of those advantages wherein Allah hath caused the one of them to excel the other. And again, if there be not two men, let there be one man and two women. And again, when treating of inheritance, if there be brothers and sisters, let a male have as much as the portion of two females. Thus Allah, extolled and exalted be he, hath in these places preferred the male over the female, and teacheth that a woman is as the half of a man, for that he is worthier than she. As for the Sunnah traditions, is it not reported of the Prophet, whom Allah save and assain, that he appointed the blood money for a woman to be half that of a man? And as for the evidence of reason, the male is the agent and active, and the female the patient and passive. Rejoined she, Thou hast said well, O my Lord, but by Allah thou hast proved my contention with thine own lips, and hast advanced evidence which telleth against thee, and not for thee. And thus it is, Allah, extolled and exalted be he, preferred the male above the female solely because of the inherent condition and essential quality of masculinity. And in this there is no dispute between us. Now this quality of malehood is common to the child, the boy, the youth, the adult, and the old man. Nor is there any distinction between them in this. If then the superior excellence of male masculine belong to him solely by virtue of manhood, it behooveth that thy heart incline and thy soul delight in the gray beard equally with the boy, seeing that there is no distinction between them in point of malehood. But the difference between thee and me turneth upon the accident of qualities that are sought as constituting the pleasure of intercourse in its enjoyment. And thou hast adduced no proof of the superiority of the youth over the young girl in this matter of non-essentials. He made answer, O reverend lady, knowest thou not that which is peculiar to the youth of limber shape and rosy cheeks and pleasant smile and sweetness of speech? Youths are, in these respects, superior to women, and the proof of this is what they traditionally report of the Prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve, that he said, Stay not thy gaze upon the beardless, for in them is a momentary eye glance at the black-eyed girls of paradise. Nor indeed is the superiority of the lad over the lass hidden to any of mankind, and how well saith Abu Nawaz. The least of him is the being free from monthly courses and pregnancy. And the saying of another poet, Quoth our Imam Abu Nawas, who was, for mad debauch and waggishness renowned, O tribe that loves the cheeks of boys take fill, of joys in paradise shall ne'er be found. So if any one enlarge in praise of a slave girl and wish to enhance her value by the mention of her beauties, he likened her to a youth. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 16. Section 17, volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights in the Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Volume 5, Section 17.
When it was the four hundred and twenty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the shaykh continued. So if any one enlarge in praise of a slave girl and wish to enhance her value by the mention of her beauties, he likeneth her to a youth, because of the illustrious qualities that belong to the male, even as saith the poet, Boy like of backside in the deed of kind, she sways as sways the wand like bows a wind. And youths then were not better and fairer than girls, why should these be likened to them? And know also, Almighty Allah preserve thee, that a youth is easy to be led, adapting himself to every reed, pleasant of converse and manners, inclining to assent rather than dissent, especially when his side face is newly downed, and his upper lip is first and browned, and the purple lights of youth on his cheeks abound, so that he is like the full moon sound. And how goodly is the saying of Abu Tamam! The slanderers said, There's hair upon his cheeks. Quoth I, Exceed not, that's no blemish there, when he could bear that hailing of his hips, and pearl beads shaded by mustachio hair. And Rose swore solemn holiest oath that is, from that fair cheek she never more would fare. I spoke with eyelids without need of speech, and they who answered me his eyebrows were. He's even fairer than thou knewest him, and cheek down guards from all would over dare. Brighter and sweeter now are grown his charms, since down robes lip and cheek before were bare. And those who blame me for my love of him, when him they mention say of him, Thy fair. End quoth, Al Hariri, and quoth excellently well. My censors say, What means this pine for him? Seest not the flowing hair on cheeks a flowing? I say, By Allah, and ye deem I dote, look at the truth in those fine eyes a showing. But for the down that veils his cheek and chin, his brow had dazed all eyes, no sight allowing. And whoso sojourns in a growthless land, how shall he move from land fair growths a-growing? And quoth another, My blamers say of me, he is consoled, and lie, no consolation comes to those who pine and sigh. I had no solace when rose bloomed alone on cheek, now basil blooms thereon, and now consoled am I. And again, slim-waisted one whose looks with down of cheek in slaughtering mankind each other hurtle, with the narcissus blade he sheddeth blood, the baldric of whose sheath is freshest myrtle. And again, not with his must I'm drunk, but verily, those curls turn manly heads like newest wine. Each of his beauties envies each and all, would be the silky down on side face line. Such are the excellencies of the youth which women do not own, and they more than suffice to give those the preference over these. She replied, Allah give thee health, verily thou hast imposed the debate upon thyself, and thou hast spoken, and hast not stinted, and hast brought proofs to support every assertion. But now is the truth become manifest. So swerve thou not from the path thereof, and if thou be not content with a summary of evidence, I will set it before thee in fullest detail. Allah upon thee, where is the youth beside the girl, and who shall compare kid and wild cow? The girl is soft of speech, fair of form, like a branchlet of basil, with teeth like chamomile petals, and hair like halters wherefrom to hang hearts. Her cheeks are like blood-red anemones, and her face like a pippin. She hath lips like wine, and breasts like pomegranates twain, and a shape supple as a rattan cane. Her body is well formed, and with sloping shoulders dight. She hath a nose like the edge of a sword shining bright, and a forehead brilliant white, and eyebrows which unite, and eyes stained by nature's hand black as night. If she speak, fresh young pearls are scattered from her mouth forthright, and all hearts are ravished by the daintiness of her sprite. When she smileth, thou wouldst ween the moon shone out her lips between, 
and when she eyes thee, sword blades flash from the babes of her eyes. In her all beauties to conclusion come, and she is the center of attraction to traveller and stay-at-home. She hath two lips of cremoisy than cream smoother, and of taste than honey sweeter. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twenty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the preacher woman thus pursued her theme in the praise of fair maids. She hath two lips of cremosy than cream smoother, and than honey sweeter, adding, And she hath a bosom, as it were a way two hills between which are a pair of breasts like globes of ivory sheen, likewise a stomach right smooth, flanks soft as the palm spathe, and creased with folds and dimples which overlap one another, and liberal thighs which like columns of pearl arise, and back parts which billow and beat together like seas of glass or mountains of glance and two feet and hands of gracious mould like unto ingots of virgin gold. So, O miserable, where are mortal men beside the jinn? Knowest thou not that puissant princes and potent kings before women ever humbly bend, and on them for delight depend? Verily, they may say, We rule over necks and rob hearts. These women, how many a rich man have they not paupered? How many a powerful man have they not prostrated, and how many a superior man have they not enslaved? Indeed, they seduce the sage and send the saint to shame, and bring the wealthy to want, and plunge the fortune favored into penury. Yet for all this, the wise but redouble in affection of them and honor. Nor do they count this oppression or dishonor. How many a man for them hath offended his maker, and called down on himself the wrath of his father and mother, and all this because of the conquest of their love over hearts. Knowest thou not, O wretched one, that for them are built pavilions, and slave girls are for sale, that for them tear floods rail, and for them are collected jewels of price, and ambergris, and musk odoriferous? And armies are arrayed, and pleasances made, and wealth heaped up and smitten off as many a head. And indeed, he spoke sooth in the words, Whoso saith the world meaneth woman. Now as for thy citation from the holy traditions, it is an argument against thee and not for thee, in that the prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve, compareth the beardless with the black-eyed girls of paradise. Now, doubtless, the subject of comparison is worthier than the object therewith compared. So unless women be the worthier and the goodlier, wherefore should other than they be likened to them? As for thy saying that girls are likened to boys, the case is not so, but the contrary, boys are likened to girls. For folk say, yonder boy is like a girl. As for what proof thou quotest from the poets, the verses were the product of a complexion unnatural in this respect. And as for the habitual sodomites and catamites, offenders against religion, Almighty Allah hath condemned them in his holy book. Herein he denounceth their filthy practices, saying, Do ye approach unto the males among mankind, and leave your wives which your Lord hath created for you? Surely ye are a people who transgress. These it is that liken girls to boys of their exceeding profligacy and ungraciousness and inclination to follow the fiend and own lusts, so that they say, She is apt for two tricks, and these are all wanderers from the way of right and the righteous. Quoth their chief Abu Nawas, Slim waist and boyish wit's delight, wencher as well as sodomite. As for what thou sayest of a youth's first hair on cheek and lips, and how they add to his beauty and loveliness, by Allah thou strayest from the straight path of sooth, and sayest that which is other than the truth. For whiskers change the charms of the comely into ugliness. Quoting these couplets, That sprouting hair upon his face took reek, for lover's vengeance all did vainly seek. 
I see not on his face a sign fuliginous, except his curls are hue of reek. If so, his paper mostly be begrimed, where deemest thou the reed shall draw a streak? If any raise him other fares above, this only proves the judge of wits is weak. And when she ended her verse, she resumed, Laud be to Allah Almighty. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twenty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the preacher woman ended her verse, she resumed, addressing the man, Laud to Allah Almighty, how can it be hid from thee that the perfect pleasure is in women, and that abiding blessings are not to be found but with them, seeing that Allah, extolled and exalted be he, hath promised his prophets and saints black-eyed damsels in paradise, and hath appointed these for a recompense of their godly works. And had the Almighty known that the joy supreme was in the possession of other than women, he had rewarded them therewith and promised it to them. And quoth he, whom Allah bless and preserve, The things I hold dearest of the things of your world are three, women and perfume and the solace of my eyes in prayer. Verily, Allah hath appointed boys to serve his prophets and saints in paradise, because paradise is the abode of joy and delight, which could not be complete without the service of youths. But as to the use of them for aught but service, it is hell's putridity and corruption and turpitude. How well, saith the poet, Men's turning unto bums of boys is bumptious. Whoso love noble women show their own noblesse. How many goodly whites have slept the night enjoying, buttocks of boys, and woke at morn in foulest mess. Their garment stained by safflower, which is yellow murd, their shame proclaiming, showing color of distress. Who can deny the charge, when so be ride are they, that e'en by daylight shows the dung upon their dress? What contrast with the man who slept a gladsome night, by hourly made for glance a mere enchantress? He rises off her borrowing wholesome bonny scent that fills the house with whiffs of perfumed goodliness. No boy deserved place by side of her to hold, canst even a lowe's wood with what fills pool of cess. Then said she, O folk, ye have made me to break the bounds of modesty and the circle of free-born women, and indulge in idle talk of chambering and wantonness which beseemeth not people of learning. But the breasts of free-borns are the sepulchres of secrets, and such conversations are in confidence. Moreover, actions are according to intentions, and I crave pardon of Allah for myself, and you and all Muslims, seeing that he is the pardoner and the compassionate. Then she held her peace, and thereafter would answer us of naught. So we went our way, rejoicing in that we had profited by her contention, and yet sorrowing to part from her. And among the tales they tell is one of Abu Suwaid and the Pretty Old Woman. Quoth Abu Suwaid, I and a company of my friends entered a garden one day to buy somewhat of fruit, and we saw in a corner an old woman who was bright of face, but her head hair was white and she was combing it with an ivory comb. We stopped before her, yet she paid no heed to us, neither veiled her face. So I said to her, O old woman, wert thou to dye thy hair black, thou wouldst be handsomer than a girl. What hindereth thee from this? She raised her head towards me, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twenty-fourth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Abu Suwaid continued. When I spake these words to the ancient dame, she raised her head towards me, and opening wide her eyes, recited these two couplets. I died what years have died, but this my staining. Last not while that of days is I remaining. Days when be clad in gear of youth I fared, raked fore and aft by men with joy unfeigning. I cried, By Allah, favored art thou for an old woman. How sincere art thou in thine afterpine for forbidden pleasures, 
and how false is thy pretense of repentance from frowardness. And another tale is that of the Amir Ali bin Tahir and the girl Munis. Once on a time was displayed for sale to Ali bin Muhammad bin Abdullah bin Tahir, a slave girl called Munis, who was superior to her fellows in beauty and breeding, and to boot an accomplished poetess. And he asked her of her name. Replied she, Allah advanced the emir, my name is Munis. Now he knew this before, so he bowed his head a while, then raising his eyes to her, recited this verse. What sayest of one by a sickness caught, for the love of thy love, till he waxed distraught? Answered she, Allah exalt the emir, and recited this verse in reply. If we saw a lover who pains as he ought, with love we would grant him all favors he sought. She pleased him, so he bought her for seventy thousand dirhams, and begat on her obeyed Allah bin Muhammad, afterwards minister of police. And we are told by Abu al Aina a tale of the woman who had a boy and the other who had a man to love her. Quoth Abu al Aina, There were in our street two women, one of whom had for lover a man, and the other a beardless youth. And they foregathered one night on the terrace roof of a house adjoining mine, knowing not that I was near. Quoth the boy's lover to the other, O my sister, how canst thou bear with patience the harshness of thy lover's beard as it falleth on thy breast, when he busseth thee, and his mustachios rub thy cheek and lips? Replied the other, Silly that thou art, what decketh the tree save its leaves and the cucumber but its warts? Didst ever see in the world aught uglier than a scald head bald of his beard? Knowest thou not that the beard is to men as the side locks to women? And what is the difference between chin and cheek? Knowest thou not that Allah, extolled and exalted be he, hath created an angel in heaven who saith, Glory be to him who ornamenteth men with beards and women with long hair? So were not the beard even as the tresses and comeliness it had not been coupled with them, O silly. How shall I spread eagle myself under a boy who will emit long before I can go off, and forestall me in limpness of penis and clitoris, and leave a man who, when he taketh breath, clippeth close, and when he entereth, goeth leisurely, and when he hath done, repeateth, and when he pusheth, poketh hard, and as often as he withdraweth, returneth. The boy's leman was edified by her speech, and said, I forswear my lover by the lord of the Kaaba. And amongst tales is one of Ali the Kyrene and the Haunted House in Baghdad. There lived once in the city of Cairo a merchant who had great store of monies and bullion, gems and jewels, and lands and houses beyond count, and his name was Hassan the jeweler, the Baghdad man. Furthermore, Allah had blessed him with a son of perfect beauty and brilliancy, rosy-cheeked, fair of face and well-figured, whom he named Ali of Cairo, and had taught the Koran and science and elocution and the other branches of polite education, till he became proficient in all manner of knowledge. He was under his father's hand in trade, but after a while Hassan fell sick, and his sickness grew upon him till he made sure of death. So he called his son to him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 17 Section 18, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 18 When it was the four hundred and twenty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the jeweler, the Baghdadi, fell sick and made sure of death, he called to him his son, named Ali of Cairo, and said, O my son, Verily this world passeth away, but the next world endureth for aye. 
Every soul shall taste of death, and now, O my son, my decease is at hand, and I desire to charge thee with a charge, which if thou observe, thou shalt abide in safety and prosperity till thou meet Almighty Allah. But if thou follow it not, there shall befall thee much weariness, and thou wilt repent of having transgressed mine injunctions. Replied Ali, O my father, how shall I do other than hearken to thy words and act according to thy charge, seeing that I am bounden by the law of the faith to obey thee and give ear to thy command? Rejoined his father, O my son, I leave thee lands and houses and goods and wealth past count, so that wert thou each day to spend thereof five hundred deniers, thou wouldst miss naught of it. But, O my son, look that thou live in the fear of Allah and follow his chosen one, Mustafa, whom may he bless and preserve, in whatso he is reported to have bidden and forbidden in his traditional law. Be thou constant in alms deeds and the practice of beneficence, and in consorting with men of worth and piety and learning. And look that thou have a care for the poor and needy, and shun avarice and meanness and the conversation of the wicked or those of suspicious character. Look thou kindly upon thy servants and family, and also upon thy wife, for she is of the daughters of the great, and is big with child by thee. Haply Allah will vouchsafe thee virtuous issue by her. And he ceased not to exhort him thus, weeping and saying, O my son, I beseech Allah the Bountiful, the Lord of the glorious Empyrean, to deliver thee from all straits that may encompass thee, and grant thee his ready relief. Thereupon his son wept with sore weeping, and said, O my father, I am melted by thy words, for these are as the words of one that saith farewell. Replied the merchant, Yes, O my son, I am aware of my condition, forget thou not my charge. Then he fell to repeating the two professions of the faith, and to reciting verses of the Quran until the appointed hour arrived, when he said, Draw near unto me, O my son. So Ali drew near, and he kissed him. Then he sighed, and his soul departed his body, and he went to the mercy of Almighty Allah. Therewith great grief fell upon Ali. The clamor of keening arose in his house, and his father's friends flocked to him. Then he betook himself to preparing the body for burial, and made him a splendid funeral. They bore his bier to the place of prayer and prayed over him, then to the cemetery, where they buried him and recited over him what suited of the sublime Koran. After which they returned to the house and condoled with the dead man's son and wended each his own way. Moreover, Ali prayed the Friday prayer for his father and had perlections of the Koran every day for the normal forty during which time he abode in the house and went not forth, save to the place of prayer, and every Friday he visited his father's tomb. So he ceased not from his praying and reciting for some time, until his fellows of the sons of the merchants came in to him one day, and saluting him said, How long is thy mourning, and neglecting thy business, and the company of thy friends? Verily this is a fashion which will bring thee weariness, and thy body will suffer for it exceedingly. Now when they came into him, Iblis the accursed was with them, prompting them, and they went on to recommend him to accompany them to the bazaar, whilst Iblis tempted him to consent to them, till he yielded. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twenty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king that when the sons of the merchants went in to Ali the Kyrene, son of Hassan the jeweler, they recommended him to accompany them to the bazaar till he yielded, that the will of Allah, extolled and exalted be he, might be fulfilled. And he left the house of mourning with them. Presently they said, Mount thy she-mule and ride with us to such a garden, that we may solace us there, and that thy grief and despondency may depart from thee. So he mounted, and taking his slave, went with them to the garden in question. And when they entered, one of them went, and making ready the morning meal, brought it to them there. So they ate, and were merry, and sat in talk till the end of the day, when they mounted and returned each to his own lodging, where they passed the night. As soon as the morrow dawned, they again visited Ali, and said, Come with us, asked he, whither? And they answered, To such a garden. 
for it is finer than the first and more pleasurable. So he went with them to the garden, and one of them going away made ready the morning meal and brought it to them together with strong heady wine. And after eating they brought out the wine, when quoth Ali, What is this? And quoth they, This is what dispelleth sadness and brighteneth gladness. And they ceased not to commend it to him, till they prevailed upon him, and he drank with them. Then they sat, drinking and talking, till the end of the day, when each returned home. But as for Ali the Kyrene, he was giddy with wine, and in this plight went in to his wife, who said to him, What aileth thee that thou art so changed? He said, We were making merry to-day, when one of my companions brought us liquor. So my friends drank, and I with them, and this giddiness came upon me. And she replied, O my lord, say me, hast thou forgotten thy father's injunction, and done that from which he forbade thee in consorting with doubtful folk? Answered he, These be of the sons of the merchants, they are no suspicious folk, only lovers of mirth and good cheer. And he continued to lead this life with his friends, day after day, going from place to place, and feasting with them and drinking, till they said to him, Our turns are ended, and now it is thy turn. Well come, and welcome, and fair cheer, cried he. So on the morrow he made ready all that the case called for of meat and drink, twofold what they had provided, and taking cooks and tent pitchers and coffee makers, repaired with the others to al Ruza and the Nilometer, where they abode a whole month, eating and drinking and hearing music and making merry. At the end of the month Ali found that he had spent a great sum of money. But Iblis the accursed deluded him, and said to him, Though thou shouldst spend every day a like sum, yet wouldst thou not miss aught of it. So he took no account of money expenses, and continued this way of life for three years, whilst his wife remonstrated with him, and reminded him of his father's charge. But he hearkened not to her words, till he had spent all the ready monies he had, when he fell to selling his jewels and spending their price, until they also were all gone. Then he sold his houses, fields, farms, and gardens, one after other, till they likewise were all gone, and he had nothing left but the tenement wherein he lived. So he tore out the marble and woodwork, and sold it, and spent of its price, till he had made an end of all this also. When he took thought with himself, and, finding that he had nothing left to expend, sold the house itself, and spent the purchase money. After that the man who had bought the house came to him, and said, Seek out for thyself a lodging, as I have need of my house. So he bethought himself, and finding that he had no want of a house except for his wife, who had borne him a son and a daughter, he had not a servant left, he hired a large room in one of the mean courts, and there took up his abode, after having lived in honor and luxury with many eunuchs and much wealth. And he soon came to want one day's bread. Quoth his wife, Of this I warned thee, and exhorted thee to obey thy father's charge, and thou wouldst not hearken to me. But there is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah the glorious, the great. Whence shall the little ones eat? Arise then, and go round to thy friends, the sons of the merchants. Belike they will give thee somewhat on which we may live this day. So he arose, and went to his friends one by one. But they all hid their faces from him, and gave him injurious words, revolting to hear, but not else. And he returned to his wife, and said to her, They have given me nothing. Thereupon she went forth to beg of her neighbors the wherewithal to keep themselves alive. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twenty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wife of Ali the Kareen, seeing her husband return empty-handed, went forth to beg of her neighbors the wherewithal to keep themselves alive, and repaired to a woman whom she had known in former days. When she came into her, and saw her case, she rose, and receiving her kindly, wept, and said, What hath befallen you? So she told her all that her husband had done, and the other replied, Well, come, and welcome, and fair cheer, whatever thou needest, seek it of me without price. Quoth she, Allah requite thee abundantly. Then her friend gave her as much provision as would suffice herself and her family a whole month and she took it and returned to her lodging. When her husband saw her, he wept and asked, 
whence hadst thou that? And she answered, I got it of such a woman. For when I told her what had befallen us, she failed me not in aught, but said, Seek of me all thou needest. Whereupon her husband rejoined, Since thou hast this much, I will betake myself to a place I have in mind. Her adventure, Allah Almighty, will bring us relief. With these words, he took leave of her and kissed his children and went out, not knowing whither he should go, and continued walking on till he came to Bulak, where he saw a ship about to sail for Damietta. Here he met a man, between whom and his father there had been friendship, and he saluted him and said to him, Whither now? Replied Ali, To Damietta, I have friends there whom I would inquire after and visit them and then return. The man took him home and treated him honorably. Then, furnishing him with vivers for the voyage, and giving him some gold pieces, embarked him on board the vessel bound for Damietta. When they reached it, Ali landed, not knowing whither to go. But as he was walking along, a merchant saw him, and had pity on him, and carried him to his house. Here he abode a while, after which he said in himself, How long this sojourning in other folks' homes? Then he left the merchant's place, and walked to the wharf, where, after inquiry, he found a ship ready to sail for Syria. His hospitable host provided him with provisions, and embarked him in the ship, and it set sail, and Ali reached in due season the Syrian shores, where he disembarked and journeyed till he entered Damascus. As he walked about the great thoroughfare, behold, a kindly man saw him, and took him to his house, where he tarried for a time, till, one day going abroad, he saw a caravan about to start for Baghdad and bethought himself to journey thither with it. Thereupon he returned to his host, and taking leave of him, set out with the kafila. Now Allah, extolled and exalted be he, inclined to him the heart of one of the merchants, so that he took him with him, and Ali ate and drank with him, till they came within one day's journey of Baghdad. Here, however, a company of highwaymen fell upon the caravan, and took all they had, and but few of the merchants escaped. These made each for a separate place of refuge. But as for Ali the Kyrene, he fared for Baghdad, where he arrived at sundown, as the gatekeepers were about to shut the gates, and said to them, Let me in with you. They admitted him, and asked him, Whence come, and whither wending? And he answered, I am a man from Cairo city, and have with me mules laden with merchandise, and slaves and servants. I forewent them to look me out a place wherein to deposit my goods. But as I rode along in my she-mule, there fell upon me a company of banditti, who took my mule and gear, nor did I escape from them but at my last gasp. The gate-guard entreated him honorably, and bade him be of good cheer, saying, Abide with us this night, and in the morning we will look thee out a place befitting thee. Then he sought in his breast-pocket, and finding a denier of those given to him by the merchant at Bulak, handed it to one of the gatekeepers, saying, Take this, and change it, and bring us something to eat. The man took it, and went to the market, where he changed it, and brought Ali bread and cooked meat. So he ate, he and the gate guards, and he lay the night with them. Now on the morrow, one of the warders carried him to a certain of the merchants of Baghdad, to whom he told the same story, and he believed him, deeming that he was a merchant, and had with him loads of merchandise. Then he took him up into his shop, and entreated him with honor. Moreover, he sent to his house for a splendid suit of his own apparel for him, and carried him to the hammam. So, quoth Ali of Cairo, I went with him to the bath, and when he came out, he took me and brought me to his house, where he set the morning meal before us, and we ate and made merry. Then said he to one of his black slaves, Ho, Masid, take this thy lord, show him the two houses standing in such a place, and whichever pleaseth him, give him the key of it, and come back. So I went with the slave till we came to a street road where stood three houses side by side, newly built and yet shut up. He opened the first, and I looked at it, and we did the same to the second, after which he said to me, Of which shall I give thee the key? To whom doth the big house belong? To us. Open it, that I may view it. Thou hast no business there. Wherefore? Because it is haunted, and none nighteth there, but in the morning he is a dead man. Nor do we use to open the door when removing the corpse, but mount the terrace roof of one of the other two houses, and take it up thence. For this reason my master hath abandoned the house, and saith, 
I will never again give it to anyone. Open it, I cried, that I may view it. And I said in my mind, This is what I seek. I will pass the night there, and in the morning be a dead man, and be at peace from this my case. So he opened it, and I entered, and found it a splendid house, without its like. And I said to the slave, I will have none other than this house. Give me its key. But he rejoined, I will not give thee this key till I consult my master. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and twenty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the negro, continued Ali of Cairo, rejoined, I will not give thee its key till I consult my master. And going to him, reported, The Egyptian trader saith, I will lodge in none but the big house. Now when the merchant heard this, he rose, and coming to Ali, spake thus to him, O my lord, thou hast no need of this house. But he answered, I will lodge in none other than this, for I care not for this silly saying. Quoth the other, Write me an acknowledgment, that if aught happen to thee, I am not responsible. Quoth Ali, So be it. Whereupon the merchant fetched an assessor from the Kazi's court, and taking the prescribed acknowledgment, delivered to him the key wherewith he entered the house. The merchant sent him bedding by a blackamoor, who spread it for him on the built bench behind the door, and walked away. Presently Ali went about, and, seeing in the inner court a well with a bucket, let this down and drew water, wherewith he made the lesser ablution and prayed the obligatory prayers. Then he sat a while, till the slave brought him the evening meal from his master's house, together with a lamp, a candle and candlestick, a basin and ewer, and a gugglet. After which he left him and returned home. Ali lighted the candle, supped at his ease, and prayed the night prayer. And presently he said to himself, Come, take the bedding and go upstairs and sleep there. Twill be better than here. So he took the bed and carried it upstairs, where he found a splendid saloon with gilded ceiling and floor and walls cased with colored marbles. He spread his bed there and, sitting down, began to recite somewhat of the sublime Koran, when, ere he was ware, he heard one calling to him and asking, O Ali, O son of Hassan, say me, shall I send thee down the gold? And he answered, Where be the gold thou hast to send? But hardly had he spoken, when gold pieces began to rain down on him like stones from a catapult, nor cease till the saloon was full. Then, after the golden shower, said the voice, Set me free, that I may go my way, for I have made an end of my service, and have delivered unto thee that which was entrusted to me for thee. Quoth Ali, I adjure thee by Allah the Almighty to tell me the cause of this gold rain. Replied the voice, This is a treasure that was talisman to thee of old time, and to every one who entered the house we used to come and say, O Ali, O son of Hassan, shall we send thee down the gold? Whereat he would be affrighted and cry out, and we would come down to him and break his neck and go away. But when thou camest, and we accosted thee by thy name and that of thy father, saying, Shall we send thee down the gold? And thou madest answer to us, And where be the gold? We knew thee for the owner of it, and sent it down. Moreover, there is yet another hoard for thee in the land of al Yaman and thou wouldst do well to journey thither and fetch it. And now I would fain have thee set me free, that I may go my way. Said Ali, By Allah I will not set thee free, till thou bring me hither the treasure from the land of al Yaman. Said the voice, An I bring it to thee, wilt thou release me and eke the servant of the other hoard? Yes, replied Ali. And the voice cried, Swear to me. So he swore to him, and he was about to go away, when Ali said to him, I have one other need to ask of thee. And he, What is that? Quoth Ali, I have a wife and children at Cairo in such a place. Thou needs must fetch them to me, at their ease, and without their unease. Quoth he, I will bring them to thee in a mule litter, and much state, with a train of eunuchs and servants, together with the treasure from al Yaman, Inshallah. 
Then he took of him leave of absence for three days, when all this should be with him, and vanished. As soon as it was morning, Ali went round about the saloon, seeking a place wherein to store the gold, and saw on the edge of the dice a marble slab with a turning pin. So he turned the pin, and the slab sank, and showed a door, which he opened, and entering, found a great closet full of bags of coarse stuff carefully sewn. So he began taking out the bags, and fell to filling them with gold, and storing them in the closet, till he had transported thither all the hoarded gold. Whereupon he shut the door, and turning the pin, the slab returned to its place. Then he went down and seated himself on the bench behind the door. And presently there came a knock, so he opened, and found the merchant's slave, who, seeing him comfortably sitting, returned in haste to his master. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 18 Section 19, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 19 When it was the four hundred and twenty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the house-owner's black slave returned and knocked at the door, Ali the Kyrene, son of the merchant Hassan, opened it to him, and the negro, seeing him comfortably sitting, returned in haste to his master with the good tidings, saying, O my lord, the merchant who is lodged in the house inhabited by the jinn, is alive and well, and sitteth on the bench behind the door. Then the merchant rose joyfully, and went to the house, taking breakfast with him. And when he saw Ali, he embraced him, and kissed him between the eyes, asking, How hath the law dealt with thee? And Ali answered, Right well, I slept upstairs in the marble saloon. Quoth the merchant, Did aught come to thee, or didst thou see anything? And quoth Ali, No, I recited some little of the sublime Koran, and slept till morning, when I arose, and after making the minor ablution, and praying, seated myself on the bench behind the door. Praised be Allah for safety, exclaimed the merchant, then left him and presently sent him black slaves and white mamelukes and handmaidens with household gear. They swept the house from top to bottom and furnished it with magnificent furniture, after which three white slaves and three black slaves and four slave girls remained with him to serve him, while the rest returned to their master's house. Now when the merchants heard of him, they sent him presents of all manner things of price, even to food and drink and clothes, and took him with them to the market, asking, When will thy baggage arrive? And he answered, After three days it will surely come. When the term had elapsed, the servant of the first hoard, the golden rain, came to him and said, Go forth and meet the treasure I have brought thee from al Yaman, together with thy harem, for I bring part of the wealth in the semblance of costly merchandise. But the eunuchs and mamelukes and the mules and horses and camels are all of the John. Now the jinni, when he betook himself to Cairo, found Ali's wife and children in sore misery, naked and hungry. So he carried them out of the city in a traveling litter, and clad them in sumptuous raiment of the stuffs which were in the treasure of al Yaman. So when Ali heard this, he arose, and repairing to the merchants, said to them, Rise and go forth with us from the city, to meet the caravan bringing my merchandise, and honor us with the presence of your harems, to meet my harem. Hearkening and obedience, answered they, and sending for their harems, went forth all together, and took seat in one of the city gardens. And as they sat talking, behold, a dust cloud arose out of the heart of the desert, and they flocked forth to see what it was. Presently it lifted and discovered mules and muleteers, ten-pitchers and linkmen, who came on singing and dancing till they reached the garden, when the chief of the muleteers walked up to Ali, and kissing his hand, said to him, O oh my master, we have been long on the way, for we purposed entering yesterday, but we were in fear of the bandits, so abode in our station four days, till Almighty Allah rid us of them. 
Thereupon the merchants mounted their mules and rode forward with the caravan, the harems waiting behind, till Ali's wife and children mounted with them, and they all entered in splendid train. The merchants marvelled at the number of mules laden with chests, whilst the women of the merchants wondered at the richness of the apparel of his wife and the fine raiment of her children, and kept saying each to other, Verily, the king of Baghdad hath no such gear, no, nor any other of the kings or lords or merchants. So they ceased not to fare forwards in high great state, the men with Ali of Cairo and the harems with his harem, till they came to the mansion. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that they ceased not to fare forwards in high state, the men with Ali's men and the women with his wife, till they came to the mansion, where they alighted and brought the mules and their burdens into the midst of the courtyard. Then they unloaded them and warehoused the goods, whilst the merchants' wives went up with Ali's family to the saloon, which they found, as it were, a luxuriant garden, spread with magnificent furniture. They sat in mirth and good cheer till noon, when they brought them up the midday meal, all manner meats and sweetmeats of the very best, and they ate and drank costly sherbets and perfumed themselves thereafter with rose water and scented woods. Then they took leave and went home, men and women, and when the merchants returned to their places, they sent presents to the husband according to their conditions, and their wives likewise sent presents to the wife, so that there came to them great store of handmaids and negroes and mamelukes and all kinds of goods such as grain, sugar, and so forth, in abundance beyond account. As for the Baghdad merchant, the landlord of the house, he abode with Ali, and quitted him not, but said to him, Let the black slaves and servants take the mules and the common cattle into one of my other houses to rest. Quoth Ali, They set out again to-night for such a place. Then he gave them leave to go forth and camp outside the city, that they might start on their journey at night come. Whereupon, hardly believing that they were dismissed, they took leave of him, and departing to the outliers of the city, flew off through the air to their several abodes. So Ali and his house owner sat together till a third of the night was passed, when their colloquy ended, and the merchant returned to his own house, and Ali went up to his wife and children, and after saluting them, said, What hath befallen you in my absence all this time? So she told him what they had suffered of hunger and nakedness and travail, and he said, Praise be Allah for safety. How did ye come? Answered she, O oh my lord, I was asleep with my children yesternight, when suddenly and unexpectedly one raised us from the ground and flew with us through the firmament without doing us any hurt, nor did he leave flying with us till he set us down in a place as it were an Arab camping ground where we saw laden mules and a travelling litter borne upon two great mules, and around it servants, all boys and men. So I asked them, Who are ye, and what are these loaves, and where are we? And they answered, We are the servants of the merchant Ali of Cairo, son of the merchant jeweller, who hath sent us to fetch you to him at Baghdad. Quoth I, Tell me, is it far or near hence to Baghdad? They replied, Near. There lieth between us and the city but the darkness of the night. Then they mounted us in the litter, and, when the morrow dawned, we found ourselves with thee, without having suffered any hurt whatever. Quoth he, Who gave you these dresses? And, quoth she, The chief of the caravan opened one of the boxes on the mules, and taking out thereof these clothes, clad me and thy children each in a suit, after which he locked the case and gave me the key, saying, Take care of it, till thou give it to thy husband, and here it is safe by me. So saying, she gave him the key, and he said, Dost thou know the chest? Said she, Yes, I know it. So he took her down to the magazine, and showed her the boxes, when she cried, This is the one whence the dresses were taken, upon which he put the key in the lock, and opened the chest, wherein he found much raiment, and the keys of all the other cases. So he took them, and fell to opening them, one after another, 
and feasting his eyes upon the gems and the precious ores they contained, whose like was not found with any of the kings. After which he locked them again, took the keys, and returned to the saloon, saying to his wife, This is of the bounty of Almighty Allah. Then bringing her to the secret slab, he turned the pin and opened the door of the closet, into which he entered with her, and showed her the gold he had laid up therein. Quoth she, Whence came all this to thee? It came to me by the grace of my Lord, answered he. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ali's wife had looked upon the gold, she said to him, Whence came all this to thee? It came to me by the grace of my Lord, answered he. When I left thee in my trouble, I shipped at Baluk for Damietta, and met a friend there who forwarded me to Damascus. In brief, he told her all that had befallen him from first to last. Said she, O my Lord, all this cometh by boon of thy father's blessing, and orisons, when he prayed for thee before his death, saying, I beseech Allah to cast thee into no straits except he grant thee ready relief. So praised be Allah Almighty, for that he hath brought thee deliverance, and hath requited thee with more than went from thee. But Allah upon thee, O my Lord, return not to thy practice of associating with doubtful folk, but look thou fear Allah, whose name be exalted, both in private and in public. And as she went on to admonish him, he said, I accept thine admonition, and beg the Almighty to remove the froward from amongst us, and establish us in his obedience, and in the observance of the law and practice of his prophet, on whom be blessings and peace. After that, Ali and his wife and children were in all solace of life and gladness. And he opened him a shop in the merchant's bazaar, and stocking it with a somewhat of jewels and bullion, sat therein with his children and white servants. Presently he became the most considerable of the merchants of Baghdad, and his report reached the king of that city, who sent a messenger to command his attendants, saying, Answer the summons of the king who requireth thee. He replied, I hear and obey, and straightway prepared his present, and he took four trays of red gold, and filling them with jewels and precious metals such as no king possessed, went up to the palace, and presenting himself before the presence, kissed the ground between his hands, and wished him endurance of goods and glory in the finest language he could command. Said the king, O merchant, thou cheerest our city with thy presence. And Ali rejoined, O king of the age, thy slave hath brought thee a gift, and hopeth for acceptance thereof from thy favor. Then he laid the four trays before the king, who uncovered them, and seeing that they contained gems, whose fellows he possessed not, and whose worth equaled treasuries of money, said, Thy present is accepted, O merchant, and, inshallah, we will requite thee with its like. And Ali kissed his hands and went away, whereupon the king called his grandees and said to them, How many of the kings have sought my daughter in marriage? Many, answered they, and he asked, Hath any of them given me the like of this gift? Whereto they replied, Not one, for that none of them hath its like. And he said, I have consulted Allah Almighty by lot as to marrying my daughter to this merchant. What say ye? Be it as thou reckest, answered they. Then he bade the eunuch carry the four trays into his seraglio, and going into his wife, laid them before her. She uncovered them, and seeing therein that whose like she possessed not, no, nor a fraction thereof, said to him, From which of the kings hadst thou these, perchance of one of the royalties that seek thy daughter in marriage? Said he, Not so, I had them of an Egyptian merchant, who is lately come to this our city. Now when I heard of his coming, I sent to command him to us, thinking to make his acquaintance. So haply we might find with him somewhat of jewels, and buy them of him for our daughter's trousseau. He obeyed our summons, and brought us these four trays as a present. And I saw him to be a handsome youth of dignified aspect, and intelligent as elegant, 
almost such as should be the sons of kings. Wherefore my heart inclined to him at sight, and my heart rejoiced in him, and I thought good to marry my daughter to him. So I showed the gift to my grandees, who agreed with me that none of the kings hath the like of these, and I told them my project. But what sayest thou? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-second night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the king of Baghdad, after showing the presents to his wife and highly praising Ali, the merchant jeweler, and informing her of the proposed marriage, asked, But what sayest thou? She replied, O king of the age, the ordering this affair is in Allah's hand, and thine, whatso Allah willeth, shall come to pass. Rejoined the king, If it be his will, I will marry her to none other than this young man. He slept on this resolve, and on the morrow he went out to his divan, and summoned Ali and the rest of the merchants of Baghdad, and when all came, bade them be seated. Then said he, Bring me the kazi of the divan. And they brought him, whereupon the king said to him, O kazi, write the contract of marriage between my daughter and the merchant Ali the Kyrene. But Ali said, Thy pardon, O our lord the sultan, it befitteth not that a traitor such as I be the king's son-in-law. Quoth the king, It is my will to bestow this favor upon thee as well as the wazirate. And he invested him forthwith in the wazir's office and ministerial robes. Then Ali sat down in the chair of the wazirate and said, O king of the age, thou hast bestowed on me this, and indeed I am honored by thy bounties. But hear one word I have to say to thee. He replied, Say on, and fear not. Quoth Ali, Since it is thine august resolution to marry thy daughter, thou wouldst do better to marry her to my son. Quoth the king, Hast thou then a son? And Ali replied, Yes. Send for him forthwith, said the king. Thereupon, answered Ali, Hearkening and obedience and dispatched a servant to fetch his son, who came, and kissing the ground before the king, stood in an attitude of respect. The king looked at him, and seeing him to be yet comelier than his daughter, and goodlier than she in stature, and proportion, and brightness, and perfection, said to him, What is thy name, O my son? My name is Hassan, O our lord the sultan, replied the young man, who was then fourteen years old. Then the sultan said to the kazi, Write the contract of marriage between my daughter, Husan al-Wujid, and Hassan, son of the merchant Ali the Kyrene. So he wrote the marriage contract between them, and the affair was ended in the goodliest fashion. After which all in the divan went their ways, and the merchants followed the wazir Ali, escorting him to his house, where they gave him joy of his advancement and departed. Then he went in to his wife, who, seeing him clad in the wazir's habit, exclaimed, What is this? When he told her all that had passed from first to last, and she joyed therein with exceeding joy. So sped the night, and on the morrow he went up to the divan, where the king received him with a special favor, and seating him close by his side, said, O wazir, we purpose to begin the wedding festivities and bring thy son in to our daughter. Replied Ali, O our lord the sultan, whatso thou deemest good is good. So the sultan gave orders to celebrate the festivities, and they decorated the city and held high festival for thirty days, in all joy and gladness. At the end of which time, a son, son of the wazir Ali, went in to the princess and enjoyed her beauty and loveliness. When the queen saw her daughter's husband, she conceived a warm affection for him, and in like manner she rejoiced greatly in his mother. Then the king bade build for his son-in-law, Hassan Ali's son, a palace beside his own. So they built him with all speed a splendid palace in which he took up his abode. And his mother used to tarry with him some days and then go down to her own house. After a while, the queen said to her husband, O king of the age, 
Hassan's lady mother cannot take up her abode with her son and leave the wazir, neither can she tarry with the wazir and leave her son. Thou sayest sooth, replied the king, and bade edify a third palace beside that of Hassan, which being done in a few days, he caused remove thither the goods of the wazir, and the minister and his wife took up their abode there. Now the three palaces communicated with one another, so that when the king had a mind to speak with the wazir by night, he would go to him or send to fetch him, and so with Hassan and his father and mother. On this wise they dwelt in all solace and in the greatest happiness. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 19《Section 20, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 20. When it was the four hundred and thirty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the king and the wazir and his son ceased not to dwell in all solace and in the greatest happiness a while, till the king fell ill and his sickness grew on him. So he summoned the lords of his realm and said to them, There is come upon me a sore malady, peradventure a mortal, and I have therefore summoned you to consult you respecting a certain matter, on which I would have you counsel me as you deem well. They ask, What is the matter of which thou wouldst take counsel with us, O king? And he answered, I am old and sickly, and I fear for the realm after me from its enemies. So I would have you all agree upon some one that I may proclaim him king in my lifetime, and so ye may be at ease. Whereupon quoth they with one voice, We all approve of thy daughter's husband, Hassan, son of the wazir Ali, for we have seen his wit and perfect understanding, and he knoweth the place of all, great and small. Ask the king, Are ye indeed agreed upon this? And they answered, Yes. Rejoined he, Peradventure ye all say this to my face, of respect for me, but behind my back ye will say otherwise. However, they all replied, By Allah, our word is one and the same in public and in private and we accept him frankly and with hardiness of heart and breath of breast. Quoth he, Since the case is thus, bring the kazi of the holy law and all the chamberlains and viceroys and officers of state before me to-morrow, and we will order the affair after the goodliest fashion. We hear and obey, answered they, and withdrawing, notified all the olima, the doctors of the law, and the chief personages among the emirs. So when the morrow dawned, they came up to the divan, and having craved and obtained permission to enter, they saluted the king, saying, Here are we all in thy presence. Whereto he made reply, O emirs of Baghdad, whom will ye have to be king over you after me, that I may inaugurate him during my lifetime before the presence of you all? Quoth they with one voice, We are agreed upon thy daughter's husband Hassan, son of the wazir Ali. Quoth he, If it be so, go all of you, and bring him before me. So they all arose, and repairing to Hassan's palace, said to him, Rise, come with us to the king. Wherefore? asked he, and they answered, For a thing that will benefit both us and thee. So he went in with them to the king, and kissed the ground before his father-in-law, who said to him, Be seated, O my son. He sat down, and the king continued, O Hassan, all the emirs have approved of thee, and agreed to make thee king over them after me. And it is my purpose to proclaim thee, whilst I yet live, and so make an end of the business. But Hassan stood up, and kissing the ground once more before the king, said to him, O our lord, among the emirs there are many who are older than I, and greater of worth. Acquit me, therefore, of this thing. But all the emirs cried out, saying, we consent not but that thou be king over us. Then said Hassan, My father is older than I, 
and I and he are one thing, and it befits not to advance me over him. But Ali said, I will consent to nothing save whatso contenteth my brethren, and they have all chosen and agreed upon thee. Wherefore gainsay thou not the king's commandment and that of thy brethren. And Hassan hung his head abashed before the king and his father. Then said the king to the emirs, Do ye all accept of him? We do, answered they, and recited thereupon seven fatihas. So the king said, O Kazi, draw up a legal instrument testifying of these emirs that they are agreed to make king over them my daughter's husband Hassan. The Kazi wrote the act and made it binding on all men, after they had sworn in a body the oath of fealty to Hassan. Then the king did likewise and bade him take his seat on the throne of kingship, whereupon they all arose and kissed King Hassan's hands and did homage to him and swore lealty to him. And the new king dispensed justice among the people that day in a fashion right royal and invested the grandees of the realm in splendid robes of honor. When the divan broke up, he went in to and kissed the hands of his father-in-law, who spake thus to him, O my son, look thou rule the lieges in the fear of Allah. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when King Hassan was quit of the divan, he went into and kissed the hands of his wife's father, who spake thus to him, O my son, look thou rule the lieges in the fear of Allah, whereto he replied, O my father, through thy prayers for me, the grace and guidance of Allah will come to me. Then he entered his own palace and was met by his wife and her mother and their attendants, who kissed his hands and gave him joy of his advancement, saying, Be this day blessed. Next he went in to his father and mother, who joyed with exceeding joy in that which Allah had vouchsafed him of his advancement to the kingship, and his father charged him to fear Allah and to deal mercifully with his subjects. He passed the night in glee and gladness, and on the morrow, having prayed the obligatory prayers ending with the usual short chapters of the Quran, he went up to the divan, whither came all his officers and dignitaries. He passed the day in dispensing justice among the folk, bidding to graciousness and forbidding ungraciousness, and appointing to place and displacing till day end, when the divan broke up after the goodliest fashion, and all the troops withdrew, and each went his own way. Then he arose and repaired to the palace, where he found his father-in-law's sickness grown heavy upon him, and said to him, May no ill befall thee. At this the old king opened his eyes and said, O Hassan, and he replied, At thy service, O my lord. Quoth the old king, Mine appointed hour is at hand. Be thou careful of thy wife and her mother, and look thou fear Allah and honor thy parents, and bide in awe of the majesty of the requiting king, and bear in mind that he commandeth justice and good works. And king Hassan replied, I hear and obey. Now after this the old king lingered three days and then departed into the mercy of Almighty Allah. So they laid him out and shrouded and buried him and held over him readings and perlections of the Quran to the end of the customary forty days. And King Hassan, son of the wazir, reigned in his stead and his subjects joyed in him and all his days were gladness. Moreover, his father ceased not to be his chief wazir on his right hand, and he took to himself another wazir to be at his left hand. His reign was a prosperous and well-ordered, and he lived a long life as king of Baghdad, and Allah blessed him by the old king's daughter with three sons who inherited the kingdom after him. And they abode in the solace of life and its pleasures till there came to them the destroyer of delights the severer of societies. And the glory be to him who is eternal, and in whose hand are annulling and confirming. And of the tales they tell is one of The Pilgrim Man and the Old Woman. A man of the pilgrims once slept a long sleep, and awaking, 
found no trace of the caravan. So he rose up and walked on, but lost his way, and presently came to a tent where he saw an old woman standing at the entrance, and by her side a dog asleep. He went up to the tent, and saluting the old woman, sought of her food, when she replied, Go to yonder weighty, and catch thy sufficiency of serpents, that I may broil of them for thee, and give thee to eat. Rejoined the pilgrim, I dare not catch serpents, nor did I ever eat them. Quoth the old woman, I will go with thee, and catch some, fear not. So she went with him, followed by the dog, to the valley, and catching a sufficient number of serpents, proceeded to broil them. He saw nothing for it, saith the storyteller, but to eat, in fear of hunger and exhaustion. So he ate of the serpents. Then he was athirst, and asked for water to drink, and she answered, Go to the spring and drink. Accordingly he went to the spring, and found the water thereof bitter, yet needs must he drink of it despite its bitterness, because of the violence of his thirst. Presently he returned to the old woman, and said to her, I marvel, O ancient dame, at thy choosing to sojourn in this place. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the palmer man drank the bitter draught for stress of thirst, he returned, and said, I marvel, O ancient dame, at thy choosing to sojourn in this place, and thy putting up with such meat and drink. She asked, And how is it, then, in thy country? Where to, he answered, In my country are houses wide and spacious, and fruits ripe and delicious, and waters sweet, and beyond savours, and of goodly use, and meats fat and full of juice, and flocks innumerous, and all things pleasant, and all the goods of life, the like whereof are not, save in the paradise which Allah the Omnipotent hath promised to his servants pious. Replied she, all this have I heard, but tell me, have ye a sultan who ruleth over you, and is tyrannical in his rule, and under whose hand you are, one who, if any of you commit an offence, taketh his goods, and ruineth him, and who, when as he will, turneth you out of house and home, and uprooteth you stock and branch? Replied the man, Indeed that may be. And she replied, if so, by Allah, these your delicious food and life of daintyhood and gifts, however good, with tyranny and oppression, are but a searching poison, while our coarse meat, which in freedom and safety we eat, is a healthful medicine. Hast thou not heard that the best of boons, after all Islam, the true fatah, are sanity and security? Now such boons quoth he who telleth the tale, may be by the just rule of the sultan, vice-regent of Allah on his earth, and the goodness of his polity. The sultan of time past needed but little awfulness, for when the lieges saw him, they feared him. But the sultan of these days hath need of the most accomplished polity, and the utmost majesty, because men are not as men of bygone time, and this our age is one of folk opprobrious and is greatly calamitous, noted for folly and hardness of heart, and inclined to hate and enmity. If, therefore, the Sultan, which Almighty Allah forfend, be weak or wanting in polity and majesty, this will be the assured cause of his country's ruin. Quoth the proverb, An hundred years of the Sultan's tyranny, but not one year of the people's tyranny one over other, when the lieges oppress one another, Allah setteth over them a tyrannical sultan and a terrible king. Thus it is told in history that one day there was sent to al Hajjaj bin Yusuf a slip of paper whereon was written, Fear Allah and oppress not his servants with all manner of oppression. When he read this, he mounted the pulpit, for he was eloquent and ever ready of speech, and said, O folk! Allah Almighty hath made me ruler over you by reason of your frowardness. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Hajjaj Yusuf's son read the paper, he mounted the pulpit and said, 
O folk, Allah Almighty hath made me ruler over you by reason of your frowardness, and indeed, though I die, yet will ye not be delivered from oppression with these your ill deeds. For the Almighty hath created like unto me many and one. If it be not I, twill be one more mischievous than I, and a mightier in oppression, and a more merciless in his majesty. Even as saith the poet, For not a deed the hand can try, save neath the hand of God on high, nor tyrant harsh work tyranny, uncrushed by tyrant harsh as he. Tyranny is feared, but justice is the best of all things. We beg Allah to better our case. And among tales is that of Abu al Husan and his slave girl, Tawadud. There was once in Baghdad a man of consequence and rich in monies and immovables, who was one of the chiefs of the merchants. And Allah had largely endowed him with worldly goods, but had not vouchsafed him what he longed for of offspring. And there was passed over him a long space of time, without his being blessed with issue, male or female. His years waxed great, his bones became wasted, and his back bent. Weakness and weariness grew upon him, and he feared the loss of his wealth and possessions, seeing he had no child whom he might make his heir, and by whom his name should be remembered. So he betook himself with supplication to Almighty Allah, fasting by day and praying through the night. Moreover, he vowed many vows to the living, the eternal, and visited the pious, and was constant in supplication to the most highest, till he gave ear to him, and accepted his prayer, and took pity on his straining and complaining, so that before many days were passed, he knew carnally one of his women, and she conceived by him the same night. In due time, she finished her months, and casting her burden, bore a male child, as he were a slice of the moon whereupon the merchant fulfilled his vows in his gratitude to Allah, to whom be honor and glory, and gave alms and clothed the widow and the orphan. On the seventh night after the boy's birth, he named him Abu al Husan, and the wet nurses suckled him, and the dry nurses dandled him, and the servants and the slaves carried him and handled him, till he shot up and grew tall and throve greatly and learnt the sublime Quran and the ordinances of all Islam and the canons of the true faith, and calligraphy, and poetry, and mathematics, and archery. On this wise he became the union pearl of his age, and the goodliest of the folk of his time, and his day, fair of face, and of tongue, fluent, carrying himself with a light and graceful gait, and glorying in his stature proportionate, and amorous graces, which were to many a bait, and his cheeks were red, and flower-white was his forehead, and his side face waxed brown with tender down, even as saith one describing him, The spring of the down on cheeks right clearly shows, and how when the spring is gone shall last the rose. Dost thou not see that the growth upon his cheek is violet bloom that from its leaves outgrows? He abode a while in ease and happiness with his father, who rejoiced and delighted in him, till he came to man's estate, when the merchant one day made him sit down before him, and said, O oh my son, the appointed term draweth near, my hour of death is at hand, and it remaineth but to meet Allah, to whom belong majesty and might. I leave thee what shall suffice thee, even to thy son's son, of monies and mansions, farms and gardens. Wherefore, fear thou, almighty Allah, O oh my son, in dealing with that which I bequeath to thee, and follow none but those who will help thee to the divine favor. Not long after, he sickened and died. So his son ordered his funeral after the goodliest wise, and burying him, returned to his house, and sat mourning for him many days and nights. But behold, certain of his friends came into him, and said to him, Whoso leaveth a son like thee is not dead. Indeed, what is past is past, and fled, and mourning beseemeth none but the young maid and the wife cloistered. And they ceased not from him, till they wrought on him to enter the hammam and break off his mourning. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 20 
Section 21, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 21, 437th through 440th Night. When it was the 437th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Abu al Husn was visited by his friends and taken to the Haman and persuaded to break off his mourning, he presently forgot his father's charge, and his head was turned by his riches. He thought fortune would always wone with him as it was, and that wealth would ever wax and never wane. So he ate and drank and made merry, and took his pleasure, and gave gifts of gear and coin, and was profuse with gold and addressed himself up to eating fowls, and breaking the seals of wine flasks, and listening to the giggle of the daughter of the vine as she gurgled from the flagon, and enjoying the jingle of the singing girls. Nor did he give over this way of life, till his wealth was wasted, and the case worsened, and all his goods went from him, and he bit his hands in bitter penitence for of a truth he had nothing left after that which he had squandered but a concubine, a slave-girl whom his father had bequeathed to him with the rest of his estate, and she had no equal in beauty and loveliness and brightness and liveliness and symmetric stature and perfect grace. She was past mistress in every manner of arts and accomplishments, and endowed with many excellences, surpassing all the folk of her age and time. She was grown more notorious than a waymark for her seductive genius, and outdid the fair both in theory and practice, and she was noted for her swimming gait, flexile and delicate, albeit she was full five feet in height, and by all the boons of fortune decked and dight, with straight-arched brows twain, as they were the crescent moon of Shaban, and eyes like gazelle's eyne, and nose like the edge of scimitar fine, and cheeks like anemones of blood-red shine, and mouth like Solomon's seal and sign, and teeth like necklaces of pearls in line, and navel holding an ounce of oil of benzoin, and waist more slender than his body, whom love hath wasted, and whom concealment hath made sick with pine, and hind parts heavier than two hills of sand. Briefly, she was a volume of charms after his saying, who saith, Her fair shape ravisheth, if face to face she did appear, and if she turn, for severance from her she slayeth sheer. Sun-like, full moon-like, sapling like unto her character estrangement no wise appertains nor cruelty austere under the bosom of her shift the garths of eden are and the full moon revolveth still upon her neck rings sphere she seemed a full moon rising and a gazelle browsing a girl of nine plus five shaming the moon and sun even as saith of her the sayer, eloquent and ingenious. Semblance of full moon heaven bore, when five and five are conjoined by four. Tis not my sin if she made of me, it's like when it riseth horizon o'er. Clean of skin, odiferous of breath, it seemed as if she were of fire fashioned, and of crystal moulded. Rose red was the cheek of her, and perfect the shape and form of her, even as one saith of her, describing her. Scented with sandal and musk, 
right proudly doth she go, with gold and silver and rose and saffron color aglow. A flower in a garden she is, a pearl in an ouch of gold, or an image in chapel set for worship of high and low. Slender and shapely she is, vivacity bids her arise, but the weight of her hips says sit or softly and slowly go. When as her favors I seek and sue for my heart's desire, be gracious, her beauty says, but her coquetry answers no. Glory to him who made beauty her portion, and that of her lover to be the prate of the censurer's hey-ho. She captivated all who saw her with the excellence of her beauty and the sweetness of her smile, and shot them down with the shafts she launched from her eyes. And withal she was eloquent of speech and excellently skilled in verse. Now, when Abu al Husn had squandered all his gold, and his ill plight all could be whole, and there remained to him naught save this slave girl, he abode three days without tasting meat or taking rest and sleep. And the handmaid said to him, O my lord, carry me to the commander of the faithful, Harun al Rashid. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say, her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that quoth the slave girl to her master, O my lord, carry me to Harun al-Rashid, fifth of the sons of Abbas, and seek of him to my price ten thousand dinars. If he deem me dear, say to him, O prince of true believers, my handmaid is worth more than this. Do but prove her, and her value will be magnified in thine eyes. For this slave girl hath not her equal, and she were unfit to any but thou. And she added, Beware, O my lord, of selling me at less than the sum I have named. Indeed, tis but little for the like of me. Now her owner knew not her worth, nor that she had no equal in her day. But he carried her to the caliph, and set her in the presence, and repeated what she had bidden him say. The caliph asked her, What is thy name? To which she answered, My name is Tawadud. He then inquired, O Tawadud, in what branches of knowledge dost thou excel? And she replied, O my lord, I am versed in syntax, and poetry, and jurisprudence, and exegesis, and philosophy, and I am skilled in music, and the knowledge of the divine ordinances, and in arithmetic, and geodesy, and geometry, and the fables of the ancients. I know the sublime Koran by heart, and have read it according to the seven, the ten, and the fourteen modes. I know the number of its chapters, and versets, and sections, and words and its halves, and fourths, and eighths, and tenths, the number of prostrations which occur in it, and the sum total of its letters. And I know what there is in it of abrogating and abrogated. Also, what parts of it were revealed at al Medina, and what at Mecca, and the cause of the different revelations. I know the holy traditions of the apostle's sayings, historical and legendary, the established, and those whose ascription is doubtful. And I have studied the exact sciences, geometry and philosophy, and medicine, and logic, and rhetoric, and composition. And I have learnt many things by rote, and am passionately fond of poetry. I can play the lute, and know its gamut, and notes, and notation, and the crescendo, and diminuendo. If I sing and dance, I seduce, and if I dress and scent myself, I slay. In fine, I have reached a pitch of perfection, such as can be estimated only by those of them who are firmly rooted in knowledge. Now when the caliph heard these words spoken by one so young, he wondered at her eloquence, and turning to Abu al Husn said, I will summon those who shall discuss with her all she claimeth to know, 
If she answer correctly, I will give thee the price thou askest for her, and more, and if not, thou art fitter to have her than I. With gladness and goodly gree, O commander of the faithful, replied Abu al-Husn. So the caliph wrote to the viceroy of Basra to send him Ibrahim bin Siyar the prosodist, who was the first man of his day in argument and eloquence and poetry and logic, and bade him bring with him readers of the Koran and learned doctors of the law, and physicians and astrologers, and scientists and mathematicians and philosophers. And Ibrahim was more learned than all. In a little while they arrived at the palace of the caliphate, knowing not what was to do, and the caliph sent for them to his sitting chamber, and ordered them to be seated. So they sat down, and he bade bring the damsel Tawadud, who came, and unveiling, showed herself, as she were a sparkling star. The caliph set her a stool of gold, and she saluted, and speaking with an eloquent tongue, said, O commander of the faithful! Bid the ulema, and the doctors of law, and leeches, and astrologers, and scientists, and mathematicians, and all here present, contend with me in argument. So he said to them, I desire of you that ye dispute with this damsel on the things of her faith, and stultify her argument in all she advanceth. And they answered, saying, We hear, and we obey Allah and thee, O commander of the faithful. Upon this, Tawadud bowed her head and said, Which of you is the doctor of the law, the scholar, versed in the readings of the Koran and in the traditions? Quoth one of them, I am the man thou seekest. Quoth she, Then ask me of what thou wilt. Said the doctor, Hast thou read the precious book of Allah, and dost thou know its cancelling and cancelled parts? And hast thou meditated its versets and its letters? Yes, answered she. Then, said he, I will proceed to question thee of the obligations and the immutable ordinances. So tell me of these, O damsel, and who is thy lord, who thy prophet, who thy guide, what is thy point of fronting in prayer, and who be thy brethren? Also, what thy spiritual path, and what thy highway? Whereto she replied, Allah is my Lord, and Mohammed, whom Allah save and assain, my prophet, and the Quran is my guide, and the Kaaba my fronting, and the true believers are my brethren, the practice of good is my path, and the Sunnah my highway. The caliph again marveled at her words so eloquently spoken by one so young, and the doctor pursued, O damsel, with what do we know Almighty Allah? said she, with the understanding. Said he, and what is the understanding? Quoth she, it is of two kinds, natural and acquired. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and thirty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the damsel continued, The understanding is of two kinds, natural and acquired. The natural is that which Allah, to whom be honor and glory, created for the right direction of his servants after his will. And the acquired is that which men accomplish by dint of study and fair knowledge. He rejoined, Thou hast answered well. Question. Where is the seat of the understanding? Allah casteth it in the heart, whence its lustrous beams ascend to the brain, and there become fixed. Question. How knowest thou the Prophet of Allah? By the reading of Allah's holy book, and by signs and proofs and portents and miracles. Question. What are the obligations and the immutable ordinances? The obligations are five. 1. Testification that there is no Ilah but Allah, 
no god but the god alone and one which for partner hath none and that muhammad is his servant and his apostle two the standing in prayers three the payment of the poor rate four fasting ramazan five the pilgrimage to allah's holy house for all to whom the journey is possible the immutable ordinances are four to wit night and day and sun and moon the which build up life and hope nor any son of adam wotteth if they will be destroyed on the day of judgment question what are the obligatory observances of the faith they are five prayer almsgiving fasting pilgrimage fighting for the faith and abstinence from the forbidden question why dost thou stand up to pray to express the devout intent of the slave acknowledging the deity question what are the obligatory conditions which precede standing in prayer purification covering the shame avoidance of soiled clothes standing on a clean place fronting the kaaba an upright posture the intent and the pronouncing allo akbar of prohibition question with what shouldest thou go forth from thy house to pray with the intent of worship mentally pronounced question with what intent shouldest thou enter the mosque with an intent of service question why do we front the qibla in obedience to three divine orders and one traditional ordinance question what are the beginning the consecration and the end of prayer purification beginneth prayer saying the allo akbar of prohibition consecrateth and the salutation endeth prayer question what deserveth he who neglecteth prayer it is reported among the authentic traditions of the prophet that he said whoso neglecteth prayer wilfully and purposely hath no part in al-islam and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the four hundred and fortieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that after the damsel had repeated the words of that holy tradition the doctor cried thou hast replied aright now say me what is prayer prayer is communion between the slave and his lord and in it are ten virtues one it illumineth the heart two it maketh the face shine three it pleaseth the compassionate one four it angereth satan five it conjureth calamity six it wardeth off the mischief of enemies seven it multiplieth mercy eight it forfendeth vengeance and punishment nine it bringeth the slave nigh unto his lord and ten it restraineth from lewdness and frowardness hence it is one of the absolute requisites and obligatory ordinances and the pillar of the faith question what is the key of prayer wust or the lesser ablution question what is the key to the lesser ablution intention and naming the almighty question what is the key of naming the almighty assured faith question what is the key of faith trust in the lord question what is the key of trust in the lord hope question what is the key of hope obedience question 
what is the key of obedience? The confession of the unity and the acknowledgement of the divinity of Allah. Question. What are the divine ordinances of wuzu, the minor ablution? They are six, according to the canon of the Imam al-Shafi Muhammad bin Idris, of whom Allah accept. 1. Intent while washing the face. 2. Washing the face. 3. Washing the hands and forearms. 4. Wiping part of the head. 5. Washing the feet and heels. 6. Observing due order. And the traditional statutes are 10. 1. Nomination. 2. And washing the hands before putting them into the water pot. 3. And mouth rinsing. 4. And snuffing. 5. And wiping the whole head. 6. And wetting the ears within and without with fresh water. 7. And separating a thick beard. 8. And separating the fingers and toes. 9. And washing the right foot before the left. And 10. Doing each of these thrice and all in unbroken order. When the minor ablution is ended, the worshipper should say, I testify that there is no God but the God the One, which for partner hath none, and I testify that Muhammad is his servant and his apostle. O my Allah, make me of those who repent and in purity are permanent. Glory to thee, O my God, and in thy praise I bear witness that there is no God save thou. I crave pardon of thee, and I repent to thee, for it is reported in the holy traditions that the Prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve, said of this prayer, Whoso endeth every ablution with this prayer, the eight gates of paradise are open to him. He shall enter at which he pleaseth. Question. When a man purposeth ablution, what betideth him from the angels and the devils? When a man prepareth for ablution, the angels come and stand on his right, and the devils on his left hand. If he name Almighty Allah at the beginning of the ablution, the devils flee from him, and the angels hover over him with a pavilion of light, having four ropes, to each an angel glorifying Allah and craving pardon for him, so long as he remaineth silent or calleth upon the name of Allah. But if he omit to begin washing with naming Allah, to whom belong might and majesty, neither remain silent. The devils take command of him, and the angels depart from him, and Satan whispereth evil thoughts unto him, till he fall into doubt and come short in his ablution. For, quoth he, on whom be blessing and peace, a perfect ablution driveth away Satan, and assureth against the tyranny of the Sultan. And again, quoth he, if calamity befall one who is not pure by ablution, Verily and assuredly let him blame none but himself. Question. What should a man do when he awaketh from sleep? He should wash his hands thrice before putting them into the water vessel. Question. What are the Quranic and traditional orders anent gusl, the complete ablution? The divine ordinances are intent and crowning the whole body with water, that is, the liquid shall come at every part of the hair and skin. Now the traditional ordinances are the minor ablution as preliminary, rubbing the body, separating the hair, and deferring in words the washing of the feet till the end of the ablution. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 21. Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York.
Section 22, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 22, 441st through 444th Night. When it was the 441st night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel had recounted to the doctor what were the divine and traditional orders anent gusel or total ablution, quoth he, Thou hast replied aright. Now tell me what are the occasions for tayamum, or making the ablution with sand and dust, and what are the ordinances thereof, divine and human. The reasons are seven, viz. want of water, fear lest water lack, need thereto, going astray on a march, sickness, having broken bones in splints, and having open wounds. As for its ordinances, the divine number four, viz. intent, dust, clapping it to the face, and clapping it upon the hands, and the human number two, nomination and preferring the right before the left hand. Question. What are the conditions, the pillars or essentials, and the traditional statutes of prayer? The conditions are five. 1. Purification of the members. 2. Covering of the privy parts. 3. Observing the proper hours, either of certainty or to the best of one's belief. 4. Fronting the Qibla. And 5. Standing on a clean place. The Pillars or Essentials number 12. 1. Intent. 2. The Takbir or Magnification of Prohibition. 3. Standing when able to stand. 4. Repeating the Fatiha or opening chapter of the Quran and saying, In the name of Allah, the Compassionating, the Compassionate, with the verse thereof according to the canon of the Imam al Shafi. 5. Bowing the body and keeping it bowed. 6. Returning to the upright posture and so remaining for the time requisite. 7. Prostration and permanence therein. 8. Sitting between two prostrations and permanence therein. 9. Repeating the latter profession of the faith and sitting up therefore. 10. Invoking benediction on the Prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve. 11. The first salutation, and 12. The intent of making an end of prayer expressed in words. But the traditional statutes are the call to prayer, the standing posture, raising the hands to either side of the face whilst pronouncing the prohibition, uttering the magnification before reciting the Fatiha, seeking refuge with Allah, saying Amin, repeating the chapter of the Quran after the Fatiha, repeating the magnifications during change of posture, saying, May Allah hear him who praiseth him, and O our Lord, to thee be the praise, praying aloud in the proper place, and praying under the breath prayers so prescribed the first profession of unity and sitting up thereto, blessing the Prophet therein, 
blessing his family in the latter profession and the second salutation. Question. On what is the zakat or obligatory poor rate taxable? On gold and silver and camels and oxen and sheep and wheat and barley and holcus and millet and beans and vetches and rice and raisins and dates. Question. What is the zakat or poor rate on gold? Below twenty miscals or dinars, nothing, but on that amount half a dinar for every score, and so on proportionately. Question. On silver? Under two hundred dirhams, nothing, then five dirhams on every two hundred, and so forth. Question. On camels? For every five and you or for every twenty-five a pregnant camel. Question. On sheep? And you for every forty head. Question. What are the ordinances of the Ramazan fast? The Quranic are intent, abstinence from eating, drinking, and carnal copulation, and the stoppage of vomiting. It is incumbent on all who submit to the law, save women in their courses, and forty days after childbirth. And it becomes obligatory, on sight of the new moon, or on news of its appearance, brought by a trustworthy person, and commending itself as truth to the hearer's heart. And among its requisites is that the intent be pronounced at nightfall. The traditional ordinances of fasting are hastening to break the fast at sundown, deferring the foredawn meal, and abstaining from speech, save for good works, and for calling on the name of Allah and reciting the Koran. Question. What things vitiate not the fast? The use of unguents and eye powders, and the dust of the road, and the undesigned swallowing of saliva, and the emission of seed in nocturnal pollution, or at the sight of a strange woman, and blooding and cupping. None of these things vitiates the fast. Question. What are the prayers of the two great annual festivals? Two one-bow prayers, which be a traditional ordinance, without call to prayer or standing up to pronounce the call. But let the Moslem say, Prayer is a collector of all folk, and pronounce Allah Akbar seven times in the first prayer, besides the takbir of prohibition, and in the second five times, besides the magnification of rising up, according to the doctrine of the Imam al-Shafi, on whom Allah have mercy, and make the profession of the faith. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and forty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel had answered the doctor anent the festival prayers, quoth he, Thou hast replied aright. Now tell me what are the prayers prescribed on the occasion of an eclipse of the sun or moon. Two one-bow prayers without call to prayer or standing thereto by the worshipper, who shall make in each two-bow prayer double standing up and double inclinations and two-fold prostrations, then sit and testify and salute. Question. What is the ritual of prayer for rain? Two one-bow prayers without call to prayer or standing thereto. Then shall the Moslem make the profession and the salute. Moreover, the Imam shall deliver an exhortation and ask pardon of Allah in place of the magnification, as in the two sermons of the festivals, and turn his mantle upper edge downwards and pray and supplicate. Question. 
What are the witter, the additional or occasional prayers? The least is a one-bow prayer, and the most eleven. Question. What is the forenoon prayer? At least two one-bow prayers, and at most twelve. Question. What hast thou to say of the itikaf, or retreat? It is a matter of traditional ordinance. Question. What are its conditions? 1. Intent. 2. Not leaving the mosque save of necessity. 3. Not having to do with a woman. 4. Fasting. and 5. Abstaining from speech. Question. Under what conditions is the Hajj or pilgrimage obligatory? Manhood, an understanding and being a Moslem, and practicability, in which case it is obligatory on all once before death. Question. What are the Quranic statutes of the pilgrimage? 1. The Ihram or pilgrim's habit. 2. The standing at Arafat. 3. Circumambulating the Kaaba. 4. Running between Safa and Marwa. And 5. Shaving or clipping the hair. Question. What are the Quranic statutes of the Umrah, or lesser pilgrimage? Assuming the pilgrim's habit, and compassing and running. Question. What are the Quranic ordinances of the assumption of the pilgrim's habit? Doffing sewn garments, for swearing perfume, and ceasing to shave the head or pare the nails, and avoiding the killing of game, and eschewing carnal copulation. Question. What are the traditional statutes of the pilgrimage? 1. The crying out, Labaka Atsum, here am I, O our Lord, here am I. 2. The Kaaba circuitings of arrival and departure. 3. The passing of the night at the mosque of Muzdalifa and in the valley of Mina. And 4. The lapidation. Question. What is the jihad or holy war and its essentials? Its essentials are 1. The descent of the infidels upon us. 2. The presence of the imam. 3. A state of preparation. and 4. Firmness in meeting the foe. Its traditional ordinance is entitled to battle, in that the Most High hath said, O thou my prophet, incite the faithful to fight. Question. What are the ordinances of buying and selling? The Quranic are 1. Offer and acceptance, and 2. If the thing sold be a white slave, by whom one profiteth, all possible endeavor to convert him to al-Islam, and 3. To abstain from usury. The traditional are making void and option before not after separating according to his saying, whom Allah bless and preserve. The parties to a sale shall have the option of cancelling or altering terms whilst they are yet unseparated. Question. What is it forbidden to sell for what? On this point I mind me of an authentic tradition reported by Nafi of the Apostle of Allah, that he forbade the barter of dried dates for fresh, and fresh figs for dry, and jerked for fresh meat, and cream for clarified butter. In fine, all eatables of one and the same kind, it is unlawful to buy or barter some for other some. Now when the doctor of law heard her words, and knew that she was wit-keen, penetrative, ingenious, and learned in jurisprudence and the traditions and the interpretation of the Koran and what not else, he said in mind, Needs must I maneuver with her, 
that I may overcome her in the assembly of the commander of the faithful. So he said to her, O damsel, what is the lexicographical meaning of Uzu? And she answered, Philologically it signifieth cleanliness and freedom from impurities. Question. And of Salat or prayer? An invocation of good. Question. And of Gusl? Purification. Question. And of Saum or fasting? Abstention. Question. And of Zakat? Increase. Question. And of Hajj or pilgrimage? Visitation. Question. And of Jihad? Repelling. With this the doctor's arguments were cut off. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and forty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the doctor's arguments were cut off, he rose to his feet and said, Bear witness against me, O commander of the faithful, that this damsel is more learned in the law than I am. Quoth she, I will ask thee somewhat, which do thou answer me speedily, and thou be indeed a learned man. Quoth he, Say on. And she said, What are the arrows of the faith? Answered he, They number ten. One, testification, that is, religion. Two, prayer, that is, the covenant. Three, alms, that is, purification. Four, fasting, that is, defensive armor. Five, pilgrimage, that is, the law. Six, fighting for the faith, that is, a general duty. Seven, bidding to beneficence, and eight, forbidding from frowardness, both of which are a man's honor. Nine, commune, that is, sociableness of the faithful, and ten, seeking knowledge, that is, the praiseworthy path. She rejoined, Thou hast replied aright, and now remaineth but one question. What be the roots or fundamentals of al-Islam? He said, They are four, sincerity of belief, truth of intent, observance of the lawful limit, and keeping the covenant. Then said she, I have one more question to ask thee, which if thou answer it is well, else I will take thy clothes. Quoth he, Speak, O damsel. And she said, What are the branches or superstructure of al-Islam? But he was silent a while, and made no reply. So she cried, Doff thy clothes, and I will expound them to thee. Quoth the caliph, Expound them, and I will make him put off his clothes for thee. She said, There are two and twenty branches. One holding fast to the Book of Allah the Most Highest. 2. Taking example by his Apostle, whom Allah bless and preserve. 3. Abstaining from evil doing. 4. Eating what is lawful. and 5. Avoiding what is unlawful. 6. Restitution of things wrongfully taken. 7. Repentance. 8. Knowledge of the Law 9. Love of the Friend 10. And of the Followers of the True Revelation 11. Belief in the Apostles of Al-Islam 12. Fear of Apostasy 13. Preparation for Departing This Life 14. Force of Conviction 15. 
Mercy on all possible occasions. 16. Strength in time of weakness. 17. Patience under trials. 18. Knowledge of Allah Almighty. And 19. Of what his Prophet hath made known to us. 20. Thwarting Iblis the Accursed. 21. Striving earnestly against the lusts of the soul and warring them down. And 22. Devotion to the One God. Now when the commander of the faithful heard her words, he bade the professor put off his clothes and hooded turbaned. And so did that doctor, and went forth, beaten and confounded, from the caliph's presence. Thereupon another man stood up and said to her, O damsel, hear a few questions from me. Quoth she, Say on. And he asked, What are the conditions of purchase by advance? Whereto she answered, That the price be fixed, the kind be fixed, and the period of delivery be fixed and known. Question. What are the Quranic and the traditional canons of eating? The confession that Allah Almighty provideth the eater and giveth him meat and drink, with thanksgiving to him therefore. Question. What is thanksgiving? The use by the creature of that which the Creator vouchsafeth to him, according as it was created for the creature. Question. What are the traditional canons of eating? The bismillah and washing both hands, sitting on the left of the hind part, eating with three fingers, and eating of that which hath been duly masticated. Question. What are good manners in eating? Taking small mouthfuls, and looking little at one's table companion. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and forty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel had answered concerning good manners in eating, the doctor who was trying her rejoined, Thou hast replied aright. Now tell me, what are the stays of the heart and their supports? The stays and supports both number three. One, holding fast to the faith, the support whereof is the shunning of infidelity. Two, holding fast to the traditional law, and its support the shunning of innovation. And three, holding fast to obedience, and its support the shunning of disobedience. Question. What are the conditions of Uzu? 1. Being a Moslem. 2. Discernment of good and evil. 3. Purity of the water. And 4. Absence of material or religious impediments. Question. What is belief? It is divided into nine parts. 1. Belief in the one worshipped. 2. Belief in the condition of slavery of the worshipper. 3. Belief in the personality of the deity. 4. Belief in the two handfuls. 5. Belief in providence which allotteth to man his lot. 6. Belief in the abrogating. And 7. In the abrogated. 8. Belief in Allah, his angels and apostles. And 9. In foreordained fate, general and individual, its good and ill, its sweet and bitter. Question. What three things do away other three? It is told of Sufyan al sauri that he said, Three things do away with other three. Making light of the pious doth away the future life. Making light of kings 
doth away this life, and making light of expenditure doth away wealth. Question. What are the keys of the heavens, and how many gates have they? Quoth Almighty Allah, and the heaven shall be opened and be full of portals. And quoth he whom Allah bless and preserve, None knoweth the number of the gates of heavens, save he who created the heavens. And there is no son of Adam but hath two gates allotted to him in the heavens, one whereby his daily bread descendeth, and another wherethrough his works ascend. The first gate is not closed, save when his term of life cometh to an end, nor the gate of works, good and evil, till his soul ascend for judgment. Question. Tell me of a thing, and a half thing, and a no thing. The thing is the Moslem, the half thing the hypocrite, and the no thing the miscreant. Question. Tell me of various kinds of hearts. There is the whole heart, the sick heart, the contrite heart, the vowed heart, and the enlightened heart. Now the whole heart is that of Abraham, the friend of Allah. The sick heart is that of the unbeliever in Al-Islam. The contrite heart is that of the pious who fear the Lord. The vowed heart is that of our Lord Muhammad, whom Allah bless and keep. And the illuminated heart is that of his followers. Furthermore, the hearts of learned ulema are of three kinds. The heart which is in love with this world, the heart which loveth the next world, and the heart which loveth its Lord. And it is said that hearts are three, the suspended, that of the infidel, the non-existent, that of the hypocrite, and the constant, that of the true believer. Moreover, it is said that the firm heart is of three kinds, viz. the heart dilated with light and faith, the heart wounded with fear of estrangement, and the heart which feareth to be forsaken of its supreme friend. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 22 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York, May 2011Section 23, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 23, 445th through 448th Night. When it was the 445th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the second doctor declared, Thou hast said well, quoth she to the caliph, O commander of the faithful, he hath questioned me, till he is weary, and now I will ask of him two questions. If he answer them both, it is well, and if not, I will take his clothes, and he shall wend in peace. Quoth the doctor, Ask me what thou wilt, and she said, What sayest thou religion is? Answered he, Religion is confession of faith with the tongue, and conviction with the heart, and correspondent action with the members. He, upon whom be blessings and peace, hath said, 
the believer is not perfect in belief except he perfect himself in five qualities namely trust in allah committal of his affair to allah submission to the commands of allah acquiescence in the decrees of allah and that all he doth be done for the sake of allah so is he of those who are acceptable to the deity and who give to him and withhold for him and such man is perfect in belief then said she what is the divine ordinance of ordinances and the ordinance which is the initiator of all ordinances and that of which all others stand in need and that which comprehendeth all others and what is the traditional ordinance that entereth into the quranic and the prophetic practice whereby the divine is completed but he was silent and made no reply whereupon the caliph bade her expound and ordered him to doff his clothes and give them to her said she o doctor the quranic ordinance of ordinances is the knowledge of allah almighty that which is the initiative of all others is the testifying there is no god but the god and muhammad is the apostle of god that of which all others have need is the uzu ablution that which compriseth all others is the ghusl ablution from defilement the traditional ordinance that entereth into the quranic is the separation of the fingers and the thick beard and that wherewith all quranic ordinances are completed is circumcision therewith was made manifest the defeat of the doctor who rose to his feet and said i call allah to witness o commander of the faithful that this damsel is more learned than i in theology and what pertaineth to the law so saying he put off his clothes and went away ignominiously worsted then she turned to the rest of the learned men present and said o masters which of you is the quranist the reader and reciter of the quran versed in the seven readings and in syntax and in lexicography thereupon a professor arose and seating himself before her said hast thou read the book of almighty allah and made thyself thoroughly acquainted with its signs that is its verses and its abrogating parts and abrogated portions its unequivocal commands and its ambiguous and the difference of its revelations meccan and medinan dost thou understand its interpretation and hast thou studied it according to the various traditions and origins yes answered she and he said what then is the number of its chapters how many are the decades and versets how many words and how many letters and how many acts of prostration and how many prophets and how many chapters are medinan and how many are meccan and how many birds are mentioned in it replied she o my lord its chapters are an hundred and fourteen whereof seventy were revealed at mecca and forty-four at al Madinah, and it containeth six hundred and twenty-one decades six thousand three hundred and thirty-six versets seventy-nine thousand four hundred and thirty-nine words and three hundred and twenty-three thousand and six hundred and seventy letters and to the reader thereof for every letter are given ten benefits the acts of prostration it compriseth are fourteen and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the four hundred and forty-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the professor of quranic exegesis questioned the damsel she continued as regards the prophets named in the book there be five and twenty to wit adam noah abraham 
Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Lot, Elisha, Jonah, Salih, or Heber, Hut, Shuib, or Jethro, David, Solomon, Zulkafl, or Joshua, Idris, Elias, Yahya, or John the Baptist, Zacharias, Job, Moses, Aaron, Jesus, and Muhammad. The peace of Allah and his blessing be on them all. Moreover, nine flying things are mentioned in the Quran, namely the gnat, the bee, the fly, the ant, the hoopoe, the crow, the locust, the swallow, and the bird of Jesus, on whom be peace, to wit, the bat. Question. What is the most excellent chapter of the Quran? That of the cow. Question. Which is the most magnificent verse? That of the throne. It hath fifty words, bearing in each fifty blessings. Question. What sign or verse hath in it nine signs or wonders? That in which quoth Allah Almighty, Verily, in the creation of the heaven and the earth, and in the vicissitude of night and day, and in the ship which saileth through the sea, laden with what is profitable for mankind, and in the rain-water which God sendeth down from heaven, quickening thereby the dead ground, and replenishing the same with all sorts of cattle, and in the change of winds, and in the clouds that are compelled to do service between the heaven and the earth, are signs to people of understanding. Question. Which verse is the most just? That in which Allah saith, Verily Allah enjoineth justice and the doing of good, and the giving unto kindred what shall be necessary, and he forbiddeth wickedness and iniquity and oppression. Question. Which is the most greedy? That in which quoth Allah, Is it that every man of them greedeth to enter the garden of delight? Question. Which is the most hopeful? That in which quoth Almighty Allah, Say, O my servants who have transgressed against your own souls, Despair not of the mercy of Allah, Seeing that Allah forgiveth all sins. I, gracious, merciful, is he. Question. By what school of intonation dost thou read? By that of the people of paradise, to wit, the version of Nafi. Question. In which verse doth Allah make prophets lie? In that wherein he saith, They, the brothers of Joseph, brought his inner garment stained with false blood. Question. In which doth he make unbelievers speak the truth? In that wherein he saith, The Jews say the Christians are grounded on nothing, and the Christians say the Jews are grounded on nothing. And yet they both read the scriptures, and, so saying, all say sooth. Question. In which doth God speak in his own person? In that in which he saith, I have not created jinni and men for any other end than that they should serve me. Question. In which verse do the angels speak? In that which saith, But we celebrate thy praise and extol thy holiness. Question. What sayest thou of the formula, I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the stoned. It is obligatory by commandment of Allah on all before reading the Quran, as appeareth by his saying, When thou readest the Quran, seek refuge with Allah from Satan the stoned. Question. What signify the words, seeking refuge, 
and what are the variants of the formula some say i take refuge with allah the all-hearing and all-knowing and others with allah the strong but the best is that whereof the sublime koran speaketh and the traditions perpetuate and he whom allah bless and keep was used to ejaculate i seek refuge with allah from satan the stoned and quoth a tradition reported by nafi on the authority of his adopted father the apostle of allah was wont when he rose in the night to pray to say aloud al akbar god is most great with all majesty praise be to allah abundantly glory to allah morn and even be then would he say i seek refuge with allah from satan the stoned and from the delusions of the devils and their evil suggestions and it is told of ibn abbas of whom allah accept that he said the first time gabriel came down to the prophet with revelation he taught him the seeking refuge saying o muhammad say i seek refuge with allah the all-hearing and all-knowing then say in the name of allah the compassionating the compassionate read in the name of thy lord who created created man of blood clots now when the koranist heard her words he marveled at her expressions her eloquence her learning her excellence and said o damsel what sayest thou of the verse in the name of allah the compassionating the compassionate is it one of the verses of the Quran? Yes, it is a verset of the ant, occurring also at the head of the first and between every two following chapters. And there is much difference of opinion respecting this among the learned. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and forty seventh night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel had told the professor concerning the difference of opinion among the learned touching the basmala, he said, Thou hast replied aright. Now tell me why is not the formula written at the head of the chapter of immunity? And she answered, When this chapter was revealed from on high for the dissolution of the alliance between the prophet and the idolaters he whom allah bless and preserve sent ali ibn abi talib whose face allah honour therewith and he read the chapter to them but did not read the basmala question what of the excellence of the formula and its blessing it is told of the prophet that he said never is the basmala pronounced over aught but there is a blessing in it and it is reported on authority of him whom allah bless and preserve that the lord of glory swore by his glory that never should the basmala be pronounced over a sick person but he should be healed of his sickness moreover it is said that when allah created the empyrean it was agitated with an exceeding agitation but he wrote on it Bismillah, and its agitation subsided. When the formula first descended from heaven to the prophet, he said, I am safe from three things, earthquake and metamorphosis and drowning. And indeed its boons are great and its blessings too many to enumerate. It is told of Allah's apostle that he said, There will be brought on the judgment day a man with whom he shall reckon and finding no good deed to his account shall order him to the fire but the man will cry o my god thou hast not dealt justly by me then shall allah to whom be honour and glory say how so and the man shall answer o lord for that thou callest thyself the compassionating the compassionate yet wilt thou punish me with the fire and Allah, magnified be his majesty, shall reply, I did indeed name myself the compassionating, the compassionate. Carry my servant to paradise, 
of my mercy, for I am the most merciful of the mercifuls. Question. What was the origin of the use of the Basmala? When Allah sent down from heaven the Quran, they wrote, In thy name, O my God. When Allah revealed the words, Say, Call upon Allah, or call upon the compassionating, what days ye pray, for hath he the most excellent names, they wrote, In the name of Allah, the compassionating, the compassionate. And when he revealed the words, Your God is one God, there is no God but he, the compassionating, the compassionate, they wrote, In the name of Allah, the compassionating, the compassionate. Now when the Quranist heard her reply, he hung down his head, and said to himself, This be a marvel of marvels. How hath this slave girl expounded the origin of the Basmala? But by Allah needs must I go about with her, and happily defeat her. So he asked, Did Allah reveal the Quran all at once, or at times manifold? She answered, Gabriel the faithful, on whom be peace, descended with it from the Lord of the worlds, upon his prophet Muhammad, prince of the apostles, and seal of the prophets, by detached versets, bidding and forbidding, covenanting and comminating, and containing advices and instances in the course of twenty years, as occasion called for it. Question. Which chapter was first revealed? According to Ibn Abbas, that entitled congealed blood, and, according to Jabir bin Abdullah, that called the covered, which preceded all others. Question. Which verset was the last revealed? That of usury. And it is also said the verse, When there cometh Allah's succor and victory. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and forty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel told the Quranist, which was the last verse, he said, Thou hast replied aright. Now tell me the names of the companions who collected the Quran in the lifetime of the Apostle of Allah. And she answered, They were four, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Zaid ibn Sabit, Abu Obaida, Amir bin Jarrah, and Uthman bin Affan. Allah accept of them one and all. Question. Who are the readers from whom the accepted reading of the Quran is taken? They number four. Abdullah bin Masud, Ubay bin Ka'ab, Ma'az bin Jabal, and Salim bin Abdullah. Question. What sayest thou of the words of the Most High, that which is sacrificed to stones? The stones are idols which are set up and worshipped, instead of Allah the Most High, and from this we seek refuge with Allah. Question. What sayest thou of the words of the Most High, thou knowest what is in my soul, and I know not what is in thy soul? They mean... Thou knowest the truth of me, and what is in me, and I know not what is in thee. And the proof of this are his words, Thou art he who wottest the hidden things. And it is said also, Thou knowest my essence, but I know not thine essence. Question. What sayst thou of the words of the Most High? O true believers, forbid not yourselves, the good things which Allah hath allowed you. My Shaykh, on whom Allah have mercy, told me that the companion al zahak related, There was a people of the true believers who said, We will dock our members masculine and don sackcloth, whereupon this verse was revealed. But al Qutada declared that it was revealed on account of sundry companions of the Apostle of Allah, namely, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Uthman bin Musab, and others who said, We will geld ourselves and don hair cloth, 
and make us monks. Question. What sayest thou of the words of the Most Highest? And Allah took Abraham for his friend. The friend of Allah is the needy, the poor, and according to another saying, he is the lover, he who is detached from the world in the love of Allah Almighty, and in whose attachment there is no falling away. Now when the Quranists saw her pass on in speech with the passage of the clouds, and that she stayed not in reply, he rose to his feet and said, I take Allah to witness, O commander of the faithful, that this damsel is more learned than I in Quranic exegesis, and what pertaineth thereto. Then said she, I will ask thee one question, which, if thou answer it, is well. But if thou answer not, I will strip off thy clothes. Quoth the commander of the faithful, Ask on, and she inquired, Which verset of the Koran hath in it three and twenty cuffs? Which sixteen mims? Which an hundred and forty eins? And which section lacketh the formula, To whom belong glory and glorification and majesty? The Koranist could not reply, and she said to him, Put off thy clothes. So he doffed them, and she continued, O commander of the faithful, the verset of the sixteen mims is in the chapter Hood, and is the saying of the Most High, It was said, O Noah, go down in peace from us, and blessing upon thee. That of the three and twenty cuffs is the verse called of the faith, in the chapter of the cow. That of the hundred and forty eins is in the chapter of al -Araf, where the Lord saith, And Moses chose seventy men of his tribe to attend our appointed time, to each man a pair of eyes. And the lesson which lacketh the formula, to whom be glory and glorification, is that which comprises the chapters, The hour draweth nigh, and the moon shall be cloven in twain, the compassionate and the event. Thereupon the professor departed in confusion. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 23 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York Section 24, Volume 5 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 24, 449th through 452nd night. When it was the 449th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel defeated the Koranist, and took off his clothes, and sent him away confused, then came forward the skilled physician, and said to her, We are free of theology, and come now to physiology. Tell me, therefore, how is man made? How many veins, bones, and vertebrae are there in his body? Which is the first and chief vein? And why Adam was named Adam? She replied, Adam was called Adam because of his Udma, that is, the wheaten color of his complexion, and also, it is said, because he was created of the Adim of the earth that is to say, of the surface soil. His breast was made of the earth of the Kaaba, his head of earth from the east, and his legs of earth from the west. There were created for him seven doors in his head, viz. the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, and the mouth, and two passages before and behind. 
The eyes were made the seat of the sight sense, the ears the seat of the hearing sense, the nostrils the seat of the smell sense, the mouth the seat of the taste sense, and the tongue to utter what is in the heart of man. Now Adam was made of a compound of the four elements, which be water, earth, fire, and air. The yellow bile is the humor of fire, being hot dry. The black bile that of earth, being cold dry. The phlegm that of water, being cold moist. And the blood that of air, being hot moist. There were made in man three hundred and sixty veins, two hundred and forty-nine bones, and three souls or spirits, the animal, the rational, and the natural, to each of which is allotted its proper function. Moreover, Allah made him a heart and spleen and lungs and six intestines and a liver and two kidneys and buttocks and brain and bones and skin and five senses, hearing seeing, smell, taste, touch. The heart he set on the left side of the breast, and made the stomach the guide and governor thereof. He appointed the lungs for a fan to the heart, and established the liver on the right side, opposite thereto. Moreover he made, besides this, the diaphragm and the viscera, and set up the bones of the breast, and latticed them with the ribs. Question. How many ventricles are there in a man's head? Three, which contain five faculties, styled the intrinsic senses, to wit, common sense, imagination, the thinking faculty, perception, and memory. Question. Describe to me the configuration of the bones. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fiftieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the physicist said to her, Describe to me the configuration of the bones, she replied, Man's frame consists of two hundred and forty bones, which are divided into three parts the head, the trunk, and the extremities. The head is divided into calvarium and face. The skull is constructed of eight bones, and to it are attached the four oscillates of the ear. The face is furnished with an upper jaw of eleven bones and a lower jaw of one. And to these are added the teeth, two and thirty in number and the os hyoids. The trunk is divided into spinal column, breast, and basin. The spinal column is made up of four and twenty bones, called ficar, or vertebrae, the breast of the breastbone and the ribs, which are four and twenty in number, twelve on each side, and the basin of the hips, the sacrum, and os coccygis. The extremities divided into upper and lower, arms and legs. The arms are again divided, firstly into shoulder, comprising shoulder blades and collar bone, secondly into the upper arm, which is one bone, thirdly into forearm, composed of two bones, the radius and the ulna, and fourthly into the hand, consisting of the wrist, the metacarpus of five, and the fingers, which number five, of three bones each, called the phalanges, except the thumb, which hath but two. The lower extremities are divided, firstly into thigh, which is one bone, secondly into leg, composed of three bones, the tibia, the fibula, and the patella, and thirdly into the foot, divided like the hand, into tarsus, metatarsis and toes, and is composed of seven bones, ranged in two rows, 
two in one and five in the other. And the metatarsus is composed of five bones, and the toes number five, each of three phalanges, except the big toe, which hath only two. Question. Which is the root of the veins? The aorta, from which they ramify, and they are many, none knoweth the tale of them save he who created them, but I repeat, it is said that they number three hundred and sixty. Moreover, Allah hath appointed the tongue as interpreter for the thought, the eyes to serve as lanterns, the nostrils to smell with, and the hands for prehensors. The liver is the seat of pity, the spleen of laughter, and the kidneys of craft. The lungs are ventilators, the stomach the storehouse, and the heart the prop and pillar of the body. When the heart is sound, the whole body is sound, and when the heart is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. Question. What are the outward signs and symptoms evidencing disease in the members of the body, both external and internal? A physician who is a man of understanding looketh into the state of the body and is guided by the feel of the hands according as they are firm or flabby, hot or cool, moist or dry. Internal disorders are also indicated by external symptoms, such as yellowness of the white of the eyes, which denoteth jaundice, and bending of the back, which denoteth disease of the lungs. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fifty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel had described to the doctor the outer signs and symptoms, quoth he, Thou hast replied aright. Now what are the internal symptoms of disease? The science of the diagnosis of disease by internal symptoms is founded upon six canons. 1. The patient's actions. 2. What is evacuated from his body. 3 the nature of the pain, and four, the sight thereof, five, swelling, and six, the effluvia given off his person. Question. How cometh hurt to the head? By the ingestion of food upon food, before the first be digested, and by fullness upon fullness. This it is that wasteth peoples. He who would live long, let him be early with the morning meal, and not late with the evening meal. Let him be sparing of commerce with women, and chary of such depletory measures as cupping and bloodletting. And let him make of his belly three parts, one for food, one for drink, and the third for air. For that a man's intestines are eighteen spans in length, and it befitteth that he appoint six for meat, six for drink, and six for breath. If he walk, let him go gently. It will be wholesomer for him, and better for his body, and more in accordance with the saying of the Almighty, Walk not proudly on the earth. Question. What are the symptoms of yellow bile, and what is to be feared therefrom? The symptoms are sallow complexion and bitter taste in the mouth with dryness, failure of the appetite, venereal and other, and rapid pulse. And the patient hath to fear high fever and delirium, and eruptions and jaundice, and tumor and ulcers of the bowels, and excessive thirst. Question. What are the symptoms of black bile, and what hath the patient to fear from it, and it get the mastery of the body? The symptoms are false appetite, and great mental disquiet, and cark, and care, and it behoveth that it be evacuated, else it will generate melancholia, and leprosy, 
and cancer and disease of the spleen and ulceration of the bowels question into how many branches is the art of medicine divided into two the art of diagnosing diseases and that of restoring the diseased body to health question when is the drinking of medicine more efficacious than other when when the sap runs in the wood and the grape thickens in the cluster and the two auspicious planets jupiter and venus are in the ascendant then setteth in the proper season for drinking of drugs and doing away of disease question what time is it when if a man drink water from a new vessel the drink is sweeter and lighter or more digestible to him than at another time and there ascendeth to him a pleasant fragrance and a penetrating when he waiteth a while after eating as quoth the poet drink not upon thy food in haste but wait a while else thou with halter shall thy frame to sickness lead and patient bear a little thirst from food then drink and thus o brother haply thou shalt win thy need question what food is it that giveth not rise to ailment that which is not eaten but after hunger and when it is eaten the ribs are not filled with it even as saith jalinus or galen the physician whoso will take in food let him go slowly and he shall not go wrongly and to conclude with his saying on whom be blessing and peace the stomach is the house of disease and diet the head of healing for the origin of all sickness is indigestion that is to say corruption of the meat and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the four hundred and fifty-second night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the damsel said to the doctor the stomach is the house of disease and diet is the head of healing for the origin of all sickness is indigestion that is to say corruption of the meat in the stomach he rejoined thou hast replied aright what sayest thou of the hammam let not the full man enter it quoth the prophet the bath is the blessing of the house for that it cleanseth the body and calleth to mind the fire question what hammams are best for bathing in those whose waters are sweet and whose space is ample and which are kept well aired their atmosphere representing the four seasons autumn and summer and winter and spring question what kind of food is the most profitable that which women make and which hath not cost over much trouble and which is readily digested the most excellent of food is bruis or bread sopped in broth according to the saying of the prophet Bruis excelleth other food, even as Aisha excelleth other women. Question. What kind of kitchen or seasoning is the most profitable? Flesh meat, quoth the prophet, is the most excellent of kitchen, for that it is the delight of this world and the next world. Question. What kind of meat is the most profitable? Mutton but jerked meat is to be avoided for there is no profit in it question what of fruits eat them in their prime and quit them when their season is past question what sayest thou of drinking water drink it not in large quantities nor swallow it by gulps or it will give thee headache and cause diverse kinds of harm neither drink it immediately after leaving the haman nor after carnal copulation or eating except it be after the lapse of fifteen minutes for a young man or forty for an old man nor after waking from sleep question 
what of drinking fermented liquors? Doth not the prohibition suffice thee in the book of Almighty Allah, where he saith, Verily wine and lots and images and the divining arrows are an abomination of Satan's work. Therefore avoid them, that ye may prosper. And again, they will ask thee concerning wine and lots. Answer, in both there is great sin, and also some things of use unto men. But their sinfulness is greater than their use. Hence quoth the poet, O bibber of liquor, art not ashamed to drink what Allah forbade thee drain? Put it far from thee, and approach it not. It holds what Allah forbade as bane. And quoth another to the same purport, I drank the sin till my reason fled. I'll drink that reason to loss misled. As for the advantages that be therein, it disperseth stone and gravel from the kidneys, and strengtheneth the viscera, and banisheth care, and moveth to generosity, and preserveth health and digestion. It conserveth the body, expelleth disease from the joints, purifieth the frame of corrupt humours, engendereth cheerfulness, gladdeneth the heart of man, and keepeth up the natural heat. It contracteth the bladder, enforceth the liver, and removeth obstructions, reddeneth the cheeks, cleareth away maggots from the brain, and deferreth gray hairs. In short, had not Allah, to whom be honor and glory, forbidden it, there were not on the face of the earth aught fit to stand in its stead. As for gambling by lots, it is a game of hazard, such as dicing, not of skill. Question. What wine is best? That which is pressed from white grapes and kept eighty days or more after fermentation. It resembleth not water, and indeed there is nothing on the surface of the earth like unto it. Question. What sayest thou of cupping? It is for him who is over full of blood, and who hath no defect therein. And whoso would be cupped, let it be during the wane of the moon, on a day without cloud, wind, or rain, and on the seventeenth of the month. If it fall on a Tuesday, it will be the more efficacious, and nothing is more salutary for the brain and eyes, and for clearing the intellect, than cupping. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 24 Recording by Eva Easton YouTube.com slash user slash Eva Easton Section 25, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 25, 453rd through 456th Night. When it was the 453rd night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel enumerated the benefits of cupping, quoth the doctor, what is the best time for cupping? One should be cupped on the spittle, that is, in the morning before eating, for this fortifieth the wit and the memory. It is reported of the Prophet that when any one complained to him of a pain in the head or legs, he would bid him be cupped, and after cupping not eat salt food, fasting, for it engendereth scurvy. Neither eat sour things as curded milk immediately after cupping. Question. 
when is cupping to be avoided on sabbaths or saturdays and wednesdays and let him who is cupped on these days blame none but himself moreover one should not be cupped in very hot weather nor in very cold weather and the best season for cupping is springtide quoth the doctor now tell me of carnal copulation hereupon tawadud hung her head for shame and confusion before the caliph's majesty then said by allah o commander of the faithful it is not that i am at fault but that i am ashamed though indeed the answer is on the edge of my tongue said the caliph speak o damsel whereupon said she copulation hath in it many and exceeding virtues and praiseworthy qualities amongst which are that it lighteneth the body full of black bile and calmeth the heat of love and induceth affection and dilateth the heart and dispelleth the sadness of solitude and the excess of it is more harmful in summer and autumn than in spring and winter question what are its good effects it banisheth trouble and disquiet calmeth love and wrath and is good for ulcers especially in a cold and dry humour on the other hand excess of it weakeneth the sight and engendereth pains in the legs and head and back and beware beware of carnal connection with old women for they are deadly quoth the imam ali whose face allah honour four things kill and ruin the body entering the haman on a full stomach eating salt food copulation on a plethora of blood and lying with an ailing woman for she will weaken thy strength and infect thy frame with sickness and an old woman is deadly poison and quoth one of them beware of taking an old woman to wife though she be richer in hordes than karun question what is the best copulation if the woman be tender of years comely of shape fair of face swelling of breast and of noble race she will add to thee strength and health of body and let her be even as saith a certain poet describing her seeing thy looks what's she what thou desirest by inspiration wants nor word nor sign and when thou dost behold her rarest grace the charms of every garden canst decline question at what time is copulation good if by night after food digested and if by day after the morning meal question what are the most excellent fruits pomegranate and citron question which is the most excellent of vegetables endive question which of sweet scented flowers rose and violet question how is the seed of man secreted there is in man a vein which feedeth all the other veins now water is collected from the three hundred and sixty veins and in the form of red blood entereth the left testicle where it is decocted by the heat of temperament inherent in the son of adam into a thick white liquid whose odor is as that of the palm spathe question what flying thing is it that emitteth seed and menstruateth the flitter mouse that is the bat question what is that which when confined and shut out from the air liveth and when let out to smell the air dieth the fish question what serpent layeth eggs the suban or dragon 
With this the physician waxed weary with much questioning, and held his peace, when Thawadud said to the caliph, O commander of the faithful, he hath questioned me till he is tired out, and now I will ask him one question, which if he answer not, I will take his clothes as lawful prize. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fifty-fourth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel said to the commander of the faithful, Verily he hath questioned me till he is tired out, and now I will ask him one question, which, if he answer not, I will take his clothes as lawful prize, the caliph cried, Ask on. So quoth she to the physician, What is that thing which resembleth the earth in roundness, whose resting place and whose spine are hidden from men's eyes, little of price and estimation, narrow of chest, and shackled as to throat, though it be nor runaway slave, nor pestilent thief, thrust through and through, though not in fray, and wounded, though not in fight. Time eateth its vigor, and water wasteth it away. Now it is beaten without blemish, and then made to serve without stint. United after separation, submissive, but not to him who caresseth it, pregnant without child in belly, drooping, yet not leaning on its side, becoming dirty, yet purifying itself, cleaving to its fear, yet changing, copulating without a yard, wrestling without arms, resting and taking its ease, bitten, yet not crying out, now more complacent than a cup companion, and then more troublesome than summer heat, leaving its mate by night, and embracing her by day, and having its abode in the corners of the mansions of the noble. The physician was silent a while in perplexity, and his color changed, and he bowed his head, and made no reply. Whereupon she said to him, Ho, oh, sir doctor, speak or doff thy dress. At this he rose and said, O commander of the faithful, bear witness against me that this damsel is more learned than I in medicine and what else, and that I cannot cope with her. And he put off his clothes and fled forth. Quoth the caliph to Tawadud, Re us thy riddle. And she replied, O commander of the faithful, it is the button and the button loop. Then she undertook the astronomers, and said, Let him of you who is an astronomer rise and come forward. So the astronomer advanced and sat down before her. And when she saw him, she laughed and said, Art thou the astronomer, the mathematician, the scribe? Yes, answered he. Quoth she, Ask of what thou wilt. Success resteth with Allah. So he said, Tell me of the sun and its rising and setting. And she replied, Know that the sun riseth from the shadows in the eastern hemisphere, and setteth in the shadows of the western, and each hemisphere compriseth one hundred and eighty degrees. Quoth Allah Almighty, I swear by the Lord of the East and of the West. And again, He it is who hath ordained the sun to shine by day, and the moon for a light by night, and hath appointed her station, that ye might know the number of years and the computation of time. The moon is sultan of the night, and the sun sultan of the day and they vie with each other in their courses, and follow without overtaking each other. 
quoth Almighty Allah, It is not expedient that the sun overtake the moon in her course. Neither doth the night outstrip the day, but each of these luminaries moveth in a peculiar orbit. Question. When the day cometh, what becometh of the night? And what of the day when the night cometh? He causeth the night to enter in upon the day, and he causeth the day to enter in upon the night. Question. Enumerate to me the mansions of the moon. They number eight and twenty, to wit. Sharatan, Butain, Suraya, Dabaran, Haka, Hana, Zira, Nasrach, Tarf, Jaba, Zubra, Sarfa, Awa, Simak, Kafar, Zubani, Iklil, Kalp, Shaula, Naam, Balda, Saad al Zabih, Saad al Bula, Saad al Saud, Saad al Akbia, Fark, the former, and Fark, the latter, and Risha'a. They are disposed in the order of the letters of the Abjad Hawas or older alphabet according to their numerical power, and in them are secret virtues which none knoweth save Allah, extolled and exalted be he, and established in science. They are divided among the twelve signs of the zodiac, two mansions, and a third of a mansion to each sign. Thus, Sharatan, Bhutan, and one-third of Suraya belong to Aries. The other two-thirds of Suraya, the Baran, and two-thirds of Hakka, to Taurus. The other third of Hakka, Hana, and Zira, to Gemini. Nasrach, Tarf, and a third of Jaba, to Cancer. The other two-thirds of Jaba, Zubrach, and two-thirds of Serfa, to Leo. The other third of Serfa, Awa, Simak, to Virgo, Gafar, Zubani, and one-third of Iklil, to Libra, the other two-thirds of Iklil, Kalp, and two-thirds of Shala, to Scorpio, the other third of Shala, Naim, and Balda, to Sagittarius, Sa'ad al-Zabih, Sa'ad al bula and one-third of Sa'ad al-Saud, to Capricorn, the other two-thirds of Sa'ad al-Saud, Sa'ad al-Akbiya, and two-thirds of Farq, the former, to Aquarius. The other third of Farq, the former, Farq, the latter, and Risha, to Pisces. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fifty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel enumerated the mansions and distributed them into their signs, the astronomer said, Thou hast replied aright. Now tell me of the planets and their natures, also of their sojourn in the zodiacal signs, their aspects, auspicious and sinister, their houses, ascendants and descendants. She answered, The sitting is narrow for so large a matter, but I will say as much as I can. Now the planets number seven, which are the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. The sun, hot, dry, sinister in conjunction, favorable in opposition, abideth thirty days in each sign. The moon, cold, moist, and favorable of aspect, tarrieth in each sign two days and a third of another day. Mercury, 
is of a mixed nature, favorable in conjunction with the favorable, and sinister in conjunction with the sinister aspects, and abideth in each sign seventeen days and a half day. Venus, temperate and favorable, abideth in each sign five and twenty days. Mars is sinister and woneth in each sign ten months. Jupiter is auspicious and abideth in each sign a year. Saturn, cold, dry, and sinister, tarrieth in each sign thirty months. The house of the sun is Leo. Her ascendant is Aries, and her descendant Aquarius. The moon's house is Cancer, his ascendant Taurus, his descendant Scorpio, and his sinister aspect Capricorn. Saturn's house is Capricorn Aquarius, his ascendant Libra, his descendant Aries, and his sinister aspects Cancer and Leo. Jupiter's house is Pisces Sagittarius, his ascendant Cancer, his descendant Capricorn, and his sinister aspects Gemini and Leo. Venus's house is Taurus, her ascendant Pisces, her descendant Libra, and her sinister aspects Aries and Scorpio. Mercury's house is Gemini Virgo, his ascendant Virgo, his descendant Pisces, and his sinister aspect, Taurus. Mars' house is Aries Scorpio, his ascendant Capricorn, his descendant Cancer, and his sinister aspect, Libra. Now when the astronomer saw her acuteness and comprehensive learning, and heard her fair answers, he bethought him for a slight to confound her before the commander of the faithful, and said to her, O damsel, tell me, will rain fall this month? At this she bowed her head and pondered so long that the caliph thought her at a loss for an answer, and the astronomer said to her, Why dost thou not speak? Quoth she, I will not speak except the commander of the faithful give me leave. So the caliph laughed and said, How so? Cried she, I would have thee give me a sword, that I may strike off his head, for he is an infidel, an agnostic, an atheist. At this loud laughed the caliph, and those about him laughed. And she continued, O astronomer, there are five things that none knoweth save Allah Almighty and she repeated the verset, I, Allah, with him is the knowledge of the hour, and he causeth the rain to descend at his own appointed time, and he knoweth what is in the wombs of females, but no soul knoweth what it shall have gotten on the morrow, neither woteth any soul in what land it shall die. Verily Allah is knowing informed of all. Quoth the astronomer, Thou hast said well, and I, by Allah, thought only to try thee. Rejoined she, Know that the almanac makers have certain signs and tokens referring to the planets and constellations relative to the coming in of the year, and folk have learned something by experience. Question. What be that? Each day hath a planet that ruleth it. So if the first day in the year fall on first day, Sunday, that day is the sun's, and this portendeth, though Allah alone is all-knowing, oppression of kings and sultans and governors, and much miasma and lack of rain, and that people will be in great tumult, and the grain crop will be good except lentils, which will perish, and the vines will rot, and flax will be dear, and wheat cheap, from the beginning of Tuba to the end of Barmahat. And in this year there will be much fighting among kings, and there shall be great plenty of good in this year, but Allah is all-knowing. 
Question. What if the first day fall on second day, Monday? That day belongeth to the moon, and portendeth righteousness in administrators and officials, and that it will be a year of much rain, and grain crops will be good. But linseed will decay, and wheat will be cheap in the month Kiak. Also the plague will rage, and the sheep and goats will die. Grapes will be plentiful, and honey scarce, and cotton cheap. And Allah is omniscient. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fifty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel ended her notice of second day, the astronomer said to her, Now tell me what will occur if New Year's Day fall on third day, Tuesday. She replied, This is Mars Day, and portendeth death of great men, and much destruction, and deluge of blood, and dearness of grain, lack of rain, and scarcity of fish, which will anon be in excess, and anon fail. Lentils and honey in this year will be cheap, and linseed dear, and only barley will thrive, to the exception of all other cereals. Great will be the fighting among kings, and death will be in the blood, and there will be much mortality among asses. Question. What if it fall on fourth day? That is Mercury's day, and portendeth great tumult among the folk, and much enmity, and though rains be moderate, rotting of some of the green crops. Also, that there will be sore mortality among cattle and young children, and much fighting by sea. That wheat will be dear from Barmuda to Misra, and other grains cheap. Thunder and lightning will abound, and honey will be dear. Palm trees will thrive and bear abundantly, and flax and cotton will be plentiful, while radishes and onions will be dear. But Allah is all-knowing. Question. What if it fall on fifth day? That is Jupiter's day, and portendeth equity in wazirs, and righteousness in kazis and fakirs, and the ministers of religion. And that good will be plentiful. Rains and fruit and trees and grain will abound. And flax, cotton, honey, grapes, and fish be cheap. And Allah is omniscient. Question. What if it fall on meeting day or Friday? That day appertaineth to Venus, and portendeth oppression in the chiefs of the jinn, and talk of forgery and backbiting. There will be much dew, the autumn crops will be good in the land, and there will be cheapness in one town and not in another. Ungraciousness will be rife by land and sea. Linseed will be dear, also wheat in Hatur, but cheap in Amshir. Honey will be dear, and grapes and watermelons will rot, and Allah is omniscient. Question. What if it fall on the Sabbath, Saturday? That is Saturn's day, and portendeth the preferment of slaves and Greeks, and those in whom there is no good neither in their neighborhood. There will be great drought and dearth. Clouds will abound, and death will be rife among the sons of Adam, and woe to the people of Egypt and Syria from the oppression of the sultan, and failure of blessing upon the green crops, and rotting of grain. And Allah is all-knowing. Now with this the astronomer hung his head very low, and she said to him, O astronomer, I will ask thee one question, which if thou answer not, I will take thy clothes. Ask, replied he. Quoth she, Where is Saturn's dwelling place? And he answered, In the seventh heaven. Question, And that of Jupiter? In the sixth heaven. Question, And that of Mars? 
in the fifth heaven question and that of the sun in the fourth heaven question and that of venus in the third heaven question and that of mercury in the second heaven question and that of the moon in the first heaven quoth she well answered but i have one more question to ask thee and quoth he ask accordingly she said now tell me concerning the stars into how many parts are they divided but he was silent and answered nothing and she cried to him put off thy clothes so he doffed them and she took them after which the caliph said to her tell us the answer to thy question she replied o commander of the faithful the stars are divided into three parts whereof one third is hung in the sky of the earth as it were lamps to give light to the earth and a part is used to shoot the demons withal when they draw near by stealth to listen to the talk in heaven quoth allah almighty verily we have dight the sky of the earth with the adornment of the stars and have appointed them for projectiles against every rebellious satan and the third part is hung in air to illuminate the seas and give light to what is therein quoth the astronomer i have one more question to ask which if she answer i will avow myself beaten say on answered she and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 25 recording by eva easton slotesburg new york may 2011section 26 volume 5 of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by eva easton the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 26, 457th through 460th Night. When it was the 457th night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the astronomer said, Now tell me what four contraries are based upon other four contraries replied she the four qualities of caloric and frigoric humidity and sixity for of heat allah created fire whose nature is hot dry of dryness earth which is cold dry of cold water which is cold wet of moisture air which is hot wet moreover he created twelve signs of the zodiac aries taurus gemini cancer leo virgo libra scorpio sagittarius capricorn aquarius and pisces and appointed them of the four humors three fiery aries leo and sagittarius three earthly taurus virgo and capricorn three airy gemini libra and aquarius and three watery cancer scorpio and pisces hereupon the astronomer rose and saying bear witness against me that she is more learned than i away he went beaten then quoth the caliph where is the philosopher at which one rose hastily and came forward and said to tawadud what is time and what be its limits and its days 
and what things bringeth it? Replied she, Time is a term applied to the hours of the night and day, which are but the measures of the courses of the sun and moon in their several heavens, even as Allah Almighty telleth us when he saith, Assigned to them also is the night, from which we strip off the day, and lo, they are plunged in darkness, and the sun runneth to her place of rest. This is the ordinance of the sublime, the all-knowing. Question. How cometh unbelief to the son of Adam? It is reported of the apostle, whom Allah bless and preserve, that he said, Unbelief in a man runneth as the blood runneth in his veins, when he revileth the world and time and night and the hour. And again, let none of you revile time, for time is God, neither revile the world, for she saith, May Allah not aid him who revileth me. Neither revile the hour, for the hour is surely coming, there is no doubt thereof. Neither revile the earth, for it is a portent, according to the saying of the Most High, Out of the ground have we created you, and into the same will we cause you to return. And we will bring you forth yet thence another time. Question. What are the five that ate and drank, yet came not out of loins nor womb? Adam and Simeon, and Selis she-camel, and Ishmael's ram, and the bird that Abu Bakr the truth-teller saw in the cave. Question. Tell me of five that are in paradise, and are neither humans, jinns, nor angels. Jacob's wolf, and the seven sleeper's dog, and Estras's ass, and Sully's camel, and Duldul the mule of the prophet, upon whom be blessings and peace. Question. What man prayed a prayer neither on earth nor in heaven? Solomon, when he prayed on his carpet, borne by the wind. Question. Read me this riddle. A man once looked at a handmaid during dawn prayer, and she was unlawful to him. But at noonday she became lawful to him. By mid-afternoon she was again unlawful, but at sundown she was lawful to him. At supper-time she was a third time unlawful, but by daybreak she became once more lawful to him. This was a man who looked at another slave-girl in the morning, and she was then unlawful to him. But at midday he bought her, and she became lawful to him. At mid-afternoon he freed her, and she became unlawful to him. But at sundown he married her, and she was again lawful to him. At nightfall he divorced her, and she was then a third time unlawful to him. But next morning at daybreak he took her back, and she became once more lawful to him. Question. Tell me what tomb went about with him that laid buried therein. Jonah's wail when it had swallowed him. Question. What spot of low land is it upon which the sun shone once, but will never again shine till judgment day? The bottom of the Red Sea, when Moses smote it with his staff, and the sea clave asunder in twelve places, according to the number of the tribes. Then the sun shone on the bottom, and will do so never more until judgment day. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and fifty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the philosopher then addressed the damsel, saying, What was the first skirt that trailed over the face of the earth? She replied, That of Hagar, out of shame before Sarah, and it became a custom among the Arabs. Question. 
what is that which breatheth without life quoth almighty allah by the morning when it breatheth question re me this riddle a number of pigeons came to a high tree and lighted some on the tree and others under it said those on the tree to those on the ground if one of you come up to us ye will be a third part of us all in number and if one of us descend to you we shall be like unto you in number how many pigeons were there in all twelve seven alighted on the tree and five beneath and if one go up those above would be eight to four and if one go down both would be six and allah is all-knowing with this the philosopher put off his clothes and fled whereupon the next contest took place for she turned to the ulema present and said which of you is the rhetorician that can discourse on all arts and sciences there came forward a sage hight ibrahim bin siyar and said to her think me not like the rest quoth she it is the more assured to me that thou wilt be beaten for that thou art a boaster and allah will help me to victory over thee that i may strip thee of thy clothes so if thou sentest one to fetch thee wherewithal to cover thyself twould be well for thee cried he by allah i will assuredly conquer thee and make thee a byword among the peoples generation after generation rejoined she do penance in advance for thy broken oath then he asked what five things did allah create before he made man and she answered water and earth and light and darkness and the fruits of the earth question what did allah create with the hand of omnipotence the arsh throne of god or the imperial heaven and the tree tuba and adam and the garden of eden these allah created with the hand of his omnipotence but to all other created things he said be and they were question who is thy father in al-islam muhammad whom allah bless and preserve question who was the father in al-islam of muhammad abraham the friend of god question what is the faith of al-islam the professing that there is no god but the god and that muhammad is the apostle of god question what is thy first and thy last my first is man's seed in the shape of foul water and my last filthy carrion the first of me is dust and the last of me is dust quoth the poet of dust was i created and man did i become in question ever ready and i fluent in reply then i unto the dust returned became of it again for that in very deed of dust at first create was i he continued what thing was it whose first state was wood and its last life moses staff when he cast it on the valley ground and it became by permission of allah a writhing serpent question what is the meaning of the word of the lord and i have other occasion for it he moses was wont to plant his staff in the ground and it would flower and fruit and shade him from the heat and from the cold moreover it would carry him when he was weary and whilst he slept guard his sheep from lions and wild beasts question what woman was born of a man alone and what man of a woman alone eve of adam and jesus of mary question tell me of the four fires what fire eateth and drinketh what fire eateth but drinketh not what fire drinketh but eateth not 
and what other neither eateth nor drinketh the fire of the world eateth but drinketh not the fire which eateth and drinketh is hell fire the fire of the sun drinketh but eateth not and the fire of the moon neither eateth nor drinketh question which is the open door and which the shut the traditional ordinances are the open door the quranic the shut door Question. Of what doth the poet speak when he saith, And dweller in the tomb, whose food is at his head, When he eateth of that meat, of words he waxeth fain, He riseth, and he walketh, and he talketh without tongue, And returneth to the tomb, where his kith and kin are lain. No living wight is he, yet in honour he abides, nor dead yet he deserveth that allah him a sane she replied the reed pen quoth he what doth the poet refer to in these verses two vests in one blood flowing easiest wise rosy red ears and mouth wide open lies it hath a cock-like form its belly pecks and if you price it half a dirham buys she replied the ink case quoth he and in these ho say to men of wisdom wit and lore to sapient reverend clever counsellor tell me what was you saw that bird bring forth when wandering arab land and a jam o'er no flesh it beareth and it hath no blood nor down nor any feathers e'er it wore tis eaten cooked and eke tis eaten cold tis eaten buried neath the flames that roar it showeth twofold colours silver white and yellow brighter than pure golden ore tis not seen living or we count it dead so re my riddle rich in marvel store she replied thou makest longsome the questioning anent an egg worth a mite question and this i waved to and fro and he waved to and fro with a motion so pleasant now fast and now slow and at last he sunk down on my bosom of snow your lover friend no friend my fan said she question how many words did allah speak to moses it is related of the apostle that he said god spoke to moses fifteen hundred and fifteen words question tell me of fourteen things that speak to the lord of the worlds the seven heavens and the seven earths when they say we come obedient to thy command and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the four hundred and fifty-ninth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the damsel made the answer the philosopher continued tell me of adam and how he was first created and she said allah created adam of clay the clay he made of foam and the foam of the sea the sea of darkness darkness of light light of a fish the fish of a rock the rock of a ruby the ruby of water and the water he created by his omnipotence according to his saying exalted be his name his commandment when he willeth aught is but to say be and it is question what is meant by the poet in these verses and eater lacking mouth and even maw yet trees and beasts to it are daily bread well fed it thrives and shows a lively life but give it water and you do it dead this quoth she is fire and in these he asked two lovers barred from every joy and bliss who through the livelong night embracing lie 
They guard the folk from all calamities, but with the rising sun apart they fly? She answered, The leaves of a door. Quoth he, Tell me of the gates of Gehenna. Quoth she, They are seven in number, and their names are comprised in these two couplets. Jahannam, next Laza, and third Hatim. Then count Sa'ir and Sakar Ik, fivefold. Sixth comes Jahim and Hawiya the seventh. Here are seven hells in four lines briefly told. Quoth he, To what doth the poet refer when he saith, She wears a pair of ringlets long let down behind her, as she comes and goes at speed. And I, that never tastes of sleep, nor sheds a tear, for ne'er a drop it hath at need, that never all its life wore stitch of clothes, yet robes mankind in every mode of weed. Quoth she, a needle. Question. What is the length and what the breadth of the bridge Al-Sirat? Its length is three thousand years' journey, a thousand in descent, and a thousand in ascent, and a thousand level. It is sharper than a sword, and finer than a hair. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel had described to him Al-Sirat, the philosopher said, Inform me how many intercessions with Allah hath the Prophet for each soul. 3. Question. Was Abu Bakr the first who embraced Al-Islam? Yes. Question. Yet Ali became a Muslim before him? Ali came to the Prophet when he was a boy of seven years old, for Allah vouchsafed him knowledge of the way of salvation in his tender youth, so that he never prostrated himself to idols. Quoth he, Tell me which is the more excellent, Ali or Abbas? Now she knew that, in propounding this question, Ibrahim was laying a trap for her. For if she said Ali is more excellent than Abbas, she would lack excuse with the caliph for undervaluing his ancestor. So she bowed her head a while, now reddening, then paling, and lastly said, Thou askest me of two excellent men, each having his own excellence. Let us return to what we were about. When the caliph Harun al-Rashid heard her, he stood up and said, Thou hast spoken well by the lord of the Kaaba, O Tawadud. Then quoth Ibrahim the rhetorician, What meaneth the poet when he saith, Slim-waisted one whose taste is sweet as sweet, Likest a lance whereupon no head we scan, And all the lieges find it work them wheel, Eaten of afternoon in Ramazan. She answered, The sugar cane, and he said, Tell me of many things. Asked she, What are they? And he said, what is sweeter than honey? What is sharper than the sword? What is swifter than poison? What is the delight of a moment, and what the contentment of three days? What is the pleasantest of days? What is the joy of a week? What is that debt the worst debtor denieth not? What is the prison of the tomb? What is the joy of the heart? What is the snare of the soul? What is death in life? What is the disease that may not be healed? What is the shame that may not be wiped off? What is the beast that woneth not in cultivated fields, but lodgeth in waste places, and hateth the sons of Adam, and hath in him somewhat of the make of seven strong and violent beasts? Quoth she, Hear what I shall say in reply, then put off thy clothes, that I may explain to thee. And the caliph said, Expound, and he shall doff his clothes. 
So she said, Now that which is sweeter than honey is the love of pious children to their two parents. That which is sharper than the sword is the tongue. That which is swifter than poison is the envier's eye. The delight of a moment is carnal copulation, and the contentment of three days is the depilatory for women. The pleasantest of days is that of profit on merchandise. The joy of a week is the bride. The debt which the worst debtor denieth not is death. The prison of the tomb is a bad son. The joy of the heart is a woman obedient to her husband. And it is said also that when flesh meat descendeth upon the heart, it rejoiceth therein. The snare of the soul is a disobedient slave. Death in life is poverty. The disease that may not be healed is an ill nature, and the shame that may not be wiped away is an ill daughter. Lastly, the beast that woneth not in cultivated fields, but lodgeth in waste places, and hateth the sons of Adam, and hath in him somewhat of the make of seven strong and violent beasts, is the locust, whose head is as the head of a horse, its neck as the neck of a bull, its wings as the wings of the vulture, its feet as the feet of the camel, its tail as the tail of the serpent, its belly as the belly of the scorpion, and its horns as the horns of the gazelle. The caliph was astounded at her quickness and understanding, and said to the rhetorician, Doff thy clothes. So he rose up and cried, I call all who are present in this assembly to witness that she is more learned than I and every other learned man. And he put off his clothes and gave them to her, saying, Take them, and may Allah not bless them to thee. So the caliph ordered him fresh clothes and said, O Tawadud, there is one thing left of that for which thou didst engage, namely, chess. And he sent for experts of chess and cards and triktrak. The chess player sat down before her, and they set the pieces, and he moved, and she moved. But every move he made she speedily countered. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 26 Recording by Eva Easton Slotesburg, New York, May 2011. Section 27, Volume 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 5, Section 27, 461st through 464th Night When it was the 461st night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the damsel was playing chess with the expert, in presence of the commander of the faithful, Harun al-Rashid, whatever move he made was speedily countered by her, till she beat him and he found himself checkmated. Quoth he, I did but lead thee on that thou mightest think thyself skilful, but set up again, and thou shalt see. So they placed the pieces a second time, when he said in himself, Open thine eyes, or she will beat thee. And he fell to moving no piece, save after calculation, and ceased not to play till she said, Thy king is dead, checkmate. When he saw this, he was confounded at her quickness and understanding. But she laughed and said, 
O Professor, I will make a wager with thee on this third game. I will give thee the queen and the right-hand castle, and the left-hand knight. If thou beat me, take my clothes, and if I beat thee, I will take thy clothes. Replied he, I agree to this, and they replaced the pieces, she removing queen, castle, and knight. Then, said she, Move, O master. So he moved, saying to himself, I cannot but beat her with such odds, and planned a combination. But behold, she moved on, little by little, till she made one of her pawns a queen, and pushing up to him pawns and other pieces to take off his attention, set one in his way and tempted him to take it. Accordingly he took it, and she said to him, The measure is meted, and the loads equally balanced. Eat till thou art over full. Naught shall be thy ruin, O son of Adam, save thy greed. Knowest thou not that I did but tempt thee, that I might finesse thee? See, this is checkmate, adding, So doff off thy clothes. Quoth he, Leave me my bag trousers, so Allah repay thee. And he swore by Allah that he would contend with none, so long as Tawadud abode in the realm of Baghdad. Then he stripped off his clothes, and gave them to her, and went away. Thereupon came the backgammon player, and she said to him, If I beat thee this day, what wilt thou give me? Quoth he, I will give thee ten suits of brocade of Constantinople, figured with gold, and ten suits of velvet, and a thousand gold pieces. And if I beat thee, I ask nothing but that thou write me an acknowledgment of my victory. Quoth she, To it then, and do thy best. So they played, and he lost, and went away chattering in Frankish jargon, and saying, By the bounty of the commander of the faithful, there is not like her in all the regions of the world. Then the caliph summoned players on instruments of music, and asked her, Dost thou know aught of music? When she answered, Even so, he bade bring a worn lute, polished by use, whose owner, forlorn and lone, was by parting trodden down, and of which quoth one, describing it, Allah watered a land, and up sprang a tree, struck root deep down, and raised head a sky. The birds o'er sang it when green its wood, and the fair o'er sing now the wood is dry. So they brought the lute in a bag of red satin, with tassels of saffron-colored silk, and she opened the bag and took it out, and behold, on it was graven. Oft hath a tender bough made lute for maid, Whose swift sweet lays at feast men's hearts invade. She sings, it follows on her song, As though the bulbuls taught her all the modes she played. She laid her lute in her lap, And with bosom inclining over it, Bent to it with the bending of a mother Who suckleth her child. Then she preluded in twelve different modes, till the whole assembly was agitated with delight like a waving sea, and she sang the following. Cut short this strangeness, leave unruth of you, my heart shall love you I by youth of you. Have ruth on one who sighs and weeps and moans, pining and yearning for the troth of you. The caliph was ravished, and exclaimed, Allah bless thee, and be merciful to him who taught thee. Whereupon she rose and kissed the ground before him. Then he sent for money, and paid her master, Abu al Husn an hundred thousand gold pieces to her price. After which he said to her, O Tawadud, ask a boon of me. Replied she, I ask of thee that thou restore me to my lord who sold me. 
"'Tis well,' answered the caliph, and restored her to her master, and gave her five thousand dinars for herself. Moreover, he appointed Abu al Husn, one of his cup companions, for a permanence. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph gave the damsel five thousand dinars for herself, and restored her to her master, whom he appointed one of his cup companions for a permanence, and assigned him a monthly stipend of a thousand dinars so long as he should live. And he abode with the damsel Tawadud in all solace and delight of life. Marvel then, O king, at the eloquence of this damsel, and the hugeness of her learning and understanding, and her perfect excellence in all branches of art and science. And consider the generosity of the commander of the faithful, Harun al-Rashid, in that he gave her master this money, and said to her, ask a boon of me and she besought him to restore her to her lord so he restored her to him and gave her five thousand dinars for herself and made him one of his boon companions where is such generosity to be found after the abbasid caliphs may allah almighty have mercy upon them one and all and they tell a tale of the angel of death with the proud king and the devout man it is related o auspicious king that one of the olden monarchs was once minded to ride out in state with the officers of his realm and the grandees of his retinue and display to the folk the marvels of his magnificence so he ordered his lords and emirs equip them therefore and commanded his keeper of the wardrobe to bring him of the richest of raiment, such as befitted the king in his state. And he bade them bring his steeds of the finest breeds and pedigrees every man heeds. Which, being done, he chose out of the raiment which rejoiced him most, and of the horses that which he deemed best. And donning the clothes, together with a collar set with marguerites and rubies and all manner jewels, mounted and set forth in state making his destrier prance and curvet among his troops and glorying in his pride and despotic power and iblis came to him and laying his hand upon his nose blew into his nostrils the breath of hauteur and conceit so that he magnified and glorified himself and said in his heart who among men is like unto me and he became so puffed up with arrogance and self-sufficiency, and so taken up with the thought of his own splendor and magnificence, that he would not vouchsafe a glance to any man. Presently there stood before him one clad in tattered clothes, and saluted him. But he returned not his salam, whereupon the stranger laid hold of his horse's bridle, Lift thy hand, cried the king. Thou knowest not whose bridal rein it is, whereof thou takest hold. Quoth the other, I have a need of thee. Quoth the king, Wait till I alight, and then name thy need. Rejoined the stranger, It is a secret, and I will not tell it but in thine ear. So the king bowed his head to him, and he said, I am the angel of death and I purpose to take thy soul. Replied the king, Have patience with me a little, whilst I return to my house and take leave of my people and children and neighbors and wife. By no means so, answered the angel. Thou shalt never return nor look on them again, for the fated term of thy life is past. So saying, he took the soul of the king who fell off his horse's back dead, and departed thence. Presently the death angel met a devout man, of whom Almighty Allah had accepted and saluted him. He returned the salute, 
And the angel said to him, O pious man, I have a need of thee which must be kept secret. Tell it in my ear, quoth the devotee, and quoth the other, I am the angel of death, replied the man, Welcome to thee, and praise be Allah for thy coming. I am aweary of awaiting thine arrival, for indeed long hath been thine absence from the lover which longeth for thee. Said the angel, If thou have any business, make an end of it. But the other answered, saying, There is nothing so urgent to me as the meeting with my Lord, to whom be honor and glory. And the angel said, How wouldst thou fain have me take thy soul? I am bidden to take it as thou willest and choosest. He replied, Tarry till I make the uzu ablution and pray, and when I prostrate myself, then take my soul while my body is on the ground. Quoth the angel, Verily, my lord, be he extolled and exalted, commanded me not to take thy soul but with thy consent, and as thou shouldst wish, so I will do thy will. Then the devout man made the minor ablution and prayed. And the angel of death took his soul in the act of prostration, and Almighty Allah transported it to the place of mercy and acceptance and forgiveness. And they tell another tale of the angel of death and the rich king. A certain king had heaped up coin beyond count, and gathered store of all precious things, which Allah the Most Highest hath created. So, in order that he might take his pleasure whenas he should find leisure to enjoy all this abounding wealth he had collected, he built him a palace wide and lofty, such as befitteth and beseemeth kings, and set thereto strong doors, and appointed for its service and its guard, servants and soldiers and doorkeepers, to watch and ward. One day he bade the cooks dress him somewhat of the goodliest of food, and assembled his household and retainers and boon companions and servants to eat with him and partake of his bounty. Then he sat down upon the sofa of his kingship and dominion, and propping his elbow upon the cushion, addressed himself, saying, O soul, thou hast gathered together all the wealth of the world. So now take thy leisure therein, and eat of this good at thine ease, in long life and prosperity ever rife. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that hardly had the king made an end of saying to himself, Eat of this wheel at thine ease, in long life and prosperity ever rife, when a man clad in tattered raiment, with an asker's wallet hanging at his neck, as he were one who came to beg food, knocked with the door ring, a knock so loud and terrible, that the whole palace shook, as with quake of earth, and the king's throne trembled. The servants were affrighted, and rushed to the door, and when they saw the man who had knocked, they cried out at him, saying, Woe to thee! What manner of unmannerly fashion be this? Wait till the king eateth, and we would then give thee of what is left. Quoth he, Tell your lord to come out and speak with me, for I have of him a pressing need and a matter to heed. They cried, Away, fool! Who art thou that we should bid our Lord come forth to thee? But he said, Tell him of this. So they went in and told the king, who said, Did ye not rebuke him, and draw upon him, and threaten him? Now as he spoke, behold, there came another knock at the gate, louder than the first knock, whereupon the servants sprang at the stranger with staves and weapons to fall upon him and slay him. But he shouted at them, saying, Bide in your steads, 
for I am the angel of death. Hereat their hearts quaked, and their wits forsook them, their understandings were in confusion, their side muscles quivered in perturbation, and their limbs lost the power of motion. Then said the king to them, Tell him to take a substitute in my place, and one to relieve me in this case. But the angel answered, saying, I will take no substitute, and I come not but on thine account, to cause separation between thee and the goods thou hast gathered together, and the riches thou hast heaped up and entreasured. When the king heard this, he wept and groaned, saying, Allah cursed the treasure which hath deluded and undone me and diverted me from the service of my Lord. I deemed it would profit me, but today it is a regret for me and a calamity to me, and behold, I go forth empty handed of it and leave it to my foes. Thereupon Allah caused the treasure to speak out, and it said, Wherefore cursest thou me? Curse thyself, for Allah created both me and eke thyself of the dust, and appointed me to be in thine hand, that thou mightest provide thee with me a viaticum for the next world, and give alms with me to the poor, and the needy, and the sick, and build mosques, and hospices, and bridges, and aqueducts, so might I be an aidance unto thee in the world to come. But thou didst garner me, and hoard me up, and on thine own vanities bestowedst me. Neither gavest thou thanks for me, as was due, but wast ungrateful to me, and now thou must leave me to thy foes, and thou hast not saved thy regretting and thy repenting. But what is my sin, that thou shouldst revile me? Then the angel of death took the king's soul, as he sat on his throne, before he ate of the food, and he fell down dead. Quoth Allah Almighty, While they were rejoicing for that which had been given them, we suddenly laid hold on them, and behold, they were seized with despair. And they tell another tale of the angel of death and the king of the children of Israel. There was a puissant despot, among the kings of the Banu Israel, who sat one day upon the throne of his kingship, when he saw come in to him by the gate of the hall a man of forbidding aspect and horrible presence. The king was affrighted at his sudden intrusion, and his look terrified him. So he sprang up before him and said, Who art thou, O man? Who gave thee leave to come in to me? And who invited thee to enter my house? Quoth the stranger, Verily the Lord of the house sent me to thee, nor can any doorkeeper exclude me, nor need I leave to come in to kings. For I reck not of a sultan's majesty, neither of the multitude of his guards. I am he from whom no tyrant is at rest, nor can any man escape from my grasp. I am the destroyer of delights and the sunderer of societies. Now when the king heard this, a palsy crept over him, and he fell on his face in a swoon. But presently coming to himself, he asked, Art thou then the angel of death? And the stranger answered, Yes. I conjure thee by Allah, quoth the king, grant me one single day's respite, that I may pray pardon of my sins, and ask absolution of my Lord, and restore to their rightful owners the monies which are in my treasures, so I may not be burdened with the woe of a reckoning, nor with the misery of punishment therefore. Replied the angel, Well away, well away, this may be in no way. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixty-fourth night, she said, 
it hath reached me o auspicious king that quoth the death messenger to the king well away well away this may be in no way how can i grant thee a reprieve when the days of thy life are counted and thy breaths numbered and thy moments fixed and written grant me an hour asked the king but the angel answered saying the hour was in the account and hath sped and thou unheeding aught and hath fled and thou taking no thought and now thy breathings are accomplished and there remaineth to thee but one breath quoth the king who will be with me when i am transported to my tomb quoth the angel not will be with thee but thy works good or evil i have no works said the king and the angel doubtless thy long home will be in hell-fire and thy doom the wrath of the almighty then he seized the soul of the king and he fell off his throne and dropped on the earth dead and there arose a mighty weeping and wailing and clamour of keening for him among the people of his court and had they known that to which he went of the wrath of his lord their weeping for him had been sorer and their wailing louder and more abounding and a story is told of iskandar zu al karnain and a certain tribe of poor folk it is related that iskandar zu al karnain once came in his journeyings upon a tribe of small folk who owned naught of the wheels of the world and who dug their graves over against the doors of their houses and were wont at all times to visit them and sweep the earth from them and keep them clean and pray at them and worship almighty allah at them and they had no meat save grasses and the growth of the ground so iskandar sent a man to summon their king but he refused to come saying i have no need of him thereupon iskandar went to him and said how is it with you and what manner of men are ye for i see with you forsooth not of gold or silver nor find i with you aught of the wheels of the world answered the king none hath his fill of the wheels of the world iskandar then asked why do you dig your graves before your house doors and the king answered that they may be the perspective of our eye glances so we may look on them and ever renew talk and thought of death neither forget the world to come and on this wise the love of the world be banished from our hearts and we be not thereby distracted from the service of our lord the almighty quoth iskandar why do ye eat grasses and the other replied because we abhor to make our bellies the tombs of animals and because the pleasure of eating outstrippeth not the gullet then putting forth his hand he brought out a skull of a son of adam and laying it before iskandar said o zu al karnain lord of the two horns knowest thou who owned this skull quoth he nay and quoth the other he who owned this skull was a king of the kings of the world who dealt tyrannously with his subjects specially wronging the weak and wasting his time in heaping up the rubbish of this world till allah took his sprite and made the fire his abiding sight and this is his head he then put forth his hand and produced another skull and laying it before iskander said to him knowest thou this no answered the conqueror and the other rejoined this is the skull of another king who dealt justly by his lieges and was kindly solicitous for the folk of his realm and his dominions till allah took his soul and lodged him in his garden and made high his degree in heaven then laying his hands on iskander's head he said would i knew which of these two art thou whereupon iskander wept with sore weeping and straining the king to his bosom cried 
if thou be minded to company with me, I will commit to thee as wazir the government of my affairs, and share with thee my kingdom. Cried the other, Well away, well away, I have no mind to this. And why so? asked Iskander. And the king answered, Because all men are thy foes by reason of the wealth and the worlds thou hast won, while all men are my true friends, because of my contentment and pauperdom, for that I possess nothing, neither covet aught of the goods of life. I have no desire to them, nor wish for them, neither wreck I aught save contentment. So Iskander pressed him to his breast, and kissed him between the eyes, and went his way. And among the tales they tell is one concerning the righteousness of King Anurshiwan. It is told of Anurshiwan, the just king, that once upon a time he feigned himself sick, and bade his stewards and intendants go round about the provinces of his empire and the quarters of his dominion, and seek him out a mud brick thrown away from some ruined village, that he might use it as medicine, informing his intimates that the leeches had prescribed this to him. So they went round of the provinces of his reign, and of all the lands under his sway, and said to him on return, In all the realm we have found nor ruined site, nor cast away mud brick. At this Anurshuan rejoiced and rendered thanks to the Lord, saying, I was but minded to try my kingdom and prove mine empire, that I might know if any place therein remained ruined and deserted, so I might rebuild and repeople it. But since there be no place in it but is inhabited, the affairs of the reign are best conditioned, and its ordinance is excellent, and its populousness hath reached the pitch of perfection. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 27 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York, May 2011
but that cities and places fall into ruin when oppressors are set as rulers over them and their inhabitants disperse and flee to other governments whereby ruin falleth upon the realm the imports fail the treasuries become empty and the pleasant lives of the subjects are perturbed for that they love not a tyrant and cease not to offer up successive prayers against him so that the king hath no ease of his kingdom and the vicissitudes of fortune speedily bring him to destruction and they tell a tale concerning the jewish kazai and his pious wife among the children of israel one of the kazais had a wife of surpassing beauty constant in fasting and abounding in patience and long-suffering and he being minded to make the pilgrimage to jerusalem appointed his own brother kazai in his stead during his absence and commended his wife to his charge now this brother had heard of her beauty and loveliness and had taken a fancy to her so no sooner was his brother gone than he went to her and sought her love favors but she denied him and held fast to her chastity the more she repelled him the more he pressed his suit upon her till despairing of her and fearing lest she should acquaint his brother with his misconduct when as he should return he suburned false witnesses to testify against her of adultery and cited her and carried her before the king of the time who adjudged her to be stoned so they dug a pit and seating her therein stoned her till she was covered with stones and the man said be this hole her grave but when it was dark a passer-by making for a neighboring hamlet heard her groaning in sore pain and pulling her out of the pit carried her home to his wife whom he bade dress her wounds the peasant woman tended her till she recovered and presently gave her her child to be nursed and she used to lodge with the child in another house by night now a certain thief saw her and lusted after her so he sent to her seeking her love favors but she denied herself to him wherefore he resolved to slay her and making his way into her lodging by night and she sleeping thought to strike at her with a knife but it smote the little one and killed it now when he knew his misdeed fear overtook him and he went forth the house and allah preserved from him her chastity but as she awoke in the morning she found the child by her side with throat cut and presently the mother came seeing her boy dead said to the nurse twas thou didst this murder him therewith she beat her a grievous beating and pursued to put her to death but after her husband interposed and delivered the woman saying by allah thou shalt not do on this wise so the woman who had somewhat of money with her fled forth for her life knowing not whither she should win presently she came to a village where she saw a crowd of people about a man crucified to a tree stump but still in the chains of life what hath he done she asked and they answered he hath committed a crime which nothing can expiate but death or the payment of such a fine by way of alms so she said to them take the money and let him go and when they did so he repented at her hands and vowed to serve her 
for the love of Almighty Allah, till death should release him. Then he built her a cell, and lodged her therein, after which he betook himself to woodcutting, and brought her daily her bread. As for her, she was constant in worship, so that there came no sick man or demonic to her, but she prayed for him, and he was straightway healed. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the woman's cell was visited by folk, and she constant in worship, it befell by decree of the Almighty that he sent down upon her husband's brother, the same who had caused her to be stoned, a cancer in the face, and smote the villager's wife, the same who had beaten her with leprosy, and afflicted the thief, the same who had murdered the child with palsy. Now, when the Kazai returned from his pilgrimage, he asked his brother of his wife, and he told him that she was dead, whereat he mourned sore, and accounted her with her maker. After a while, very many folk heard of the pious recluse, and flocked to her cell from all parts of the length and breadth of the earth. Whereupon said the Kazai to his brother, O oh, my brother, wilt thou not seek out yonder pious woman? Haply Allah shall decree the healing at her hands. And he replied, O oh, my brother, carry me to her. Moreover, the husband of the leprous woman heard of the pious devotee and carried his wife to her as did also the people of the paralytic thief. And they all met at the door of the hermitage. Now she had a place wherefrom she could look out upon those who came to her without their seeing her. And they waited till her servant came, when they begged admittance and obtained permission. Presently she saw them all, and recognized them. So she veiled, and cloaked her face and body, and went out, and stood in the door, looking at her husband and his brother, and the thief, and the peasant woman. But they could not recognize her. Then said she to them, O oh, folk, ye shall not be relieved of what is with you, till ye confess your sins. For when the creature confesseth his sins, the Creator relenteth towards him, and granteth him that wherefore he restoreth to him. Quoth the Kazai to his brother, O my brother, repent to Allah, and persist not in thy frowardness, for it will be more helpful to thy relief. And the tongue of the case spake this speech this day oppressor and oppressed meet and allah showeth secrets we secret this is a place where sinners low are brought and allah raiseth saint to highest seat our lord and master shows the truth right clear though sinner froward be or own defeat. Alas, for those who rouse the Lord to wrath, as though of Allah's wrath they nothing weet. O oh, whoso seekest honors, know they are from Allah, and his fear with love entreat, saith the relator. Then quoth the brother, Now I will tell the truth. I did thus and thus with thy wife, and he confessed the whole matter, adding, And this is my offense. Quoth the leprous woman, As for me, 
I had a woman with me, and imputed to her that of which I knew her to be guiltless, and beat her grievously. And this is my offense. And quoth the paralytic, And I went in to a woman to kill her, after I had tempted her to commit adultery, and she had refused. And I slew a child that lay by her side, and this is my offense. Then said the pious woman, O oh my God, even as thou hast made them feel the misery of revolt, so show them now the excellence of submission. For thou over all things art omnipotent, and Allah, to whom belong majesty and might, made them whole. Then the Kazai fell to looking on her, and considering her straightly, till she asked him why he looked so hard, and he said, I had a wife, and were she not dead, I had said that thou art she. Hereupon she made herself known to him, and both began praising Allah, to whom belong majesty and might, for that which he had vouchsafed them of the reunion of their loves. But the brother and the thief and the villager's wife joined in imploring her forgiveness. So she forgave them, one and all, and they worshipped Allah in that place and rendered her due service till death parted them. And one of the Sayyids hath related this tale of the shipwrecked woman and her child. I was circuiting the Kaaba one dark night when I heard a plaintive voice speaking from a contrite heart and saying, O bountiful one, thy past boon indeed, by my heart shall thy covenant never be undone. Hearing this voice, my heart fluttered, so that I was like to die. But I followed the sound, and behold, it came from a woman to whom I said, Peace be with thee, O handmaid of Allah. Whereto she replied, And with thee be peace, and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. Quoth I, I conjure thee by Allah the most great, tell me, what is the covenant to which thy heart is constant, quoth she, but that thou adjurest me by the omnipotent, I would not tell thee my secrets. See what is before me. So I looked, and lo, there was a child, lying asleep before her, and breathing heavily in his slumber. Said she, No, that I set forth being big with this boy to make the pilgrimage to this house and took passage in a ship. But the waves rose against us and the winds blew contrary and the vessel broke up. I saved myself on a plank and on that bit of wood I gave birth to this child. And while he lay on my bosom, and the waves beating upon me, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased, saying her permitted say, when it was the four hundred and sixty-seventh night. She said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the woman continued, now, while the boy lay on my bosom and the waves beat upon me, there swam up to me one of the sailors who climbed on the plank and said, By Allah, I desire thee whilst thou wast yet in the ship, and now I have come at thee. So yield thy body to me, or I will throw thee into the sea. Said I, Out on thee. Hast thou no memory of that which thou hast seen? And is it no warning to thee? Quoth he, I have seen the like of this many a time, and come off safe and care not. Quoth I, O fellow, we are now in a calamity, 
whence we hope to be delivered by obedience to Allah, and not by disobedience. But he persisted with me, and I feared him and thought to put him off. So I said to him, Wait till this babe shall sleep. But he took the child off my lap and threw him into the sea. Now when I saw this desperate deed, my heart sank and sorrow was sore upon me. So I raised my eyes heavenwards and said, O thou that interposest between a man and his heart, intervene between me and this leonine brute. For thou over all things art omnipotent, and by Allah hardly had I spoken when a beast rose out of the sea and snatched him off the plank. When I saw myself alone, my sorrows redoubled, and my grief and longing for my child I recited. My cooleth of eyes and darling child of me is lost and racked my heart with agony my body wrecked and red-hot coals of love burning my liver with sore pangs i see in this my sorrow shows no gleam of joy save thy high grace and my expectancy has seen o lord what unto me befell my son ah lost and parting pangs I dree. Take ruth on us and make us meet again. For now my stay and only hopes in thee. I abode in this condition a day and a night, and when morning dawned I caught sight of the sails of a vessel shining afar off, nor did the waves cease to drive me and the winds to waft me on till I reached the ship, whose sails I had sighted. The sailors took me up and looked, and behold, my babe was amongst them. So I threw myself upon him and said, O oh, folk, this is my child. How and whence came ye by him? Quoth they, whilst we were sailing along the seas, the ship suddenly stood still, and lo, that which stayed us was a beast, as it were, a great city, and this babe on its back, sucking his thumbs. So we took him up. Now, when I heard this, I told them my tale, and all that had betided me, and returned thanks to my Lord for his goodness, and vowed to him that never, whilst I lived, would I stir from his house, nor swerve from his service, and since then I have never asked of him aught, but he hath given it me. Now, when she had made an end of her story, quoth the Said, I put my hand to my alms pouch, and would have given to her, but she exclaimed, Away from me, thou idle man! Have I not told thee of his mercies and the graciousness of his dealings? And shall I take an alms from other than his hand? And I could not prevail with her to accept aught of me. So I left her and went away, reciting these couplets. How many boons conceals the deity, eluding human sight in mystery? How many graces come on heels of stresses and fill the burning heart with jubilee? How many a sorrow in the morn appears and turns at night tide into gladdest cree? If things go hard with thee some day, trust the eternity, the almighty God of unity, and pray the prophet that he intercede through intercession every wish shalt see and she left not the service of her lord cleaving unto his house till death came to her and a tale is also told by malik bin dinar allah have mercy on him of the pious black slave we were once afflicted with drought at basara and went forth sundry times to pray for rain 
but saw no sign of our prayers being accepted. So I went, I and Ita al-Salami and Sabit al-Banani and Naja al baka and Muhammad bin Wasia and Yaub al Sukiyani and Habib al Farsi and Hassan bin Abi Sinan and Atba al Gulam and Sali al Muzani till we reached the oratory when the boys came out of the schools and we prayed for rain but saw no sign of acceptance so about midday the people went away and i and sabit al banani tarried in the place of prayer till nightfall when we saw a black of comely face slender of shank and big of belly approach us clad in a pair of woolen drawers if all he wore had been priced, it would not have fetched a couple of dirhams. He brought water and made the minor ablution. Then, going up to the prayer niche, prayed two inclinations deftly, his standing and bowing and prostration being exactly similar in both. Then he raised his glance heavenwards and said, O oh my God, and my lord and master how long wilt thou reject thy servants in that which offereth no hurt to thy sovereignty is that which is with thee wasted or are the treasuries of thy kingdom annihilated i conjure thee by thy love to me forthwith to pour out upon us thy rain clouds of grace he spake, and hardly had he made an end of speaking when the heavens clouded over and there came a rain, as if the mouths of water skins had been opened. And when we left the oratory, we were knee-deep in water, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the four hundred and sixty-eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that hardly had he spoken when the heavens clouded over and there came a rain as if the mouths of water skins had been opened and when we left the oratory we were knee-deep in water and we were lost in wonder at the black so i accosted him and said to him woe to thee o black Art thou not ashamed of what thou saidest? He turned to me and asked, What said I? And I, Thy saying to Allah, By thy love of me, And what giveth thee to know that he loveth thee? Replied he, Away from me, O thou distracted by the world From the care of thine own soul. Where was I? when he gave me strength to profess the unity of the Godhead, and vouchsafed unto me the knowledge of him. How deemest thou that he aided me thus except of his love to me, adding, Verily, his love to me is after the measure of my love to him. Quoth I, Tarry a while with me, so may Allah have mercy on thee. But he said, I am a chattel, and the book enjoineth me to obey my lesser master. So we followed him afar off, till we saw him enter the house of a slave broker. Now the first half of the night was past, and the last half was longsome upon us. So we went away. But next morning we repaired to the slave-dealer and said to him, Hast thou a lad to sell us for service? He answered, Yes, I have an hundred lads or so, and they are all for sale. Then he showed us slave after slave, till he had shown us some seventy. But my friend was not amongst them. And the dealer said, These are all I have. 
But as we were going out from him, we saw a ruinous hut behind his house. And going in, behold, we found the black standing there. I cried, Tis he by the Lord of the Kaaba. And turning to the dealer, said to him, Sell me yonder slave. Replied he, O Abu Yahya, this is a pestilent, unprofitable fellow who hath no concern by night but weeping, and by day but repentance. I rejoined, It is for that I want him. So the dealer called him, and he came out, showing drowsiness, quoth his master, Take him at thine own price, so thou hold me free of all his faults. I bought him for twenty dinars, and asked, what is his name? And the dealer answered, Mayum the monkey. And I took him by the hand and went out with him, intending to go home. But he turned to me and said, Allah, I am not fit for the service of God's creatures. Replied I, I bought thee that I might serve thee myself, and on my head be it. Asked he, Why so? And I answered, Wast thou not in company with us yesterday in the place of prayer? Quoth he, And didst thou hear me? And quoth I, It was I accosted thee yesterday and spoke with thee. Thereupon he advanced till we came to a mosque, where he entered and prayed a two-bow prayer, after which he said, O oh my God and my Lord and Master, the secret that was between me and thee thou hast discovered unto thy creatures and hast brought me to shame before the worldling how then shall life be sweet to me now that other than thou hath happened upon that which is between thee and me i conjure thee to take my soul to thee forthright so saying he prostrated himself and i awaited a while without seeing him raise his head. So I shook him, and behold, he was indeed dead. The mercy of Almighty Allah be upon him. I laid him out, stretching his arms and legs, and looked at him, and lo, he was smiling. Moreover, whiteness had got the better of blackness on his brow, and his face was radiant with light like a young moon. As we wondered at his case, the door opened, and a young man came in to us and said, Peace be with you. May Allah make great our reward and yours for our brother, Maimum. Here is his shroud. Wrap him in it. So saying, he gave us two robes. Never had we seen the like of them, and we shrouded him therein, and now his tomb is a place whither men resort to pray for rain and ask their requirements of Allah, be he extolled and exalted, and how excellently well saith the poet on this theme, the heart of Gnostic homed in heavenly garth, heaven decks and Allah's porters aid afford. Lo, here they drink old wine commingled with tasnim, the wine of union with the Lord. Safe is the secret twixt the friend and them, safe from all hearts, but from that heart adored. And they recounted another anecdote of the devout tray maker and his wife. There was once among the children of Israel a man of the worthiest who was strenuous in the service of his Lord and abstained from things worldly and drave them away from his heart. He had a wife who was a helpmate meet for him and who was at all times obedient to him. They earned their living by making trays and fans whereat they wrought all through the light hours, and at nightfall the man went out into the streets and highways, seeking a buyer 
for what they had made. They were wont to fast continually by day, and one morning they arose, fasting, and worked at their craft till the light failed them. When the man went forth, according to custom, to find purchasers for his wares, and fared on till he came to the door of the house of a certain man of wealth, one of the sons of this world, high in rank and dignity. Now the tray-maker was fair of face and comely of form, and the wife of the master of the house saw him and fell in love with him, and her heart inclined to him with exceeding inclination. So her husband, being absent, she called her handmaid and said to her, Contrive to bring yonder man to us. Accordingly the maid went out to him, and called him, and stopped him, as though she would buy what he held in hand. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased, saying her permitted say. End of section 28 Recording by Simon Wainwright